Hello everyone and welcome to our very first lecture of this massive course. In the first lecture, before going into the details, let's just answer this simple question, why should we learn to code and why do we need it? There are many reasons for writing code. Some people are making their living with coding, others use coding to solve a difficult data analysis problem which is very hard to do manually, and there are some other people who write code for helping someone else solve a problem. This course assumes that everyone needs to know how to program in the current technological era. If you search on the internet for the question of why we should learn coding, you will get lots of posts which explain lots of reasons for learning codes nowadays. But I think the main reason is, imagine there are smart and very fast personal assistants around us at our workplace or in our homes. These assistants are waiting for our orders to do daily tasks which seem very boring to us. So by automating our task, we can have more time for more useful things. But the main problem is we need to learn a language to speak with these personal assistants that we have in our workplace, in our homes. So the language to speak these personal assistants in our workplaces, in our homes is programming language. So if someone is waiting for us to do our boring task, why should not give them these tasks? So during our daily lives, we are surrounded with computers ranging from laptops to cell phones. So these computers and electronic devices are our personal assistants who take care of many things on our behalf. The hardware in our current day computers is essentially built to continue to ask us the question, what would you like me to do next? Programmers add an operating system and set of applications to the hardware and we end up with a personal digital assistant that is quite helpful and capable of helping us to do many different things. Our computers are fast and have vast amounts of memory and could be helpful to us if you only know the language to speak to explain the computer what we would like to do it next. If we knew that this language, we could tell the computer to do the task on our behalf that were repetitive. Interestingly, the kinds of things computers can do best are often the kinds of things that we humans find boring and mind-numbing. For example, let's look at this text over here and tell me the most commonly used word and how many times this word is used. While you were able to read and understand the words in a, in a few minutes, counting them is almost painful because it's not the kind of problem that human minds are designed to solve. For a computer, the opposite is true. Reading and understanding text from a piece of paper is hard for a computer to do, but counting the words and telling how many times the most used word was used in this text is very easy for the computer. So our personal information analysis assistant quickly told us that the word D was used 15 times in this text over here. So this very fact that computers are good at things that humans are not is the reason why we need to become skilled at talking computer language. Once you learn this language, you will delegate mundane tasks to your partner to the computer, leaving more time for you to do the things that you are uniquely suited for. You bring creativity, intuition and inventiveness to this partnership between you and digital assistants. So hopefully now you have an idea of why we should learn coding. All right, now before we start learning the language we speak to give instructions to computer to develop software, we need to learn a small amount about how computers are built. So if you were to take apart your computer or cell phone and look inside, you will find the following parts. So the main part over here is central processing unit. So this is the part which asks the question of what's next. So central processing unit is a part of computer that's built to ask the what's next question. So if your computer is rated at 3.0 GHz, it means that CPU will ask what's next question 3 billion times per second. So you are going to have to learn how to talk fast to keep up with the CPU. Then the next main part of the computer architecture is main memory. The main memory is used to store information that CPU needs in hurry. The main memory is nearly as fast as the CPU, but the information in the main memory vanishes when the computer is turned off. Then the next part is second memory. Second memory is also used to store information, but it's much slower than the main memory. The advantage of the second memory is that 
It can store the information even when there is no power to the computer. Example of second memory are disks, flashcards or hard disks. So in the second memory, we can keep our information for forever. So the next part is input and output devices. So input and output devices are simply our screen, keyboard, mouse, microphone, speaker, touchpad, and all of these are input or output devices. They are all of the ways we interact with the computer. Then in modern computers, we have another part which is called network. So most computers also have network connection to retrieve information over a network. We can think of network as a very slow place to store, retrieve data that might not always be up. So in a sense, the network is a slower and at a times unreliable from the second memory. So if you don't have internet connection, it's not possible to connect to the network data that's stored somewhere in the cloud. So these are the main parts of the computers that we need to know before start to even to talk to computers. So in real life, if you see the real pictures of these devices, it is like this. So input and output devices, as you see, keyboard, mouse, scanner, webcam or microphone and output devices can be monitor, printer and, and others. So in real life, our CPUs look like this. So if you look at it, it's just a small piece of device over here. And this part is main memory. Sometimes we call it RAM. And this is, as you see, the secondary memory. It's hard disk in our computers or in our uh, phones. It's a memory. And these are the databases, which is the network memory, which is located nowadays in the cloud. So many websites and application databases are located in the cloud. So as a programmer, our job is to use of these resources to solve the problem that you need to solve and analyze the data you get from the solution. As a programmer, you will most likely be talking to CPU and telling it what to do next. Sometimes you will tell the CPU to use the main memory and sometimes you, you will tell the CPU to use the secondary memory or to use the data that comes from the network or we will interact with the input and output devices. So you must write down your instructions in advance. So we call this stored instruction a program and the act of writing this instruction down and getting the instruction to be correct is called programming. So to tell the CPU what to do next, we need to write our program. So uh, these are called the instructions and the process of writing instructions is called programming. So hopefully with this lecture, you have an idea of how the main parts of the computers are look like. So these are the initial parts that you need to know as a programmer. So hopefully you have understood it. How to install Python on Mac. Now in this lecture, I'm going to show you how to install Python on your Mac. Python 2 comes pre-installed on older version of Mac OS. This no longer case for the current versions of Mac OS, starting from Mac OS Catalina. There are two installation methods on Mac OS, the official installer and homebrew package manager. But in this lecture, we will use an official installer because as a beginner, you have to use the original one and easier one. So the first thing that we are going to do, we will check the version of Python on our Mac. So to check which Python version you have on your Mac, first you need to open a common bind application such as terminal, then check it. So to open a terminal, we just need to press common and space, then type terminal over here and press enter. So this is our terminal. So to check the version of Python over here, the first common that we can use, we can write Python, then space, then two dash version. Here you see that I have Python 2.7.16. But if you want to check the Python 3 version, you need to write Python 3. You need to write Python 3 with 2 dash version. So Python 3 version is for me 3.8.1. So sometimes if this command is not working, the first command, you can write instead of that Python 2 version. So in my case, it returns the same result for the Python version and Python 2 version. So now you see that I have a Python installed on my Mac. But if you haven't received any output from these versions, it means that it's not installed on your Mac. But even if it's installed on my Mac, I can check the last version and install it on my Mac. So for me, for Python 3, it's 3.8.1. So let's go to the Python site and check that if this is the last version that we have or not. So to do so, we need to go to the Safari 
and openpython.org. Then here, there's a tab called downloads. So from here, you need to select the Mac OS because we need to install the Python on our Mac OS. Then after selecting it, we see that the latest release for Python 3, it's 3.9.0, but mine was 3.8. So this is the last version. So you need to download it from the stable releases. So in under the stable releases, you see that Python 3.9.0 released on the 5th of October 2020. So to install it, you just need to cl click on this Mac OS 64-bit installer. So when you click on it, the download will start automatically. Then the installer will be downloaded in your download folder. So you can open it from the download folder and click on it and after clicking this window will come up so when you see this window you just need to click the continue then one more time continue then you need to select you just need to go to down and select agreement no it's not here so you need to select uh, continue so the window will appear saying that you agree with the terms and conditions so you just need to select the agree it's just basic installation of the software in which you are selecting next, next and click the install. So at the end, you need to click install. You just need to provide the password for your Mac, then install the software. So when you click the install, this, the Python will start to install on your Mac. So it will just take few minutes to install it. So you just need to wait to finish the installation. So after the installation finished, it will open the folder like this. So you just need to close this folder and close this and if you want you can remove the installer from the download folder and move it to trash so i'm in my case i'm going to move it to trash now i've installed the 3.9.0 python so to check that if this is installed or not then we need to go to the terminal again and write python 3 version so we have downloaded python 3 version so i need to write python 3 to dash version so you see that before it was 3.8.16, now it is 3.9.0. So with this, we have successfully installed Python in our Mac. Now, if you want to use the command line as a Python command line, you just need to type over here Python 3. So when you type it, it will show the version and it switched to the Python terminal over here. So here you can use Python commands over here. Now we will talk about this in our upcoming lectures. Here I'll just show you how to install Python in your Mac. So this is all for this lecture. If you are on Windows, you will see that the operating system shows over here Windows. So here again, I'm just going to click on the download Python 3.10.2. So it's going to download it to our download file. So here again, it's a very small file, so it will not take too long to be downloaded. So once the download is completed, you can open the exe file. So it's going to open window like this. So here you need to add Python 3.10 to the path. So you need to select this one. Then after selecting this one, all you have to do is you need to click install now. So after clicking install now, you need to make sure that you have admin privileges to install the Python. So it's going to start installing process over here. Now the installation should take a few minutes. Now once it's done, you might get a hint over here saying disable path limit. If you see that, then go ahead and click on it. And then you are done and you can close off the wizard. So as you can see here, it says that the setup is successful. So you can just click this close button and close this wizard from here. So this means that you have successfully installed Python on Windows. So we have successfully installed Python on Windows and on Mac. Now we are ready to proceed to the next step. So in the next step, we are going to download and install PyCharm to our local machines for Mac separately and for Windows separately. So see you in the next lecture. Learning a new language. All right, whenever we learn a new language, the first thing that we need is we need to know the vocabulary and the grammar. So you need to spell the words in this new language to construct well-formed sentences. And the second skill is to tell a story. By combining the words and sentences, we can convey the idea to the reader. So these are the two main steps that you need when you are learning a new language. So the same two steps are applicable when we are learning a new programming language. So we need to learn vocabulary and make sentences to be able to convey our idea 
to the story for the users. So as I mentioned, in programming, we have words and grammar, so which makes our coding lines. So unlike human language, the vocabulary in Python programming language is pretty small. In programming terms, we call it reserved words. So these are the words are very special meaning to Python. When Python sees these words in a Python program, they have one and only one meaning to Python. It can be also called a reserve identifier, and the basic definition is it is reserved from the use. And grammar in the Python is the syntax. So we have a way of writing code which is called syntax. The syntax is a set of rules that defines the combination of symbols that are considered to be correctly structured statements or expressions in that language. So this definition right now might be difficult to understand. Basically, you just need to know that it is relevant to the grammar in human language. So in human language, we have a grammar. In programming language, we have syntax. Both of them define the set of rules with the combinations of statements or expressions. So later, as you write the programs, you will make up your own words that have meaning to you called variables. So we will talk this about later. So I'm not going to the details of the variables over here. So in the human language, if you combine the words grammatically in logical order, you will get the sentences. But in case of programming, when you use reserved words with the correct syntax, you will get coding lines. So the process of converting ideas to the programming language using reserved words and correct logical syntax is called programming. And the telling a story at the end, which includes the whole idea, is called program in programming language. So in this course, we teach the programming much like we teach writing. We start reading and explaining programs, then we write simple programs, then we write increasingly complex programs over the time. At some point, you get your muse and see the patterns on your own, and you can see more naturally how to take a problem and write a program that solves that problem. And once you have get that point, programs become very pleasant and creative process. So as in while we are learning a new language, and the process of learning programming language is same. So we start with the vocabulary and the structure of Python programs. The vocabulary of Python program, which is called also reserved words, are pretty small. So here are the reserved words for the Python. So as you see from this list that they are very pretty small. You don't need to memorize them right now. We will learn all of them one by one, and you will get used to them by practicing them. But here, I want to mention that Python is completely trained with these words, which means, for example, when you say try, Python will try without failing. So you have to be very careful about this. So with this, we have completed this lecture. So hopefully you have got an idea of what we are going to do when learning a new programming language. Now in the next lecture, we will get in touch with Python for the first time. So see you in the next lecture. The first conversation with Python. All right, in this lecture, we will start our very first conversation with Python. But before we can converse with Python, you must install the Python software on your computer. So if you have not installed Python to your computer, I advise you to go back to our previous lecture. Based on your operating system, you can look at the lectures to install the Python on your device. So in your computer, if you type a Python in the terminal, which is for Mac users and in the common window for the Windows user, the Python interpreter will start executing in an interactive mode and appear something like this. So for Mac users, we will open terminal and put uh, Python 3 there. But if you are on the Windows, you just need to put Python over here. For Mac, it works differently. If you put Python 2, it's going to bring the Python 2. If you put Python 3, it's going to bring Python 3 interactive mode. So if you put Python 3 over here, it's going to be appear something like this. So here you see that it shows the version of Python, which is in my case, it's 3.9.0, which is the latest version at this state. So the prompt over here is the Python interpreter's way of asking, what do you want me to do next? So Python is ready to have a conversation with you. All you have to do is to know how to speak the Python language. So let's say that this is the first time that you are opening this and you don't know any single words or sentences in Python. So you might use a human language to speak with the Python. So if I put over here, for example, hello Python, you see that it gives error, which means it does not understand our language. So we need to speak with Python in Python language. So 
For example, let's try a very simple command in Python language. So if I put something like this here, print in quote, hello world, and press enter, you see that Python returns us hello world. So we have written our first syntactically correct Python sentence. Our sentence starts with the function print, followed by a string of text of our choosing enclosed in a single quote. The strings in the print statements are enclosed in quotes. Single quotes or double quotes do the same thing in Python. Most people use single quotes, except in cases where a single quote, which also apostrophe, appears in the string. So if you have a single quote appears in the string, so you can use double quotes over here. Now, whatever you put inside this quote, Python will return us those sentences. For example, if I put instead of hello world over here, I want to be a friend with you. So Python will return the same sentences to us. So the way that print function works is whatever we put inside these quotes over here, it will return us. For example, let's try something different. So if I remove the parentheses from here, let's see what will Python will say to us. So if I click enter, you see that Python gives error, even gives us a suggestion that missing parentheses in a call print. So after print, we need to put parentheses. So now you see our conversation was going so well for a while. Then we made the tiniest mistake over here using Python program language and the Python brought the spares back out. At this point, you should realize that Python is amazingly complex and powerful and very picky about the syntax you use to communicate it. Python is not intelligent. So you are really just having conversation with yourself, but using proper syntax. In a sense, when you use a program written by someone else, the conversation is between you and those other programs with Python acting as an intermediary. So Python is a way for the creators of programs to express how the conversation is supposed to proceed. And in just few more sections, you will be one of those programmers using Python to talk to the user of your program. So before you leave our conversation with the Python interpreter, you should probably know the proper way to say goodbye when interacting with the Python. So for example, if I put over here goodbye, Python give me an error saying that goodbye is not defined. So we can try something different. If you don't mind, I want to leave. For example, if you put something like this, you'll see that it gives a different error. Before it was saying that goodbye is not defined, and now it says that invalid syntax. The reason for this, if is the reserved words over here. So when you put if, Python thought that we were trying to say something, but got the syntax of the sentence wrong because we didn't put proper syntax over here. So the proper way of saying goodbye to the Python is like this. So we need to put over here quit with the parentheses. So if you put it quit with the parentheses, you see that it exists from the Python interpreter and it goes to the main location in the terminal. So with this, we have completed our first conversation with Python. So in this very first interacting with Python, we have learned two functions of Python. So the first function is print, which prints whatever we put inside quotes to the console. And the second one is the way of saying goodbye to Python. So whenever we want to say goodbye to Python interpreter or you want to quit from the Python interpreter, we use quit function. So hopefully you have enjoyed our first conversation with Python. Now in this lecture, we will learn a frequently used term among developers, which is a bug. In IT, a bug refers to an error, fault, or flow in a computer or hardware system. A bug produces unexpected result or causes a system to behave unexpectedly. In short, it is any behavior or result that a program or system gets, but it was not designed to do. Most bugs occur due to the errors and the mistakes made by developers when constructing the source code or overall the design or within the components and operating systems used by the programs in question. Some bugs are the result of errors in translation between languages made by compilers, which produce incorrect or ineligible code. The term buggy is often ascribed to programs that contain large number of bugs, and these bugs seriously damage the software's functionality. As any developer knows, there are very few programs that are completely error-free, even in those that have been extensively tested. For this reason, most software packages will often have a series of point updates issued over time to fix bugs. In short, we can conclude that bugs are errors in our codes. As your program becomes increasingly sophisticated, you will encounter three general types of errors. The first error is syntax error. 
These are the first errors that you will make and these are very easier to fix. A syntax error means that you have violated the grammar rules of Python. Python can only execute a program if the program is syntactically correct. Otherwise, the process fails and returns an error message. Syntax refers to the structure of a program, the rules of the structure. For example, in English, a sentence must begin with a capital letter and it has to end with a period. For example, this sentence contains a syntax error because it has to start with the capital letter. So does this sentence also because we don't have full stop at the end of this sentence. So we have violated the grammar of English over here. So this means that we have syntax error over here. For most readers, such kind of syntax errors are not significant problem. So we can read this sentence without having any difficulties. But in Python, it's not working like this. Python is not so forgiving. If there is a single syntax error anywhere in your program, Python will display an error message and quit. You will not able to complete execution of your program. During the first weeks of your programming career, you will probably spend a lot of time tracking down syntax errors. However, as you gain the experience, you will make fewer errors and you will also able to find your errors fast. Now, as you remember, we have written our first line of code. So it was like this. So here you see that we have syntax error because we have missed the closing of double quotation over here. So if you miss it, the code will not be executed. So we have a syntax error over here. Now let's continue to the second type of error. So the second type error is logic errors. The logic error is sometimes called semantic errors. If there is a logic error in your program, it will run successfully in a sense that the computer will not generate any error message. However, your program will not do the right thing. It will do something else. The problem is that the program that you wrote is not the program that you want to write. The meaning of program is wrong. Identifying logic errors can be tricky because it requires you to work backward by looking at the output of program and trying to figure out what is going wrong. For example, if you look at this code over here, so the name of function is sum, so which means that it has to sum these two numbers over here. But you see that we are returning a minus b, but it should be a plus b. But if you run our code, it will run successfully and it will return one. So you see that we have logic error over here. We are getting result, but we are not getting the expected result. So in this case, expected result is five, but we are getting one. So if you write the logic wrong, you will get logic errors. Now the third type of error is runtime errors. This is called runtime because the error does not appear until you run the program. These errors are also called exceptions because they usually indicate something exceptional has happened. Runtime errors are rare in the simple programs. You will not see them in your first programs because in the simple programs you cannot find them. It might be a while before you encounter one. An example of runtime errors can be attempting to divide by zero. For example, if you write something like this in your program, it will not cause an error until you run the program. So when you run the program, it will give error saying that the number cannot be divided by zero. So this is runtime error. So this is all for this lecture. So with this, we have completed our lecture. So in this lecture, we have learned that what is bug and we have learned different types of errors that we might encounter while writing a program. Now in this lecture, we will learn debugging. So what is debugging? Programming is a complex process. So since it's done by human beings, errors may often occur. So we have mentioned in our previous lecture that programming errors are called bugs and the process of tracking them down and correcting them is called debugging. So when you are debugging a program, and especially if you are working on a hard bug, there are four things you need to try. Now, the first thing is reading. So you need to examine your code and read it back to yourself and check that if it says what you mean to say. So when you face a bug, so the first thing that you are going to do, you will read your code. So you will read your code to understand that. So if the code means that what you meant before. So in this step, we are experimenting by making changes and running different versions. Often, if you display the right thing at the right place in the program, the problem becomes obvious. But sometimes you have to spend some time to build different version. So in this stage of debugging, we have to experiment and run different version of our code to find the bug in our code. Now, the next step is ruminating. 
So in this step, we need to take some time to think. And we need to think what kind of error is this? Is this in syntax error? Is this runtime error? Is it logic error or semantic error? What information you can get from the error message? Or what information you can get from the output of the program? What kind of error could cause the problem that you are seeing? So what did you change the last before the problem appeared? So you have to answer these kind of questions in this stage. Now the last step is retreating. At some point, the best thing is to do back off. So undoing the recent changes until you get back to the program that works without any bug. Then you can start rebuilding your program. Beginning programmers sometimes get stuck on one of these activities and forget about others. Finding a hard bug requires reading, running, ruminating, and retreating. If you get stuck on one of these activities, try the others. Each activity comes with its own failure mode. For example, reading your code might help if the problem is syntax error. But if the problem is conceptual misunderstanding, you cannot understand it by reading your code. So if you don't understand what your program does, you can read it 100 times and never see the error because the error is in your head. Running experiments can help especially if you run small simple tests. But if you run experiments without thinking or reading your code, you might fall into a pattern that is called random walk programming, which is the process of making random changes until the program does the right thing. So it's obvious that random walk programming can take long time. So you have to take time to think. Debugging is like an experimental science. So you should have at least one hypothesis about what is the problem. So if there are two or more possibilities, try to think of the test that could eliminate one of them. And while debugging your program, taking a break helps with thinking. So does talking. So if you explain the problem to someone else, you will sometimes find the answer before you finish asking the question. But even the best debugging techniques will fail if there are too many errors. If the code you are trying to fix is too big and complicated. Sometimes the best option is retreat. Simplifying the program until you get something that works and that you understand. So if we are getting back to the point that our program is working, then from there, we are starting to rebuild our program. So in this stage, especially beginning programmers are often reluctant to retreat because they cannot stand to delete a line of code, even if it's wrong. So if it makes you feel better, copy your program into another file before you starting deleting the lines of code that causes the problem. Then you can pass the pieces back after finding the error in your code. So with these steps, you can easily find the bugs that you have in your programs. Now here in this lecture, these steps might seem complex, but uh, by practicing them and by writing the code, you will get used to these steps without even mentioning the names of steps. You will experiment them, you will read your code, you will find out what kind of error it is, and sometimes you will retrieve your code to find the bug. So hopefully you have understood what is debugging and, and what can we do if we face a bug in our program. All right, now in this lecture, we are going to talk about something called compiler and interpreter. Now in the previous lectures, we have said that the computer CPU is the main part of the computer, which asks us what to do next. And we have learned that we cannot just say something to the computer in our human language. So we have to use a programming language. Now you might be interested how computer understand this programming language. So when we are writing a program, a computer understand is in a binary format, which consists of zeros and ones. So this is called machine language or machine code. So here you can see a basic example of machine code. So as you can see, it consists of zeros and ones. Machine language seems quite simple on the surface, given that there are only zeros and ones but its syntax is even more complex and far more intricate than Python. So very few programmers ever write machine language. Instead, programmers build various translators to allow programmers to write in high-level languages like Python or JavaScript or Java, and these translators convert the programs to the machine language for actual execution by the CPU. Python is a high-level language intended to be relatively straightforward for humans to read and write and for computers to read and process. Other high-level languages include Java, C++, PHP, Ruby, Basic, Perl, JavaScript, and more. Since machine language is tied to the computer hardware, machine language is not portable across different types of hardware. But programs written in high-level language 
can be moved between different computers by using a different interpreter on the new machine. Or we can recompile the code to create machine language version of the program for the new machine. So the code that we have written in high level language is called source code. And the code that CPU understand is called machine code. So to convert source code into machine code, we use either compiler or interpreter. Both compilers and interpreters are used to convert a program written in high level language into the machine code that understand by computers. However, there are differences between interpreter and compilers. So based on the language translators, the programming language fall into two general groups, interpreters and compilers. So in case of compiler, the compiler checks the syntax of our code, optimizes our code and generates machine code. And this machine code is executed by CPU. So once the machine code is generated, it executes very fast. So that is why compiled language are faster than interpreters. In compiled language, the machine code is first generated and then it's executed by CPU. But in case of interpreter language, the interpreter executes the source code. Therefore, there is no completion step. So the interpreter executes the program line by line. That's why it's a bit slower compared to compiler. An interpreter reads the source code of program as written by the programmer, parses the code and interpreters instruction on fly. Python is an interpreter. And when we are running Python interactively, we can type a line of Python and the Python process it immediately. And it's ready for us to type another line of Python code. So the main advantage of interpreted language is it is platform independent. So we just have to write our code and then interpreter can run it on any platform. But it's not possible in case of compiled language because we are using machine code and every operating system has different architecture. And this means that machine code that is generated for the same program by two different operating systems is not the same. So that's why compiled languages are platform dependent. So here from this example, you can see that for the same program, if we generate machine code on Windows, it's going to be like this. For the same program, if we generate machine code on Mac, it's going to be like this. So for two different operating systems, the machine code can be generated differently. It depends on the architecture of operating system. So that's why compiled languages are not platform dependent. So in this lecture, I explained you how computers understand programming language. So here we have learned that there are two categories of programming language based on their translator. So each of them has their advantages and drawbacks. So hopefully with this lecture, you have understood how computers understand our code and how different programming language converts source code to the machine code. Code editors or IDEs. Now in this lecture, we are going to talk about code editors that we are going to use in these lectures. So in the last lecture, we have mentioned that the code that we write in high level programming language like Python is called source code. So writing code is an important part of programming. We start with a blank file, write a few lines of code and the program is born. Now as our programs get bigger, it's almost impossible to write all lines of code in the terminal. So this is where code editors or IDEs come to our help. An IDE, integrated development environment, enables programmer to consolidate different aspects of writing computer program. IDEs increase the programmer productivity by combining common activities of writing software into a single application, editing the source code, building executables, and debugging. There are many editors or IDEs out there, and sometimes it becomes very difficult to choose among them. Now, if you go on Google and search for IDE for Python, you will see that there are many of them. For a single programming language, there are many IDEs that you can use to develop application. Now you might be interested how we are going to choose the one which is useful for us. So throughout this course, we will use different types of IDEs. So it depends on our level. So as a beginner, so as a beginner, we will start with a simpler one. Now let's see what benefits IDEs offer us. The first benefit is syntax highlighting. The IDE for a specific programming language knows the syntax of that language. So it can provide visual cues to us by setting different colors to different parts of code. 
Now, here's the, an example of ID. So this is the first ID that we are going to use as a beginner level. So in this ID, you can see that when we write a code, we have different colors over here. So the print statement is in yellow color and we have brackets in white color and that string that we have over here, hello world, it's in brown. So by giving them different colors, ID helps us to identify our syntax errors in our code. So the second benefit is autocomplete. When the ID knows your programming language, it can anticipate what you are going to type the next. For example, if we type print, so it can offer you that print should be with parentheses. So we will see this feature frequently when we are developing our applications. Now the third benefit is building executables. Now if you remember, we have mentioned in our previous lecture that some programming languages are interpreted language and others are compiled language. So in compiled language, as you remember, the source code has to be converted to machine code to be executed by CPU. So the completion process is automated by IDEs, which is a very great feature. So we don't need any extra software for this. So inside IDEs, we can compile our program and build executables. So this is a very great feature of the IDEs that makes our life easier. Now the last property of ID is debugging. So we have mentioned in our previous lecture that debugging is, is the process of finding the bug. So when a program does not run correctly, IDs provide debugging tools that allows programmer to examine different variables and inspect their code in a deliberate way. IDs also provide hints while coding to prevent errors before the completion. So these are the main advantages of IDs. So almost all IDs offer these advantages for given a programming language. Now in this lecture, we have learned what is ID and we have learned advanced of the idea. Now in the next lecture, I will show you the ID that we are going to use in our upcoming lectures. So see you in the next lecture. Now in the last lecture, we have talked about code editors or IDs. In this lecture, I'm going to show you which editor we will use for upcoming lectures. So to begin, I want you to open up your browser and head over to this website, which is called Repl.it. So Repl.it. So this is a website which provides a code editors for different programming languages. So in our case, we are going to use it for Python. So click start coding. And when you click it, it will ask you to register. So I recommend you to sign up Reply T. It's completely free. You don't need any credit cards or anything else for this. And then you will able to see the records of all code that you have written throughout our videos. So sometimes when you click start coding, REPL does not ask for register. It just straight away opens programming language like this. So after selecting Python as a programming language, it creates new Replit with anonymous account. This means that whenever you close browser, all your work will be deleted. So that's why I advise you register for saving your work. And now I want you to pause the video and create your free Replit account. And then once you are signing, your Replit will look like this. So on the left hand pane, we can select new Replit to create a new Replit. So I'll select it and as a programmer language, I'll select Python and click create Replit. Then after creating your first Replit, it's going to look like this. Then you can actually go over here and edit the name of your Replit. So I'll just edit it to put, for example, my first project. Then you can add description over here as well. And you can click enter to change the name of project over here. Now, once you have done that, let's go ahead and walk through the, some different parts of Replit that we will be using throughout lectures. So first is the left-hand side pane. So you have got some files over here and you can see that current file, which is main py file is open now. So when you click on this file, it shows the code over here. Now by using these buttons over here, you can create new folder or new files for your project. And we will use this in our upcoming lectures, which help us to organize our projects. Now on the other part of the left side pane, the very useful feature is its settings tab over here. So when you click on the setting tab, you can change layout from here to be shown for, for example, like this or like this. And you can change the theme from light to dark. So for me, I always prefer to use dark because in this case, it's very healthy for our eyes. And I advise you to change the font size from tiny to large because it makes our course more readable. So the rest I will leave as it is. So if you want to change anything, you, you can change it the way that is okay for you. So I'll click the setting buttons to collapse the panes. So we end up with more space for writing our code. So this area that we see over here, we are writing our code over here. So all of our code going over there. And once we have done with our code, we click run button and then it executes our code and it prints out to the console over here. So this part is called console. 
So these are the main parts of the replit. So let's get started to write our first line of codes in our code editor. So remember that the whole reason why we are learning to program is to be able to tell computer what it needs to do and for it follow our commands. So as you remember, we have already learned to tell computers to do something through terminal. And now we will do the same steps using code editor over here. So in this case, as I did before, I will create a something called print function, which has the word print all in lowercase and then followed by the set of parentheses. Now inside this parentheses, I'm going to tell what I want it to print. And it's going to put output to do our console over here. So as I did before, I'm going to start off by writing classic hello world inside over here and then go ahead and run it. And after a few seconds, you'll see that hello world is printed out to do our console over here. Now, the way that this command works is super simple. You have the keyword print followed by a set of parentheses and inside parentheses, you tell it what you want it print. And once you have inserted that, then when this line of code gets executed by computer, it will know to simply print the thing that you have placed in between the parentheses. Now here, you just need to notice that I've not just added hello world over here. I also added some quotation marks or double quotes around the hello world. So the reason why I have done this is I can tell the computer that this text between these quotes is not code. This is just a text and I want to print out this text from here. So this piece of text in programming language known as strings. So you can imagine strings like a necklace, which shows the characters of string. And what double quotes do is they basically show the beginning and end of the strings. So this means that you have to be very careful when you are typing. Now, if I go and remove, for example, last double quote over here, now you can see something has happened to our code because in this case, the last parentheses changed to brown color, but before it was white as this one. Now it's brown. And as I mentioned before, this is one of the great feature of code editor that gives us hints and clues that tells us what might we have done wrong in our code. Now, if I run this code, it will not work. It will break and it gives us syntax error. So as you remember from the previous lecture that one of the type of error is syntax error. Basically, this is a grammar error in terms of human language. In Python, it means we have not used Python syntax correctly. So the question that comes to everyone's mind is, how can we figure out what this problem is? Because here you see that it's writing something that is not understandable. It's EOL while scanning string literal. Now here, the important thing I want you to know is that all programmers make mistakes. All of us makes lots of errors like forgetting quotas and forgetting adding the parentheses and closing the parentheses. And these things are just common errors because we are human. So you can imagine coding like a whole bunch of problems that you have to solve. Now, in this case, when you get some red text on the right in your console, it means that our code is not doing what we expect to do. Then all we have to do is we are just copying this entire string from here and going to the Google and searching for this error in the Google. Now, when we search this error, usually the first link that you will come across, it will be called from the Stack Overflow. So I advise you always to open the first link that comes from the Stack Overflow. This is a QA website that all developers will go to whenever something is wrong with their code. Now, if you click this link over here, you will see that someone had this error before. So someone who is name is Steve posted over here that uh, he receives an error of like this. And some other developer answered him saying that you are putting a double quote before the end of line. Uh, and sometimes they are giving examples over here. And this means that we are missing the quote at the end of our now, if you go to our project, you see that the last quote is missing over here. So if I put the last quote over here, so if I put the closing quote over here and run our code, you will see that everything becomes clear. Now, as we are learning to code through our lectures, I want you to be very careful about the color of your code, because one of the most helpful things that the code editors do for us is something called syntax highlighting. So as I mentioned before, for example, when we miss the double quote of from here, now you see that the closing parenthesis is white. Now, if you miss this closing, it becomes brown. So it shows us that something is wrong over here. Now, if you look at the error message over here, a little carrot sign light here showing that something is wrong over here. So it shows that something is missing over here. As I mentioned, we are missing the double quote over here. So after fixing it, if we run it, it seems that everything works as good as new. Now, in this lecture, I have explained the editors that we are going to use in our upcoming lectures. And I have explained the main part of this editor that which are useful for us. 
So hopefully everything is clear about it. Hey guys, welcome to back our brand new section of Python for Everyone course, which is called Variables, Expressions and Statements. In this section, you are going to be learning about data types, variables, operators, expressions, type conversions, type errors, comments, f-strings, input function, round function, and a whole lot more. By the end of this section, you will have learned enough to build a real-life projects like greeting, group name generator, gross pay, Celsius to Fahrenheit, and trip cost calculator. So as you can see, for each project over here, we have the instructions. So based on these instructions, we are going to be created these five real life beginner projects after learning the things that we have in our current section. So in the first project, we are going to be greeting the user. So this is going to be a very easy project. We are going to get the name from the console and we'll be greeting the, that name. Then we have group name generator. So as you can see, we will be creating a group, a group based on the, our favorite color and favorite animal. Then we are going to calculate the gross pay based on the rates that we are going to provide to the program. And then we have Celsius to Fahrenheit. So we are going to be converting Celsius to Fahrenheit based on this formula over here. Then at the end, we are going to be have another project which is going to calculate the trip cost. So we are going to ask some questions from the user. Then based on that, we are going to calculate the trip cost calculator. So in order to build this projects, we are going to need to learn some new skills, including working with numbers, converting data types, and input function, round function, and a lot more. So if you feel like you can tackle these problems without any issue, then feel free to skip these sections lessons. But I bet there will be lots of stuff that you will come across in the upcoming lessons and coding exercise that's really going to make you a better developer. So once you are ready to get started, head over to the next lesson and let's start coding. In this lecture, we will start to learn very basic concepts of programming, which are values and types. As we have in human language numbers and characters, in programming language we have values which have different types. A value is one of the basic things a program works with, like a number or a letter. As you remember in our previous lecture, we have printed out hello world to the console. So here, hello world is a value and the type of this value is string. So this piece of text over here in programming language known as string. A string is a sequence of characters. A character is simply a symbol. For example, in the English, we have 26 characters. Computers do not deal with the characters. As you remember, I have mentioned in our previous lectures that computers understand the code in binary format. So they don't deal with the characters. They deal with the numbers. Even though you may see the characters on your screen, internally it's stored and manipulated as a combination of zeros and ones. So from this table, you can see that for any given letter, we have binary code for it. So this conversion of from a character to a number is called encoding and the reverse of this operation is decoding. ASCII and Unicode are the some popular encodings used. In Python, a string is sequence of Unicode characters. So Unicode was introduced to include every character in all languages and bring uniformity in encoding. Now, these terms might be strange to you when you hear them for the first time. For now, you don't need to worry about them. When you become a professional developer, you will get to use them. Here, I just want to give you a brief explanation of them. And you just need to know that the computer understands the code in binary format, not in characters. So the combination of these characters is known as string. So as I mentioned before, strings can be created by enclosing characters inside a single quote or double quote. Now, let's see how can we create a string in Python. So here, for example, if I print out anything inside the double quotes, for example, if I put over here, hello, and print out these values, so the type of this value over here known as string. So we can print out strings inside double quotes, inside single quotes. So for example, if I put single quotes over here, it's not going to be a difference. It will be also recognized as a string. Uh, the reason that we are using the double code, for example, if you want to print out single code over here, hello with the single code, you just need to put 
double quote over here and at the end double quote over here and double quote over here now if you run it you see that it's printing out hello with single quote that's why we need double quotes now sometimes people use triple quotes in python triple quotes is something like this so we are putting three triple quote over here and over here now you see that when we put this and run our code you see that nothing is changing so it's bringing out the same result the reason that we are using triple quote over here for example if i put enter over here and write world over here you see that our code will work perfectly so it's working hello world at the uh, below this line over here so that's why if you have new line characters in your uh, strings you can put triple quote over here this is used especially when you are using xml coding inside python files so we will use them in our uh, advanced lectures here i just want to mention that if there is a new lines in your strings you can use triple quotes now there are many operations can be performed on strings and we will talk about them in our upcoming lectures now here you just need to know the basic concept now the question is if you want to deal with numbers as a number that we use in our daily lives we have to declare our value as a number so the most common value type that we will use for numbers is called integers so i'll put over here integers integers basically are the numbers but in programming lingo we are using integer for the numbers so these are the numbers without any decimal places so in order to declare or create integer type all we have to do is we just write a number without without anything else so here 12 is integer 11 is integer we can even use print function to print out these numbers over here so if i use print function and run our code you see that it's going to print out 12 over here so python recognize this character as a number so you just need to be careful about this that here we are not putting any quotation mark over here double quote or single quote we are just putting the number itself so that python recognize it as a number you might be interested that what is the difference between the putting double quotation over here or not putting because in python if you want to perform any mathematical operation on these numbers uh, you cannot do it while they are string they have to be number to perform this operation for example if i put over here plus 10 you will see that it will work as a mathematical operation and we will talk about these mathematical operations in our upcoming lectures here i just want to make sure that you understand this why we need to declare integers so integers need to be declared to perform any mathematical operation on the numbers but here for example if i put 12 inside double quotation and run this you'll see that it's printing out 12 as a string but here you cannot notice it but here i'm sure that this is type of string now in many countries when you write a large number people put commas between numbers so for example when you write 1 billion people are putting the commas between the thousands but this number is not a legal integer number in python for example if we try to print out this number to the console print to console and let me just delete this one from here and run our code you see that it prints out one as a 100 and there's a space between these zeros so here the interesting moment is that this is the first time you are seeing a logic error so the code runs without producing an error but it does not produce the right thing basically we are saying that to print out 1 million but it's printing out 100 over here so this is the type of logical error now the question is is there any way to write the numbers in python for more readability like we do in our daily lives like this so instead of commas we have another character which replaces commas in this case for example instead of commas if i put underscore and underscore over here you'll see that our code works perfect so if i run it you see that it prints out by ignoring these underscores over here so in your code if you have larger number you can put underscore and you just need to keep in mind that uh, the python will ignore the underscores over here this is just for making our code more readable so these whole numbers no matter if they are positive or negative are called integers in programming now the question is if we have a decimal place in our numbers uh, so for that we cannot use integers we have another type which is called float so this is a short form of floating point number for example if you have a number pi which is uh, we know that the, uh, the value for the number pi is is 3.14 15 and 9 so this is now float number in python because it has decimal place over here so let, let me just run our code so to see that if it is printing out over here so you see that it's printing out floating number over here so for the numbers that we have decimal places we are using the number type which is float now the last type of value type is called boolean it's written like this 
So this is very simple because it only has two possible values, which are true and false. So these are the two values for Boolean values. Note that these values begin with the capital letter. In some programming language, it doesn't matter, but in Python, it matters that you have to write these ones in capital letters with T and with F. And they don't have any quotation marks around them. And this makes them different from the strings. Even though this is very simple type, actually this type is going to be used a lot in our programs. So to test if this is, if something is true or not. Another cool feature of Python is that if you don't know the value of the type, you can use type function and the interpreter can tell you which type of the data is this. Now here we have a function of type. So it's written like this type and, and continued with the brackets. So this function returns the type of any value that we put inside these brackets over here. But uh, to print out this one to the console, we just need to write this function inside print function. So if you call this one inside print function and put anything over here, let me just put the brackets over here. So if I put any value inside this type function, it will print out the type into the console. For example, if I put 12 over here and run our code, you see that it will print out saying that this is integer. So the short form of integer is int. Now, you can directly use this function inside console over here. For example, if I put type and inside parentheses, I'll put one. So you see that it's going to return int. So let's try another one. So if I put, for example, inside double quote one and run this function, you see that inside double quotation, the number is type of string. So the short form of string is str. So for example, let's try another one. So here I will put true and run our code, you'll see that it's going to return bool. So this is the short form of boolean. So in the future, there will be at times that the objects are created and you don't know the type of object because you have a lot of classes inside each other. So if you want to know the type of object, you can just call it inside type function. So you just need to keep in mind that this type function return the type of value that we put inside these brackets over here. So inside console, we can use it straight away, but it, but when you write it separately and see the output result, you just need to put it inside print function to see the output. Now with this here, we have also learned that inside print function, we can call another function as well to see the output. Before we were calling this print function for only strings or numbers, but here you see that we can call another function inside print function, and this will return the result type that we get inside function. So this is another cool feature of the print function that we can see the outputs in our console. So with this, we have completed our lecture. So in this lecture, we have learned what are values and what are the basic types of the values. So hopefully everything is clear. All right. In the last lecture, we have learned what's a value and we have learned different types of values. Now in this lecture, we will learn one of the most powerful features of programming language, which is called variable. A variable is a name that refers to a value. Basically, we are given a name to a value for future use in our program. So from here, you see that we have given a name to a one. So one can be referred in the feature by calling its name over here. So the name of one in this case is A. Now, for example, let's say we have a phone book and we have just written down the numbers of people. And the next time you look at this phone book over here, there is no way to know whose number is these numbers. So in a sense, it's same thing with computers. Even though we have inputted the piece of data, there is no way for us to be able to refer the inputted data unless we give it a name. So in our phone book, we might say that this particular number is belong to Elshad and this particular number belong to Eddie. So in the future, when we are looking at our phone book, we can easily identify whose number is this by looking at their names. So in programming, we are calling these names variables. In our code, we could write something like this. So in this case, you see that the name of variable is Eddie and the value that we are assigning to this variable is this number after the equal sign. So we are writing the variable name equals to the value that we want to assign to this variable. So writing the name equals to the value is called assignment statements, which creates a new variable and give them values. Now here, I want to make sure that this equal sign over here is not same as the equal sign that we get used to in math. This is assignment statement, which means that it assigns this value to this variable over here. So for in the future, when we call this variable, it will give us this value over here. So in Python, 
Mathematical equal sign is different than the assignment sign. So in our upcoming lectures, we will talk about this in depth. Now let's see how can we create these variables in practice. Here, I've opened my editor over here from Replit. So I can create, for example, first variable like this. So the name of variable was Eddie and the number, for example, I can put any number over here. So whenever I refer to Eddie, it's going to give me this value over here. For example, we have learned from previous lectures that we can use print statement. So before we were printing out straight away this value, now if I print out Eddie, you'll see that it prints out this value over here. Now let's create a few more variables over here. For example, message, I can put something like this. I'm learning Python, or we can create another variable n, which for example, 17 or pi, which is equal to 3.14159, something like this. So these are the examples of assignments or variables. So in the first, we are assigning integer to Eddie. In the second variable, we are assigning a string type of value to message. Then in the third line, we are assigning integer type of value to n. And in the fourth line, we are assigning floating number to the pi. Now in the future, whenever we need these values, we don't need to write their values. We can just refer to their names. For example, if you want to calculate some equations using pi, you are just assigning it to over here and using it many times in your program. So I can print out, for example, pi, you'll see that it's printing out the pi's value over here. So it's printing out the pi's value. So as I mentioned, this means that in the future, if we need this piece of data, we just refer their names over here. And these names are called variables. Now from here, as the name variable suggests, it is something that can be changed or varied. So for example, let me just put something like this here. For example, I'm creating the variable of name. For example, I will assign it Ershad and I'll just print out this. So if I run our code, you see that it prints to the console Ershad because I'm referring the data by its name, variable name. Now, for example, later on, I decided to give this variable a different piece of data to hold. Let's say, for example, I will put name equals to Eddie. And then after assigning it, I want to print out one more time name. So what do you think these lines will print? Now, if we run this code, we see that both names get printed to the console. So at this point, when we call print first, the name was holding the value of Ershad. But in the line of three, we have assigned new value to the name. And we, when we are printing out this, it was holding the value of Eddie. So that's why in the first print statement, it prints out Ershad. And in the second print statement, it prints out Eddie because, because before printing out this variable, I have assigned new value to it. So after this assignment, whenever you refer to name, it's going to print out Eddie. So for example, if I put one more time print over here, you'll see that it prints out Eddie twice. So this means that the variable keeps the last value that we assign to it. And this way of writing the code makes our code a lot easier and you will see it in our upcoming lectures. So all in all, we can say that variables are used to store information to be referenced and manipulated in the computer program. They also provide way of labeling data with a descriptive name. So by giving the descriptive name, we can identify the variables easily. So it's helpful to think of variables as a containers that hold information. Their sole purpose is to label store data in the memory. This data then can be used throughout our program. Now, when it comes to the naming of the variable, we have to be very careful to prevent syntax errors. So programmers generally use the names for their variables that are meaningful and they are documenting that variable, mentioning that what variable is used for. The name of variables can contain letters and numbers, but we cannot start the name of a variable with the number. For example, if I create a new variable from here with the starting with number and for example, I put first name like this and assign it to Ershad and try to print, run our code, you see that it gives us syntax error. So this means that we cannot start the variable's name with the number. So it's legal to use the uppercase letters, but it's good idea to begin the variable's name with the lowercase. And we can use underscore in our variables. For example, you can write something like this. My underscore name is Ershad. So we are just printing out my name. You will see that everything works smoothly. So if I run our code, 
you see that everything works all right so whenever you want to declare a variable in which you have multiple words so you can use underscore between them but some programmers prefer to use camel case style in their code i also personally prefer that style because it's more readable for me in camel case style we are just starting the name with lowercase then when you have the second word you are putting it like this with the capital letter so my name is become like this so it looks like some kind of camel so that's why they put the name of camel case uh, so then whenever, whenever you print out this name it will work right so you see that everything works fine for example if you have another variable uh, like this for example my second name so it's going to be like this so you can declare your variable in camel case style like this so here you need to keep in mind that if you give a variable an illegal name you will get syntax error so the illegal one of the illegal name is, is you cannot start variable name with number another you cannot use characters uh, like for example at character for example name i put name at over here you'll see that it gives us syntax error because you see that we cannot use at sign over here or if you use the keywords that we explained in our previous lecture as a variable name then it gives you a syntax error as well so these are the 35 keywords that we have for python so it's highly recommended not to use these keywords as a variable name for example if i put over here one of these for example class like this and run our code you'll see that it gives us syntax error because the class is the reserved word for python so we cannot use the reserved words as variable name for example there might be situations you are getting error and you are checking everything and you see that everything seems all right but you don't know the reason of the error so if the syntax error is something like this so i advise you to check that if the name that you have created is in the reserved list of the python because when you are starting programming initially maybe many people use reserved words as variable names so that's why they get confused about this and get many syntax error but after some time they get used to it and they are avoiding using reserved words as a variable name so this is all for this lecture so in this lecture i have explained you everything about variables so hopefully everything is clear about variables so see you in the next lecture now in this lecture we are going to talk about operators in python so what are operators so these are special symbols that represent computations like addition, multiplication, or some other mathematical operation. Basically, in Python, we can use plus sign for addition, minus sign for subtraction, an asterisk sign for multiplication, and forward slash for division. So, for example, in Python, if you want to add two numbers together, you can write 1 plus 1 like this. So if I just print out the result of this 1 plus 1, you will see that it's adding 1 by 1 and returning the result. So if I run our code, you see that it's going to return 2 over here. Now, plus sign is used for addition in Python. So this sign is same as the sign that we have in mathematics. So by plus, we are adding two numbers together. Now, what if we want to subtract two numbers in Python? So for example, if I write something like this, we are using minus sign for subtraction so if i run it you see that the result will be one so two minus one is one now when it comes to multiplication here we, instead of using x for multiplication we are using asterisk sign so if i put two multiply two and run it you'll see that we are getting four over here but when it comes to division we are using forward slash so in case of division we are using forward slash over here so if i run it you see that the result will be two now one thing to note over here that Whenever you are dividing the numbers, you always end up with the floating point number. So here you can see that we have a floating point number over here. So after 2, we have point 0. Even though 4 can be divided by 2 clearly, but we have a floating number over here. So this is how the fighting works. So you need to take into account that the result always after division will be floating. But sometimes you want to get integer number from division so you can put two forward slash over here which is called floor division and get two over here but you have to be very careful over here because this is only returning the quotient so for example if i put five over here you will see that this time also it's returning two because the quotient from the division of five by two is two so that's why we are getting two so you have to be very careful about this so if the number is directly divided by a given number without any remainder 
you can use floor division for getting the integer number or in the future we'll talk about some other ways which are converting the floating number to integer for now you need to take into account that floor division which is two forward slash over here returns only the quotient another operator which is really really useful is two asterisk sign so if i put for example over here two asterisk sign what will happen so this is built-in exponent operator in python so when you want to raise the number to the bar of any other number you can use two asterisk over here for example if i run this code now you will see that we get 25 because 5 multiplied 5 is 25 so by writing two asterisks we can raise the number to the power of given second number so having the exponent being built in the language is one of the reasons why python is really loved by a lot of scientists and mathematicians because it's really optimized towards manipulating and handling numbers now one of the things you have to be very careful about when you are doing these mathematical operations is that when you have more than one operation on the same line of code then there is a certain level of priority so some operations like division and multiplications are going to be first class whereas others like plus and minus are the second class so the rule that you might have remembered from high school is called PEMDAS. So many of you might remember this rule, which is called PEMDAS. So by using this PEMDAS rule, we can identify the priority of the operations in Python as we have in mat mathematics. So here, P stands for parentheses, E stands for exponents, M stands for multiplication, D stands for division, and A for addition, and S for subtraction. But here I want to make sure that multiplication and division are equally important so when it comes to your calculation the calculation that is most to the left is one that will be prioritized between the multiplication and division so let me give you a real example to make this more clear so let's say we have a line of code multiplication like this so 2 multiply with 2 and plus 2 divide by 2 and minus 1 now if i execute this line of code and print out the result to the console what will be the result in which order computer will solve this problem so is it going to start from left to right or it will prioritize some operations over here so based on this rule which shows the priority of the operations over here so we are starting from parentheses exponent then multiplication division addition and subtraction based on this rule we can solve this so here i want you to pause the video and think about the result so you can calculate it based on pemdas rule over here Now hopefully you have found the result, but if you have not found it, let's find it together. So using our PEMDAS rule, we can see that the first thing that we need to do is what is in the parentheses. So in our case, we don't have parentheses, so we are ignoring this part, first part. Then we are continuing to the exponent. So you see that we don't have any exponent over here. So this means that we will ignore this part also. Then the next part is multiplication. So when we have multiplication and division, we are starting from the leftmost side. So in this case, we have multiplication, so which means that 2 multiply with 2 will be 4. Then plus, we are going to calculate this part, so 2 divided by 2 is 1, then minus 2. We have finished this part also, and we are continuing to do addition and subtraction. So when we have addition and subtraction, we'll just start from left to right. So 4 plus 1 minus 2 is going to be 3. So our result will be 3. Now if we run our code over here, I'll just call print function to print out this result to the console to see that if we get the right result. You see that we have got the 3. Now here also you see that the result comes with the 3.0 which is floating number because we have division over here. So when you have division, you need to take into account that the result will be floating number. Now here I have shown you the order of operators using PEMDAS rule. Now it's a good time to introduce a new code editor which is very great especially for beginners so the name of editor is tony now you might be interested why we are introducing it now because it's very great for beginners and it helps you to understand in which order the computer execute our codes so by using debug functionality of that editor the order of calculations in this equation will be very clear now here i want you to go to the website which is called tony and from this website you can download python id for beginners so it's available for Mac, Windows, and for Linux. So whichever operating system you are using, download, download it, and then come back to our lecture. And after installation, if I just copy this code and pass it to Tony, now you see that after running it, 
we have got the same result 3.0 now here there's a functionality called debugging so if you click on this bug button over here which shows the debug current script and debugging is enabled for this code over here now the button that we are going to use is step into so which shows the order of the execution of our code now if i click on this you see that it's going to execute this print statement over here now it says that the print statement will be executed now if i click one more time it takes the expression that we have in the print statement now in the next step you see that it's checking for multiplication and division so you see that it highlighted multiplication and division now when if i click one more time it's taking the one which is located on the left so which is multiplication so by clicking one more time you see that it is going to be calculated so it's identifying the numbers as a integer or floating then it's calculating this number so in the next step you see that it's calculated 2 multiplied 2 which is 4 then it will continue to the next order so in the next order we know that we have to calculate division so when i click it to the next you see that it's identifying the numbers so we have 2 divided by 2 so it's going to calculate it and which is 1.0 so as we said before when you use division in python it's returning the floating number then it's going to sum up these numbers so it's identifying it and summing up you see that we are getting 5.0 because 4 plus 1.0 is 5.0 then it's going to identify this number and calculate this expression you see that after calculation our code becomes 2.3.0 so it's going to print out this to to the console so this functionality of this editor is very useful for especially beginners because by debugging you can identify in which order our computer executes our code so here you see that python uses pemdas rule now let's go back to our replet so as i mentioned before the reason why i'm using replet code editor because it's available online so it doesn't matter where are you if you have internet connection you can access it and have your projects online ready that's why for now i advise you to use replet editor so as you remember we said that by using floor division we can get quotient of division which means that for example if i i'm going to print out the result if i divide four by three with floor division which is two forward slash and run our code you see that we are going to get one now there might be situations you want to get the remainder from this expression over here so in this case we are going to use another operator which is called modulus and this is signed with a person sign so if i just copy this one and pass it over here and put person over here you will see that both of them return one because when we divide the four by three the quotient is one and the remainder is one let me take another number which will uh, give a different result in this case if i divide 11 by 3 you know that when we dividing 11 by 3 we are getting 3 and the remainder is 2 so you see that in the first expression it's returning 3 and in the second one it is returning 2 so now this operator the modulus operator will be is surprisingly useful for example there might be situations that you want to check whether one number is divisible by another so if the result from the modulus operator is zero it means that the first number is divisible by second number for example if i put over here 2 which is 12 and i'm going to delete this part and run our code you see that it's going to return zero so this means that by calling modulus operator we can identify if any number is divisible by the second number or not so if it is zero it means that it is divisible and you there might be other situations that for example you want to extract the digits of the number so here for example if i put instead of 310 you see that it's going to extract the second number from this two digit, two digit number so for example in two digit number if you want to extract the both digits you can put 100 over here and run it so these are the mathematical operations i'm just explaining it which might be useful for you in the future so for example if i put like this 120 the modulus 100 you see that it's going to give us the last two digits by using modulus operator it's very easy to extract the digits from the numbers so by dividing by 10 or by dividing by 100 or by dividing by 1000 you can get how many digits that you want from here so the interesting moment is if you divide it for example by 10 in 10 we have one zero so it's going to give us only one digit so in 100 we have two zero it's going to give us only last two digits 
in thousand we have three zero is going to give us only last three digits so based on the number of zeros so we can extract the number of digits that's located in the number so this modulus operation is very useful when you are doing mathematical operations now in this lecture we have learned these operations over here now you might be interested that can we use these operators for other value types so it's obvious that we can use them for floating numbers and for integers but we have another data types which are string and boolean now in case of string we can use some of these operators for example so we can use plus operator in strings and multiplication which is asterisk operator in strings so if i put over here hello plus l shot and run our code you see that it's adding these two strings together so which means that in python we are calling it concatenating so if you want to concatenate two strings you are just using the plus sign over here so plus sign is used in python for strings to concatenate them together so as i said we can use multiplication operator for strings but in this case one of the value must be the integer for example if i cannot put two string over here and put asterisk over here and run it because in this case it's going to give us error you see that we have error so the error says that we cannot multiply two strings together but instead of for example hello over here if i put three which is an integer and run our code you see that it's going to print out l shot three times so it's concatenating l shot three times three l shot l shot and i l shot over here now by using multiplication with string and integers we can print out the strings how many times that we want to print out to the console so if I put over here five, 4, it's going to print out 4. So if I put, for example, something like this to space over here to make space between them. So now you see that we have space between them. So this is how it works. Now you might be noticed that while we are working with operators, the most common word that we are using is expression. Now, what's expression? An expression is a combination of values, variables, and operators in Python. A value itself can be considered as expression, and a variable, for example, if I create variable over here, name like Elshad, this can be expressed as an expression. Or if I put, for example, four multiply Elshad over here, instead of Elshad, I'm going to put name. So this is also another expression. So the combination of values, variables, and operators is called expression in Python. So as a beginner, you need to know whenever someone asks expression in Python. So everything relates to variables, operators, and values are called expressions. So with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have explained different types of operators in Python, and hopefully everything is clear about them. Now in this lecture, we will talk how can we input data to our program. So for now, we have seen the print function, which prints the output to the console for the user. But sometimes we would like to take the value for a variable from the user via their keyboard. For these purposes, Python provides a built-in function called input. So this function gets input from the keyboard. So we have learned that if we want to ask a user's name, we are just printing out username. Now, if you run this code, now you see that what's your name is printed out in the console. But there is no way for the user to be able to insert data over here, which will be used in our program. So in order to do that, instead of using print function, we are going to use different function, which is called input function. Now here, instead of print, if I put input, you might notice that while I'm typing, code intelligence gives me some suggestion because it thinks that I might need input function over here. Now, if I double click on it, it's bringing this one over here. So this is what print function looks like. So this is the name of the function and followed by parentheses and inside parentheses, we need to write prompt that I'm going to give to the user. Now, if I run this code, you will see that it also says, what's your name? And in this case, the cursor will stay at the end of this line because it's expecting some sort of input. Now you need to keep in mind that whenever we call input function, the program stops and waits for the user to type something. When the user press hit or enter, the program resumes and input the returns what the user typed over here. Now, if I type here, for example, Elshad, my name is Elshad, and hit enter, you will see that our program stopped. So my name passed back into my code. Now it replaced this part of code in our program. Now you might notice that this code with the print function looks like similar. But for example, if I run print function, you'll see that our code stops directly. So how do we know that? We know it from this orange arrow. So if the orange arrow appears over here, it means that our program stopped, our program executed everything. 
if it is not it means that it's waiting for our action so if i put input over here and run our code you will see that we don't see the that orange arrow over here so as soon as we type the name and hit enter that orange arrow appears over here it means that our program stopped work so we have in inserted this piece of data to our program now the input function looks like identical to print function but instead of word print we have input over here then we have parentheses then inside parentheses we need to write our prompt so we are adding this prompt for the user to give them a hint as what kind of data we want and when we run it it will print out the prompt and there will be a cursor at the end of this prompt over here in some code editors you will see that this cursor is flashing in some of them you will see just a white cursor over there so when you type the information and hit enter it will disappear and our program will use that data inside the program now here the question is what can we do with this data so we can use this information in our inside our code so as you remember we have mentioned that when we put any data to the response of this input over here this data replaces this information over here so in this case i have put a shot over here so this means that so this expression over here gets replaced in our code with the name of a shot so let's see how this is working for example if i put print function over here and inside print function if i put hello plus this expression over here so this means that this will get replaced the value that imported in our console so if i run our code you see that it asks me what's your name so if i put over here Elshad, it's printing out hello Elshad over here now in the previous lecture we have learned that so if we use plus sign between the strings it's just concatenating them so to add space over here i'm just going to put space here and run our code and put my name over here you will see that it returns hello Elshad. so bas basically what we have done over here is we have called print function and inside print function we have called input function which is nested function in this case so whenever we run this code first this part of code is executed so it's asking you what's your name then when we put Elshad over here this expression get replaced with my name then it's printing out hello Elshad over here now you might have difficulty to understand this line of code over here at this stage so if you have difficulties it's good time to recommend you a new code editor which is for beginners so here i want you to head over to the tony org website so you can download for mac or for windows or for linux this is completely free but it is very useful for beginners so once you have installed the application you can go ahead and pass your line of code over here now here in tony we have a great feature which is called debug the current script now if you click this debug button you see that these buttons becomes available now here we are going to use step into button now what this button is doing is it shows us how python executes this line of code over here now if i click on this you see that it takes this line of code over here and says that it's going to execute this line of code now if i click one more time it shows that the print function will be executed and it's checking the expression inside print function now if i click one more time you see that it checks first hello so it's going to convert it to string then it's going to check input function over here so this is the expression that's going to check so it needs to understand it and checks the prompt inside input function then if i click one more time it's converting this one into string so it's identifying that this is string then it's going to execute input function over here now if i click one more time you see that what's your name is printed out over here and our buttons become disabled because it's waiting for our action now if i put my name over here Elshad, and hit enter you see that this expression over here get replaced with my name so it shows exactly how it is executing so it's replacing that expression with with the value that inputted from here so in our case i have inputted Elshad, so that's why it's showing Elshad over here now if i click one more time it's going to concatenate these values so you see that they are concatenated because we have used plus sign over here now after concatenation it's going to print out this expression so you see that hello Elshad is printed out to the console so by using tony editor we can easily debug our code and see how the code editor executes this line of code now you might be interested why we are not using 
Tony Code Editor in our course. So uh, I'm using Replit because it's accessible from anywhere in the internet. So if you have internet access, you can access it from anywhere so you don't need to take your laptops with you. That's why for our course, I prefer to use Replit editors. Now, in the future, we are going to use different editors. So as our course progress, I'm going to show you different types of editors. So in this way, you will have enough knowledge about different types of editors. And then you will identify difference between them and you will choose the one which is the best for you. Now, hopefully you have understood how input function works. Now, if you use input function with the variables, this makes our code more readable. So for example, if I create name variable over here like this and assign it to the input expression that we have over here, and then by using variable, I can put it over here. And in this case, if I run our code and put my name over here and hit enter, you'll see that it's printing out hello Ashad one more time. Basically what we are doing over here is we are creating a variable over here and then we are assigning a value that comes from the console. So in this case, from console, we have Ashad over here. Then we are printing out this variable with the hello name. So by using variable, you can take an information from the console and save it to the variable and use it in the feature. So in this case, using input function with the variables is very useful. If I run our code one more time, here you might notice that whenever we run input function, our cursor remains after the prompt. So if you want to make the cursor flash in a new line, so in this case, we need to use backslash with n. So if I put, for example, over here, backslash with n, run our code one more time. Now you see that the cursor moves to the new line. So basically backslash n at the end represents a new line, which is a special character that uses a line break. So when we put it inside prompt in the string, so it's always showing the cursor in the new line. So in Python, we are using backslash with n whenever we need new line character. So this is used for new line character. So for example, if I print out something like this, hello backslash with n world. So in this case, backslash n is a sign of new line. So in the console, it's going to print out something like this. So hello will be in the first sentences and world will be in the second sentences. Now, if I do it in the practice, so for example, if I put backslash n over here and after hello also over here, and stop and run our code you see that it's printing the cursor is in the new line so if i put Elshad and hit enter you see that hello Elshad is printed out in separate lines so in python we are using this character whenever we need a new line character so you can use it inside strings to put a new line in python so hopefully you have understood this new line character also now with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture we have learned how can we pass data from the console to our program and then we have learned how can we put a new line character in python so by using backslash n we can put it so this is all for this lecture so see you in the next lecture now in this lecture we are going to talk about python comments so what's a comment in python basically this kind of notes we are adding to our codes to remember things very easily as programs get bigger and more complicated, they get more difficult to understand. So whenever we write a complex program, when we come back to our code in the future, if you have any problem, so it's very difficult to understand what is our code doing. So for those cases, Python comments is very useful. So basically, if you want to write a comment in Python, it starts with hash symbol. So this is the code that we have from the previous lecture. So here, if I want to add a comment, I'll just hit enter over here and put hash key over here. So whatever I write after hash symbol, the interpreter will ignore it. And so this part will not be executed. So this part is very useful for writing rows in formal language. For example, I can write something like this. So this name variable takes the input from the console. So I can rewrite over here that the name, the name variable takes name from console. So whenever we come back to our code, we can easily remember that what is the purpose of this name variable over here. So by reading the formal language from here. So if I execute our code one more time, you'll see that nothing changed in our execution. So if I put my name or Elshad, you see that nothing changed in our execution. So this means that these comments has nothing to do with the execution. It's just for people to understand 
what is going on in our code. So this is a very simple code, but when you write very complicated programs, comments becomes very useful. As I said, you can put comment in new line or you can put comment after the line of code. So if I put over here hash symbol, so this part will be executed. So the code that is located before hash symbol will be executed, but after hash symbol, it's not going to be executed. This part will be not executed. So if you run our code, you see that nothing is changed in our code. So everything works smoothly. So the shortcut for adding comments on Mac, it is command forward slash on Windows, it's control forward slash. For example, in our code, if I have a formula, which is calculating the, for example, 50% uh, of 10. So we are multiplying 10 with 50 and divided by 100. So if I create a variable over here for this calculation, for example, a is equal to like this. So whenever in the future we come to this formula, we might not remember this. So for remembering it, we can put over here comment, which says that the calculation of 50% of 10. So we can easily remember it from over here. So this comments contains really, really useful information that's not in the code. So there are three reasons for using comments in our code. So the first reason is you can use the comments to explain the codes itself. So you can, by writing comments, we can say that what this part of code is doing. So then in the future, when we come back to our code, we can easily remember it. The other reason is we can make our code more readable. So by writing comments, the codes become more readable. So it's very easy to understand it. And the final reason might be when you are testing your code, you might want not to execute one part of code. So in this case, you can just comment that part of code and and execute the program. For example, if I have a variable like this, so which is calculating the 50% of 10. So if I have another variable, for example, it be equal to 100. So for example, if I want to test my code, I want to test only A. So I'm just printing out A to see that if this is calculating. So I want to ignore this part. So if I want to ignore this part here, I'm coming to this line of code and clicking on Windows, it's control forward slash on Mac, common forward slash. So you see that automatically this part of code added into the comments. So this part will not be executed. So if I run this, you'll see that it just printed out five over here, which is A. So if I try to print out B, for example, you'll see that our program will give error saying that this B is not defined. So because we put B in the comments. So if I remove it from comment and run our program, you'll see that it's going to print out B. So this means that, so whenever you want to skip execution of a part of code, then in this case, you can comment that part and execute other part, then you can uncomment it to make it executable. So these are the reasons we need comments in the Python. So we will use these comments in our programs in the future when our, when our code becomes more complicated. So you just need to keep in mind that this part of code is not getting executed and it's very useful to make our code understandable and readable. So that's all for this lecture. So see you in the next lecture. All right, till now we have talked about Python variables. Now, when it comes to the naming of your variables, you can pretty much call them whatever you want. Now, instead of calling name over here, I can put n over here. So when I change the variable name over here, so I need to change the printing statement over here as well. So if I run our code, you will see that everything works the way that it worked before. So if I put my name over here and hit enter, you will see that it's printing my name. So nothing is changing if I change the name of variable over here. But there's a couple of rules you should probably follow. And the most important one is we need to make our code readable. Because if you come back to your code after six or 12 months, this N over here will not make a lot of meaning for you. So we need to try to make sure that these variables make sense. And to make our variables more understandable, we can even use multiple naming in our variable names. So for example, if you want to put instead of N over here, username, in Python, you can write it like this, user underscore name. So when you write it, you need to change from here. And if you run our code, you'll see that everything works the way that it worked before. So this means that in Python, when you are writing multiple naming, you can put underscore over here. And another way of writing multiple naming is camel casing. So in case of camel casing, the first word starts with lowercase. Then when you reach the second word, we are writing it it in uppercase. So this is how we can write our code multiple naming. So this one also will work smoothly without any error in our code. But here you need to take into account that you cannot use space between these two multiple naming. So if I put space over here and run our code, you will see that our error gives us 
syntax error. So in this case, it says that invalid syntax. So this means that Python does not allow us to use multiple naming with space in variable name. Now, if you want to use numbers in the name of your variable, you can actually use them. For example, we can write instead of name over here, we can write name one. So as you see, if I run it, it's working perfect. So instead of name one, you can put name two, name three, whatever you want. But here you need to take into account that you cannot start variable name with the number. So if I put over here one name, so Python will give us error saying that this is invalid syntax. So in this case, it means that we cannot start our variable names with the number. So if we do so, it, it will generate a syntax error as well. Finally, there are certain privileged words that we use, for example, the name of functions like print or input. So it's usually good practice to avoid these keywords as the name of the variables. This is the reserved list in Python. So sometimes it accepts this as a variable name, sometimes it will raise an error. For example, if I put instead of name over here input and print out input, you will see that it runs our code without an error. But here we have another problem. Here you see that syntax highlighting gets messed up by coloring the variable name as yellow and the function name as yellow. But before we were writing this name, this color was white, but when you put it the function name, it, it becomes yellow. So syntax highlighting gets messed up by coloring the variable name like function. So even though you don't have any error, it's really bad practice to use reserved words as variable name because it's really, really confusing. So it's not recommended to use them as a variable name. For example, if I put, for example, over here class, you will see that Python will give us an error. So it's not using this one as a variable name. But when we put the info function over here, it was using it. So sometimes it will give an error. Sometimes the syntax highlighting will mess up. So you need to be very careful about it. Now, the final thing to remember is that if you decide to call the variable name, this particle name, for example, name so which is name and at a later point you make a type error you spell it wrong for example instead of name you put none over here so this will not work when you run your code because it will say that if i put over here nama is not defined so the idea is when you see such type of error is not defined so you are identifying the line and going and checking the line that if you did a type error over here so by going and changing it to the correct variable name, you can fix it. Now here, remember that that's not because Python is doing any sort of spell and checking for you. It's not like a spell checker that we have in our text editors. In fact, if you decide to call this variable nama over here, so this is not a problem, Python will process it. So instead of name, if I put nama over here and run our code, you will see that Python will not have an error and it will run everything perfectly. So this means that as long as these two spellings are identical, then the computer does not care at all. It will process it. So when you get the name error in your code, you now know it's probably because you have misspelled or mistyped one of the variable names somewhere in your code. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So hopefully, so hopefully you have understood how can you name your variable in the future. I highly recommend you to follow these rules when you are naming the, your variables. So see you in the next lecture. All right. Now in the previous lecture, we have solved weeks in years challenge and we have printed out the final result like this. Now here you can see that to print out a simple message to the console, we have done a lot of operations like concatenation and typecasting. Now this is quite painful and understandably, a lot of programmers will need some slightly more convenient way of incorporating things that we have different data types. So let's say we have different data types like integer, float, and boolean. And we want to mix all of them into a sentence that's a string and get printed out to the console. So to convert all these data types and print them out is really, really painful. So instead of doing all these conversions and concatenations over here, we can use fstring. So fstring allows us to combine all different data types together without converting and concatenating them. All we have to do is, in front of string, we just need to type f. So in this case, in our project over here, I'm just going to comment this part, which is inside print by using the concatenation and conversion. So here, I'm just going to put this line after f string over here. So I'm going to write this message in f string. So in this case, all we have to do is 
we have to put f in front of string and it's really important that it goes in front of the double quotes or single quotes over here then i'm just going to delete these conversions from here so in this case it's going to be like this so we are going to delete these concatenations over here so it's going to be like this so after deletion you see that we have deleted all concatenation but our variables that we have over here year and week stays as string over here so we have to do something over here to differentiate these weeks from these weeks over here because in this case if i just print out the result it's going to print out there are weeks weeks in year years so in this case we have to take the values from these variables over here so in case of f string we are putting these variables inside a set of curly braces so it's going to be like this so these weeks is the weeks that comes from this variable so i'm going to put these weeks inside curly braces and this year also comes from this variable so in this case i'm going to put it over here inside curly braces so as you can see without any conversion over here we are just putting the f in front of string over here before the double quotation or single quotation and we are putting the variables inside curly braces over here now in this case if i run our code you will see that it's working the way that it worked before so we need to enter the number of years so i'm just going to put two over here and if i enter two it's going to print out the message that we printed out before so there are 104 weeks in two years over here so as you can see instead of writing these concatenations and conversion over here by using f string we can just combine all different data types together without any conversion or concatenation all we have to do we have to write f in front of the string over here and then we have to write the variables inside curly braces over here so as you can see by using f string you cut down a lot of manual labor of inserting different data types into a string and this is going to be really handy in the future when you become a professional python developer now another important thing that i want to mention in this lecture is round function in python so i'm just going to put over here round so when we were talking about operators and expressions we have mentioned that whenever we divide a number by another number we always get floating number it doesn't matter if this number's integer or floats but the result from the division will be float number so in this case for example if i divide 10 by 3 you will see that in this case we are getting 3.333 at the end we have 5 over here so as you can see even though these numbers over here are integer we are getting floating number now of course it's possible to get integer by floor division or we can convert the result to the integer so if i put floor division for example over here it's going to return the integer so in this case it's going to return three so other way of doing this we can convert this result into integer by using in function over here so if i use the in function it's going to print out three one more time over here because this is integer but here when we use floor division or converting to the integer we see that all it does is it just chops off everything after the decimal point instead of what we would traditionally do which is to round the number so we know from math that if the number is 3.5 in this case it's going to go to the 4 if the number is less than 3.5 in this case it's going to go to 3 if we round it by using mathematical operation over here now in python it's super easy to round the number all we have to do is we just need to use round function like this so when we are dividing for example 10 by 3 in this case i'm just going to put round function over here so it's going to round it without any conversion over here so if i run it you'll see that in this case also it's returning 3 because if i just put it over here without rounding you'll see that when we divide 10 by 3 it is 3.333 so this means that it's less than 3.5 so that's why it's going to go to the 3 over here when we are rounding it now here you need to take into account that when we are rounding number in this case it's returning an integer so we have whole number over here but if you wanted you can actually go a step further you can actually specify the number of digits of precision you wanted to round it now here if you round it without any precision you are just going to get the whole number but if you round it using for example precision over here like this so you just, you just need to provide comma then the precision so in this case for example if i want to put two decimal places over here i'm just going to provide two so if i run our code you will see that in this case it's printing out 3.33 over here so in this case it's rounded it only two decimal place 
Now, instead of, for example, division over here, if I put something like this, so I'm just going to delete this part from here. So instead of, for example, division, if I put something like this, 3.3334445555, something like this, and run our function, you'll see that in this case also it's printing out 3.33 over here. So we are rounding it into two decimal places. So if I put three over here, for example, it's going to round it into three decimal places. So as you can see, it's rounding it to three decimal places. But instead of, for example, 3.33 over here, if I put 3.56789, so in this case, you see that it's going to round it to the three decimal place over here. Now, if I just delete these three precision from here and run it, in this case, it's going to round it to four because it's greater than 3.5 over here. So by using round function, we can round our numbers. So we can put precision over here or we can just leave it as round over here. So if we have not provide any precision, it's just going to round it to whole number and integer number. Otherwise, it's going to put decimal places after those over here, whatever we provide as, as precision over here. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have discussed how can we use F string and how can we round numbers in Python. So hopefully everything is clear about F string and rounding. So see you in the next lecture. Hey guys, welcome to the new section which is called conditional execution. Today you will learn all about Boolean expressions, conditional execution, nested conditionals, chained conditionals, multiple if statements, logical operators, try and accept block, and a whole lot more. So by the end of this section, you will know enough to be able to build five awesome real life projects. So this will help you implement what you have learned in this section. The first project will be gross pay with the overtime. So as you remember in our previous section, we have created gross pay project. Now here we are going to add extra condition this is going to be our time because here we are going to rewrite the project and give the employee 1.5 times the hourly rate for the hours worked above the 40 hours because we know that normally we work 40 hours in a week so if we work above 40 hours the rate will be calculated based on the overtime rate then the next project will be leap year so here i have provided what's a leap year so based on this uh, definition we are going to write the condition to find out if any given year is a leap year or not so the year must be evenly divided by four if the year can also be evenly divided by 100 then it's not a leap year unless the year is also evenly divided by 400 so i will explain the solution of this project also so you will understand what's going on over here but if you want to do it by yourself you can read this instruction and do it after completing this section then the next project will be love calculator. So based on the names that we are going to provide to the program, it's going to give you interesting message based on your names and it's going to calculate the score of that love. So based on this score, we are going to provide the interesting message to the users. So this is going to be kind of funny. Then the next project will be gross pay with the execution. So in this section, we are going to cover the try and accept blocks. So based on try and accept blocks, we are going to change the gross pay with the exception because sometimes people instead of integer number might write something like this for example a string then in this case our program will raise an error then the next project will be score checker so we are going to provide the score to the program and based on that score is going to give us the grade of the student so these five awesome projects will make sure that you have implemented everything that you have learned in this section so one more time I want to mention that if you feel that you can do these projects without covering this section, you can continue to do the projects and continue to the next section. But I advise you to watch the videos because th th there are lots of things that you will learn to become a better developer. So once you are ready, head over to the next lesson and we are going to start picking up the skills that's going to be required in order to build these five awesome projects. So see you in the next lesson. All right, in the previous section, when we were talking about data types, we have talked about Boolean type, in which we have only two values, true and false. Now here, in this lecture, we are going to talk about Boolean expressions, because Boolean expressions are very crucial when it comes to conditional execution. 
So as we said, in this section, we are learning conditional execution. So, so in conditional execution, Boolean expressions are playing very crucial role. A Boolean expression, an expression that either is true or false. So based on these values, true or false, we can divide our programs into several conditions. In Python, if you want to check an expression, whether it's true or false, we are using operators. Now the first operator is equal operator, which is equal sign from math. So if you want to check that if two values are equal, we need to use equal sign over here. Now here you need to take into account that equal sign is different from the equal sign that we have learned in math. So in math, we know that this is the equal sign. But here in Python, the equal sign is denoted by double equal sign over here. So for example, if I want to check an expression like this, one equals one. In this case, if I hit enter, you will see that it's returning true because in reality, one is equal to one. But instead of equal operator, if I put one equal sign over here, so it's going to be one is equal to one like this. In this case, you will see that Python will raise an error. So in this case, it says that cannot assign to literals. So this means that a single equal sign in Python is used as assignment operator. So this is not equal sign over here. So this is a common mistake. So that's why I want to mention over here. But if you write it with double equal sign over here, it's becoming an expression over here with the equal operator. So in this case, if I check for another example, for example, if I write one is equal to two, in this case, you see that our expression returns false. So based on this operator over here, we can identify the execution of our program in Python using equal operator. Now, as we mentioned before, the return value of Boolean expressions over here is true or false. And here you need to take into account that these values belong to the class of Boo. So they are not string over here. So for example, if I check the type of true over here, you will see that in this case, it's returning bool class over here. So it's applicable for false also over here. So if I check for false, you will see that here again, it's returning bool class. So this means that these values over here is not string. They are just type of bool class over here. So here you see that the value of true and false starts with capital letter because in Python, these values are, are case sensitive. So this means that, so if you write true with the small letter, so this means that in this case, we are not writing the Boolean type over here. We are just writing string type over here. So if I check, for example, the type of true like this and hit enter, you see that in this case, it's not recognizing true as defined. So it means that the name of tree is not defined. So it's recognizing this one as a variable over here. So this means that in Python, when we are writing Boolean values, we need to start with the capital letter, then all letters over here should be lower letters. Now, apart from equal operator over here, we have other operators as well. So the first operator is, is not equal to. So in this case, if you want to check two values, if they are not equal to each other, we are using exclamation mark with equal sign. So for example, if you want to check if one is not equal to two, in this case, we are writing one, then exclamation mark with equal sign and two and hit enter, you'll see that in this case it's returning true because one is not equal to two. So if I write, for example, something like this, one is not equal to one, in this case, you will see that it's returning false. So it means that one is equal to one. So in this case, it's returning false. Now the next operator is, is greater than operator. So this is the same as the one that we have in the math. So it's denoted by greater sign. So if I write something like this, two is greater than one, you will see that in this case, it's returning true because from math, we know that two is greater than one. So for comparing two values, we are using is greater or is less than operator. So same is applicable over here. If I write, for example, two is less than one. In this case, you see that it's going to return false. So these operators are same as the one that we have learned in the math. And the next operator is, is greater than or equal to. So in this case, we are writing is greater than equal to like this. So here, for example, if I put two is greater or equal to one, in, in this case, it's going to return true because it's true that two is greater than one. And here you need to take into account that greater or less sign should come first, then we write equal sign. So here, if I write something like this, if two is equal and greater than one, in this case, you will see that Python raise error because this is not true operator. So here you need to take into account that is greater or equal is, right, is written like this and is less 
or equal will be written like this so first we are writing is less or less sign than equal and another number over here so as you can see in this case it's returning false so here you need to be careful about these expressions as well first we are writing greater and less sign then we are writing equal sign in this case and finally the last operator is is not operator is not operator means that x is not same as y so in this case when we are using is not operator first we need to create variables for example if i create x is equal to one and y is equal to two then in this case we can check that x is not y so as you can see in this case it's returning false so if you write straight away is not operator with the literal over here for example if i write one is not two in this case you see that fight and raising error because in this case with literals you need to use not equal operator over here now here although these operations are probably familiar to you the python symbols are different from the mathematical symbols as we learn over here a common error is to use a single equal sign instead of double equal sign and we need to remember that when we are writing comparison operators first we need to write greater and less sign then we need to write equal sign now with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture we have learned what is boolean expressions and which operators that we have in python and based on these boolean expressions we are going to identify the execution of program in our next lecture so see you in the next lecture all right in this lecture we are going to talk about conditional execution every day when we get up in the morning we make some decisions for instance if it is raining we will use an umbrella so that we don't get wet and if the weather temperature is greater than 20 celsius we will not wear a coat so these are the decisions that we are making in the morning so another decision might be like this if you are late to work we will take a taxi instead of bus over here now this type of decision making is called type branching if one condition is true we are doing one thing if the condition is not true we are doing another thing so in this case if one condition is true that is if the temperature is above 20 celsius we will not wear a coat otherwise we will wear a coat so if this condition is true we are not going to wear a coat because it's going to be very hot in fact we can represent this mechanism with a conditional statement when temperature is greater than 20 then we should not wear a coat but if the temperature is not greater than 20 then we should wear a coat so as you can see our condition starts from here then we are checking that if today's temperature is greater than 20 or not so if it is greater than 20 in this case we are not wearing a coat if it is not greater than 20 if it is less than 20 in this case we are going to wear a coat not to be cold so this type of conditional statement is known as if else statement so depending on particular condition we will do either a or b and when we want to write python code to represent this it's going to look like this so here you can easily see that we have a keyword if and then we have condition now after condition we are going to put colon now after colon over here you see that we have got indented block of code which should be executed if this if condition is met so if this if condition is true we are going to execute this part of code over here and here one more time i want to mention that it is indented code so as you can see this block of code is not located at the same level with the if condition so it should be indented over here otherwise we will have problem in python because in python the indentation is very important then if the condition is not true then we will skip this code from here and we will continue to the else condition so here again we have else keyword and then column then after column we have this block of code over here and this is also indented code you can see we have a space over here you can put space or tab or when you hit the enter over here the code will indent it automatically in many code editors so here if this condition is not met we are going to continue to read part of this code and we are going to implement this code so we could represent the previous weather situation with the code something like this so here if i create a temperature variable like this with assigned value of 15 then here the code block can be like this so first we are checking that if this temperature is greater than 20 in this case we are not going to wear a coat otherwise we are going to wear a coat so if the temperature is 15 in this case it's going to print out to the console wear a coat because in this case the weather is so we need to wear a coat so let's put this into practice with real life problem so let's say you have got a job at a mortgage bureau and your first job of the day is that to write some code that identifies if someone is eligible 
for mortgage or not. So we need to check eligibility of person who wants mortgage. Now there's a couple of things that you need to think about. Firstly, in order for somebody to actually get a mortgage, their salary has to be above $2,000. So we have to check that what their salary is. And based on that, we are going to decide if they are eligible for mortgage or not. Now, if you look at this flow chart, basically the logic that we have to write our program is shown over here. So our program starts from here and we are asking from user what their salary is. Then after getting the salary, we are going to check that if the salary is greater than 2000 or not. So in this case, if the salary is greater than 2000, we are printing out saying that you can get mortgage. Otherwise, if it is not greater than 2000, we are going to print out saying that you cannot get mortgage over here. Now, based on this flowchart over here, let's head over to Replit and create our program in practice by using if else condition. Now here, the first thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to greet a user. So to greet a user, I'm just going to print out welcome message. So it's going to be like this print. So we are going to put welcome to mortgage calculator. Then after doing so, we need to ask from user about their salary. So to get the salary, we are going to use input function over here. So in this case, I'm going to create a variable which is called salary and I'm going to assign the value that we are getting the from input functions to this variable over here. So it's going to be like this input. So as a prompt over here, we are going to put what is your salary. Now then if you run our program, it's going to ask from a user what is their salary. Now we know that whenever we are getting a value with input function, it's going to be string value. But in this case, we need an integer value. So that's why I'm just going to convert this value to integer. So it's going to be like this integer inside this function. We are going to put input. What's your salary? Now, after getting salary, we are going to check that if the type of salary is greater than 2000 or not. So in this case, as we mentioned before, we are going to use if keyword, then we are going to put the condition, which is if the salary is greater than 2000, then we are going to add column over here. So it's going to be like this. If this is the keyword, so we are going to put the condition salary. This is the variable that we are getting from here is greater than 2000. Then after finishing this condition, we are going to put column. Now, after putting the column, if we hit enter, you will see that our cursor is indented over here. So as you can see, our cursor is not come over here. It's come over here, which is indented. So this is very crucial in Python because you have to be very careful about indentation. Now, this means that whatever I'm going to write over here is going to be executed if this condition is met. So if I put something over here, we are going to get error. We have to put it indented level. So if the salary is greater than 2000, we are going to print out saying that you are eligible for mortgage. So it's going to be like this. You are eligible for mortgage. Then after finishing this, we are going to write else condition. Now here also you have to be very careful because if I hit enter, you will see that the cursor is comes to the with the same level with the print statement, but else condition should be in the same level with if condition because these are pairs. So that's why else if should be in the same level. So that's why I'm just going to remove the indentation from here and I'm going to put else condition over here. So after putting else condition, if I put colon over here and hit enter one more time, you see that we have indentation over here. So the condition that we have inside if is starting from here and the code that we are going to have inside else condition will be in the same level as the print statement that we have inside if. So these are located in the same level, in the same indentation level, and this if and else condition are located in same indentation level. So if this is not the case, we are going to put that print sorry you're not eligible for mortgage so with this we have successfully implemented the logic for checking eligibility of a person for mortgage calculator so i know that this is very simple there are many other conditions that we need to take into account when we are checking the eligibility of person for mortgage here just i've put only one condition in which we are checking the only salary now here the really important things are the condition that we are putting over here so this is the condition then the syntax of code so in this case the syntax is else if and else so if is the keyword and else is the keyword and you need to take into account that after these conditions we need to put colon over here and finally the most important thing over here is indentation so everything that we have so everything that is indented if block is a block of code so this means that if i put something over here 
it's going to execute if this condition is met so we can put as many line as that we want over here so it's not we don't have any limitation over here so as far as we put the in indented level it's going to execute this block of code if this condition is met so there is no limit of number of statements that it can appear in the body over here so we have to provide at least one line of code inside this if condition over here another important moment over here as i mentioned it is indentation so if you mess up with the indentation you will get an error for example if i put print statement over here without indented you will see that the code editor says that something is wrong over here if i run our code you'll see that it's printing out indentation error over here so it says that print is not expected as indented block over here so this means that after if condition we have to put our code in indented level so it's going to be like now after finishing this block of code if i run our code in proper way with indented level so you'll see that the first thing that it does is greeting our user and says that was your salary for example if i put as a salary 1000 and hit enter you'll see that in this case it says that you are not eligible sorry you're not eligible now if i run our code one more time and put something which is greater than 2000 2500 so in this case you will see that it says that you are eligible for more use so based on the input that we have provided to the program it's executing different parts of code over here so this is called conditional execution so by using if and else statements we are able to get our code to do different things either printing this line of code over here or printing this line of code over here now when we use this greater sign over here effectively we are saying that the salary has to be greater than 2000 now for example if i run our code for 2000 itself so what will happen in this case in this case it's going to print out sorry you are not eligible for the mortgage so this means that in this case it's not included 2000 over here now if you want to include 2000 over here we can use the operators that we have learned in our previous lecture so we have learned that we can use equal operator which is two equal sign so if i run our code in this case and for example if i enter 2000 and hit enter you will see that in this case it says that you are eligible for mortgage but in this case the ideal version of code for our case can be like this so we are going to use greater equal sign so as we said before first we are putting greater sign then we are putting equal sign so if i run our code you will see that if i enter 2000 and hit enter in this case it says that you are eligible for mortgage so everything works the way that we want so here we can use other operators as well so we can use not equal operator which is exclamation mark and equal sign or we can use less equal operator like this so we can use all operators that we have learned in our previous lecture now here it's important to mention that you can use print statement without else statement over here so if i delete this part of code for example and run our code it's also true it's going to ask the our salary so this is coming from this line of code so if i put for example 2500 and hit enter you will see that you are it says that you are eligible for mortgage but what will happen if i put something less than 2000 over here so let's see if i run our code one more time and put for example 1000 over here and hit enter you'll see that in this case nothing happens because this condition is not met and we don't have else conditions so there's not any code to be executed over here so this means that you we can use this if condition for special cases over here without else condition so every time we don't need to provide else condition so if we don't need it we can skip it another important point over here is for example when you are writing a code and you don't know what you are going to put over here for example if the condition is met you don't remember that what you are going to put over here so you can put just pass keyword over here so pass keyword does nothing it's just passing this condition over here so for example in this case if i run our code put something which is greater than 2000 2500 and hit enter you see that in this case it's just passing so this is just skipping this part of code over here so here you can put pass and put com some comments that in the future what you are going to write over here so you can use this pass keyword as a placeholder for your code that you have not written yet now with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture we have learned so how can we use if and else condition in our code and how can we get our program to execute the code based on the different conditions over here so hopefully everything is clear about if and else conditions so see you in the next lecture
Now in this lecture we are going to learn another type of conditionals which is nested conditional which means that one conditional can be also nested within another one. Now in previous lecture we have seen if else statements look like this. So here we have only two choices. So if this condition is true we are doing this one. If this condition is not true we are continuing to the else condition and we are doing the one which is in red over here. But in a nested if statement once the first condition has passed, we can check for another condition. And then we can have another if else statement inside this if condition over here. So this means that if this first condition is true, we are continuing to do another if condition over here. So here inside this if condition, we have another if condition in which we are checking for another condition. So if this another condition is correct, we are doing this. If this another condition is not correct we are doing this one which is in yellow if this condition is not correct as always we are continuing to do else condition which is in red over here so we are doing the task which is in red over here now as i said in order to this nested if condition to be executed the first if condition must be true now let's say we have a condition like this in which we are checking if x is equal to y or not so if it is equal to y we are printing out x and y are equal. If they are not equal, we are printing out they are not equal. Now let's say if we have another condition, we, we need to check that if x is greater than y or not. So in this case, we need nested if condition. So we are going to write nested if condition inside else statement over here. So if they are not equal, we are going to check another if condition if x greater than y or not. So in this case, we can write our nested if condition like this. So here, as you can see, if they are not equal, our if condition will continue to the else statement. So in the else statement, we are going to check that if x greater than y, in this case, we are printing out saying that x greater than y, else we are going to print out saying that x is not greater than y. Because in this case, they are not equal and x is not greater than y. So in this case, this means that x is less than y over here. So here, although the indentation of these statements makes the structure apparent, so as you can see, the first if else statements indentation is in the same level and the nested if else conditions are located in the same indentation over here. So here, indentation makes the structure apparent, but nested conditionals become difficult to read very quickly. If you have many nested conditions inside each other, in this case, it's going to be very difficult to read them. So in general, it's a good idea to avoid them when you can. Now in our upcoming lectures, when we learn logical operators, you will see that they often provide a way to simplify nested conditionals over here. Now let's look at the flowchart of these nested conditionals over here. Now in this case, the flowchart will look like this. So we are starting from here. First, we are checking that if x is equal to y or not. So if they are equal, we are heading over here and printing out equal. If they are not equal, we are continuing to over here. So as you can see, in the no case, we have another flowchart over here in which we are checking that if x is greater than y or not. So if it is greater than y, we are printing out it's greater. If it is not greater than y, we are continuing to do no arrow. So in this case, we are printing out saying that this is less. So as you can see, before we had a print statement over here, but instead of print statement now in the no arrow, we have another if condition over here which represents nested if. Now let's look at this one in our previous example that we have explained if else condition. So there we have implemented mortgage calculator based on the person's salary. So as you can see over here, we are checking that if the salary is greater than 2000, in this case, this person is eligible for mortgage. If it is not greater than 2000, in this case, he's not eligible for mortgage. Now, in addition to the salary, let's say we need to check their credit score and based on the credit score we can identify interest rate so if somebody's credit score is greater than 800 the interest rate will be 4 but if their credit score is less and equal than 800 the interest rate in this case will be 6 percent now we need to represent this extra if condition inside this calculator over here now to represent this we need another extra if condition over here so we are going to use nested if and else statement. So if we implement nested if and else statement for this flowchart over here, our flowchart will be like this. So in this case, you see that in the first condition, we are checking that if the salary is greater than 
2000 per month so if it is not greater than 2000 in this case we he's not eligible for mortgage so this means that we are not going to continue to the nested if else statement but if the salary is greater than 2000 in this case we are going to check another condition for identifying the interest rate so as you can see here we can print out saying that you can get mortgage then based on the credit score we are going to identify the interest rate so as you can see after eligibility we are checking that if the credit score is greater than 800 in this case we are printing out saying that the interest rate will be four percent and if the credit score is not greater than 800 in this case we are printing out saying that interest rate will be six percent so as you can see we can implement credit score over here by using extra nested if else statement over here now let's implement this in practice now in the previous lecture we have created our mortgage calculator like this so first is printing out greeting message then is asking for the salary of a person then based on this salary it's printing out this message over here so if the salary is greater and equal to 2000 in this case it's printing out you are eligible for mortgage otherwise it's printing out you are not eligible so we are going to implement our extra if condition over here inside the eligibility part so if someone is eligible for mortgage in this case we are going to ask for their credit score then based on this credit score we are going to print out their interest rate so here after this print statement if i hit enter you will see that the cursor comes over here which is located at the same level with the print statement so you need to be very careful about this because here the indentation level must be the same with the print statement over here otherwise if you put over here for example in this case we will receive error and it's not going to be included inside this if statement over here. so that's why when you are writing nested if else statement the indentation level is very important over here so it's very advisable to come to the last statement over here and press enter in this case it's going to come to the same level with the previous statement so here the first thing that we are going to do we are going to ask the credit score from a user then we are going to save it to the variable over here so that's why i'm just going to create a new variable which will be credit score and here one more time we are going to use input function and as a prompt i'm going to ask what's your credit score now after getting this value we need to convert it to the integer because the value that we are getting with the input function is a string so that's why i'm going to convert it to integer because our credit score will be integer now after getting this one more time i'm going to hit enter so here you can see that the cursor comes to the same level with the credit score so here we can write our if condition like this so i'm going to write if so one more time i'm going to hit enter to write else statement over here to make sure that they are located in the same level over here so whenever you write if statement the else statement must be the same level over here so i'm just going to go back and write our if condition over here so according to our flowchart we are going to check that if the credit score is greater than 800 in this case we are going to print out saying that interest rate is four percent otherwise we are going to print out saying that it is six percent so it's going to be like this if credit score is greater than 800 so we are going to put column over here and hit enter so when we hit the enter you see that the intendation level comes over here so it's not coming with the same level as we have with, with if keyword over here is coming over here so as we discussed in our previous lecture indentation is very important in if else statements over here so indentation should be over here so if the credit score is greater than 800 we are going to print out saying that interest rate is four percent so it's going to be like this interest rate so it's going to be four percent now otherwise after else statement i'm just going to put colon over here one more time and hit enter so it's going to come over here with the same level that we have written print statement inside this if condition over here so i'm just going to write another print statement over here saying that interest rate is six percent now after doing so we have successfully implemented our credit score in our mortgage calculator over here so as you can see first we are checking that if the salary is greater than the 2000 in this case we are continuing to check for the credit score now let's run our code to see how this is working in practice so if i hit run you'll see that first it says that welcome to our mortgage calculator then it's asking our salary for example if i write 2500 and hit enter you will see that 
execution goes inside this if statement over here so as you can see it's printing out you are eligible for mortgage so after doing so it's continuing to do its line of code so in this line of code it's asking our credit score over here so it stops over here because we have input function over here so we have to input something so if i hit for example as a credit score 600 and hit enter you will see that it's printing out saying that the interest rate is six person so as you can see it's checking that if the credit score is greater than 800 so as you can see i have inserted 600 so this means that the execution part will go over here and it's printing out interest rate is six person so that's how we can implement nested if else condition inside mortgage calculator over here now with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture we have discussed nested if else statement and here you need to take into account that indentation level is very important over here so the first if else statements located in the same indentation level then the second if else statements located inside this if statement with the same indentation level over here now with this we have come to the end of this lecture so hopefully everything is clear about nested if else statement so see you in the next lecture now in this lecture we are going to learn about chain conditional now what is chain conditional sometimes there are more than two possibilities and we need more than two branches over here so as you remember when we are talking about simple conditionals over here we said that we have only two conditions over here so one condition is if the condition is met we are doing this which is in green if it is not met we are doing this which is in red now as i mentioned there might be some situations we need more than two possibilities over here so in this case we are going to express a computation like this with a chain conditional so here we use chain conditional with elif statement which is an abbreviation of else if condition instead of having simple if else statement where there is only one condition if this is true we need to do this otherwise we need to do this here we are going to have more than one condition so you can add as many elif conditions as you want so with chain conditional our conditions will be like this so here first we can check for condition one then we are going to do a so if the condition one is not met in this case we are going to continue to check the condition two so in this case if the condition two is met we are going to do b otherwise we are going to do else statement over here so as i mentioned we can add as many elif conditions as we want over here but here you need to take into account that if you have else statement you have to put this else statement at the end you can skip else statement over here or you can add else statement at the end over here and else statement means that if none of these conditions were true we can do this final thing over here now if you look at the example that we implemented using nested if statements before our example was like this first we were checking if x is equal to y then in this case we are printing out this message x and y are equal otherwise we were writing a nested if condition over here and checking that if it is greater than y or not now in this case we can implement this if condition without using nested if condition with chain conditional now if we implement chain conditional over here our if statement will be like this so first we are checking that if x is greater than y in this case we are printing out x is greater than y then we are writing a if statement like this a if x is less than y in this case we are printing out x is less than y and otherwise if these two conditions are not met this means that they are equal so we are printing out that they are equal and here again exactly one branch will be executed so there is no limit in the number of elif statements so if there is an else clause it has to be at the end but take into account that you can skip this else statement over here as well now let's look at how the flowchart of this chain condition will look like now in this case our flowchart will be like this so as you can see it starts from here first we are checking that if x is greater than y or not so if it is yes we are printing out greater and our arrow goes at the end so it's not continuing to execute these conditions over here now if it is not true it's going to continue to another if statement over here so in this case it's checking that if x is less than y so if it is less than y it's continuing printing out less and the arrow goes at the end otherwise if it is not less than y in this case it's printing out it's equal and the execution finishes over here so as you can see here only one statement will be executed so it's not possible that 
this condition is met and it's continuing to do this condition. So if this met, it's continuing to the end of this execution flow over here. So here, the important moment is, it doesn't matter how many elif statements you are going to write, in this case, only one of them will be executed. And each condition will be checked in order. If the first one is false, the next one will be checked. And then if the next one is false, and it's con it will continue to the next one. And if one of them is true, the corresponding branch executes and statements ends over here. If more than one condition is true, only the first branch will be executed. Now let's see how this is working in practice. So if we go back to our mortgage calculator that we created before, so as you remember, we have added credit score as a nested if else statement over here. Now let's say when we check the calculation of interest rate, we see that actually there is one more condition we need to take into account. So here our condition will be like this. If the credit score is greater than 800, interest rate will be 4. If the credit score is greater than 750 and less equal to 800, which means that it is between 705 and 80, in this case the interest rate will be 6. And if it is less than 750, in this case it's going to be 8. So we have to implement this logic over here. Before we were checking just if this is greater than 800 or not, but in this case we have three conditions over here. So if we implement these conditions to our flowchart, the flowchart will be like this. So as you can see, here also, the first thing that we are doing, we are checking that if the salary is greater than 2000 or not. So if it is not, we are stopping over here. So execution of this flow stops over here. If it is greater than 2000, in this case, we are printing out saying that we are eligible for mortgage and we are continuing to the chain conditions over here. So here we are checking that if the credit score is greater than 800, if it is yes, we are printing out the interest rate is 4. Otherwise, if it is not greater than 800, we are continuing to check if it is greater than 750. So if it is greater than 750, in this case, we are printing out interest rate is 6 and otherwise the interest rate will be 8. So this means that it is less than 750 over here. So as you can see, for example, if we take 900 as a credit score, you can see that these both two conditions are met. So it is greater than 750 and it's greater than 800. So as we mentioned, the first condition that is met will be executed first. So in this case, this condition will be executed and it will end over here. So it will not continue to check these conditions over here. Now, based on this flowchart, let's head over to Python and implement our logic in practice. So before we have created our mortgage calculator like this. So we have implemented credit score using nested if else condition over here. Now we are going to implement chained if else condition for this credit score over here. So the first part will remain same. So first we are asking for the salary. Then based on salary, we are checking that if the salary is greater than 2000. In this case, we are continuing to ask for credit score and write the conditions based on credit score. So as we said, if the credit score is greater than 800, in this case, we are going to print out interest rate for person. Then we have added another condition over here. So another condition is like this. So in this case, we are going to check if the credit score is greater than 750. So you need to take into account that when you are writing a LIF statement, you have to write it in the same level with if else statement over here. So a LIF statement will be like this. So as you can see, we are writing a LIF statement at the same indentation level with if and else statement over here. So a LIF credit score is greater than 750. So we, are, we need to put here also a column. So after the LIF statement, we are going to put column over here. Then we are going to hit enter. So as you can see, when I hit enter, the cursor is come to the same level with the print statement that we have inside this if condition over here. So I'm just going to copy this print statement from here and pass it over here. And we are going to change the interest rate to six over here. So if the credit score is greater than 750 and less than 800, in this case, the interest rate is six. And otherwise, if it is less than 750, in this case, interest rate will be eight. So with this, we have successfully implemented our chain conditions over here. So as you can see, by using a list statement over here, we have added one more condition to the credit score over here. Now let's run our code to see how this is working. So if I hit run, you'll see that first is greeting, 
welcome to our mortgage calculator then it's asking for our salary so which means that it's coming to over here so for example if i enter 2400 and hit enter so you'll see that it says that you are eligible for mortgage so this means that it's going to ask the credit score so it's asking credit score so in this case for example if i enter 760 and hit enter you'll see that in this case it says that the interest rate is six so it's calculating only a lift statement and execution ends over here now if i run our code one more time and enter as a salary 2500 and hit enter and as a credit score for example if i enter 600 and hit enter in this case you see that it's printing out saying that the interest rate is eight so as you can see only one statement from this chain condition is executed so it's not executing all of them first it's checking the first one in this case it's not met it's continuing to the next one so in this case it's also not met and then it's continuing to the last one and printing out this message to the console over here now with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture we have discussed chain conditional by using a list statement over here so hopefully everything is clear about chain conditionals over here so see you in the next lecture now in the last lesson we saw how we could use if elif statements for multiple conditions but here you need to be very careful that even though we have multiple conditions we are only checking one condition because if this first condition is true then we are going to do a and we are going to bypass everything over here if it is not true we are going to continue to the second condition and we are going to check that if the second condition is true, we are going to do B and we are going to bypass else over here. And in this case, if condition one is not true and condition two is not true, here we are going to continue to the else condition. So we are going to do else condition over here. Now the problem is, what if you were in a situation where you need to check for multiple conditions, even the previous one was already true. So you, we might have a condition that if this first condition is true, we want to check the second condition as well. So in this case, we are going to use multiple if conditions. Now, if we go back to our mortgage calculator example, so in this case, we are checking for the salary of a person and we are checking their credit score. Now, if we have another condition over here, which checks about disability of a person. So if any person has a disability, in this case, there is a 2% discount in the mortgage interest rate. So we are going to check that if anyone has a disability in this case we are going to minus two percent from these interest rates over here now this is quite interesting because this is completely independent of their salary and credit score even if we have already gotten their salary and credit score and determine their interest rate we need to ask extra question so we need to ask whether they have a disability or not so the answer should be yes or no if they do have disability we will decrease two percent from this interest rate if they don't have any disability we are not going to touch this interest rate over here now to do this we will write multiple if conditions so if condition one is true we are going to do a and we are going to continue to check the condition two and if the condition two is true so we are going to continue to check condition three over here this is completely different from the chained conditions over here in the chain conditionals that we have on the left over here only one of these abc will be carried out in this example we use if elif and else statement only one of these things will be happen so if the condition one is true we are going to do a and we are going to bypass b and do this over here so in this case only one of these tasks will be implemented but in this case that we have on the right for multiple if we are going to do all tasks if all conditions are met over here so in this case we are checking all conditions one by one so if they are true we are doing the task that is related to this condition over here now if you look at our flowchart of mortgage calculator the first one was like this so first we are checking the salary if the salary is greater than 2000 in this case we are printing out message saying that they are eligible for mortgage then we are asking for their credit score so if the credit score is greater than 800 in this case interest rate is 4 if it is between 750 and 800 in this case the interest rate is 6 if it is less than 750 in this case the interest rate is 8 what we want now is even after checking for their credit score we need to ask them a question do they have any disability so if we implement this over here 
our flowchart will be like this. So after checking their credit score and identifying the interest rate, we are asking that if they have any disability or not. So if they say yes, we are going to decrease rate by two. If they don't have any disability, we are just going to continue and print on out saying that the interest rate is like this. So this is how our flowchart will look like. So after checking everything, we are going to ask extra question for their disability. Now, how can we implement this in our code? So as I mentioned, we are going to implement it using multiple ifs over here. Now let's head over to our mortgage calculator and implement this part of flowchart into our mortgage calculator. Okay, our mortgage calculator was like this. So in previous lectures, we have implemented nested if conditions and change if conditions over here. Now after getting the interest rate based on the credit score, we are going to ask extra question over here for identifying if they have any disability or not. Now, before implementing this over here, we need to save interest rate in some variable to be able to decrease it by two at the end over here. So in this case, as you can see, whenever we are checking the credit score, we are just printing out interest rate to the console. So we have not saved it over here. So that's why what I'm going to do over here is, first I'm going to create a new variable in which we are going to have the rate. So initially the rate is zero because we have not identified that if a person is eligible for mortgage and we don't know their credit score. So in this case, what I'm going to do, based on their credit score, we are going to save the interest rate to this rate over here. So as you can see over here, we are checking that if the credit score is greater than 800, we say that the interest rate is four. So before printing out this message to a console, I'm going to set rate is equal to four. So this will be applicable for all these conditions over here. So take into account that this rate is located at the same indentation level with this prim statement over here. So I'm just going to do the same operation for a lift condition. So here we are going to set rate is equal to six because if the credit score is between 750 and 800, the rate is six. So here again, this expression should be on the same indentation level with this print statement over here because this will be implemented only this if a if condition is met. So then at the end in the else statement, we are going to put rate is equal to eight because if the credit score is less than 750, in this case, the rate is eight. Now, after calculating the rate based on the credit score, we are going to ask extra question over here. So we are going to ask question over here by using input function, and we are going to save that answer in a new variable. So I'm going to create disability variable over here. So here again, we are going to put this expression inside this if condition over here. So inside this if condition, we have print statement, then we are getting credit score, then we have this block of if conditions over here. Then after doing so, we have to put it with the same indentation level over here. So if we put this one over here with the same indentation level of this if, in this case, you have error, indentation error over here. So it has to be on the same level with if condition over here. Then we are going to put input function like this. And as a prompt, we are going to put, do you have any disability? So the answer should be yes or no. So I'm just going to put Y or N. So the user has to put Y or N over here. Then based on this disability, we are going to identify if they have any disability, we are going to provide discount. If they don't have, we are just going to print out the final interest rate over here. Here, as I mentioned, we are going to use multiple if conditions. So multiple if condition will be like this. If disability is equal to yes, in this case, we are going to put rate is equal to rate minus two. So we are decreasing rate by two over here. Now in Python, as well as in many other languages, there's actually a slightly shorter way of writing this. So when you want to decrease the current value that is held in a variable, and you want to save it back to the same variable over here, you can simply use minus and equal sign over here. So instead of writing this long expression over here, if I write something like this, minus and equal, it's going to be same as the expression that we write over. Here. So it's decreasing this rate by two and saving it to this rate variable over here. Now, no matter what the value of interest rate is before, when it reached this if statement over here, I'm still going to minus two from it over here. Now, after this if statement is completed, I do not actually have to write a companion else statement because in this case, if the answer is no, we are not going to do anything over here. So we are not going to decrease the 
right over here and instead we are just going to skip ahead and print the final interest rate to the console so that's why we are not going to write any else statement over here so we are just going to print out final interest rate to the console so take into account that when you write the final print statement over here it has to be on the same indentation level with these if conditions over here so it's going to be like this print so i'm just going to put final so here i'm going to use f string so i'm just going to put final interest rate rate so i'm going to put it inside curly braces over here so we are going to put the rate that we calculated over here now with this we have successfully implemented the extra condition that we have which checks for disability now if we run our code you'll see that the first thing that it does is asking us about our salary so if i put for example 2600 and hit enter it says that you are eligible for mortgage so it's asking our credit score for example if my credit score is 600 and after inserting it if i hit enter it says that the interest rate is eight person so which means that this part of code is executed then it comes to this part of code so it is asking if i have any disability or not so for example if i put yes over here and hit enter you will see that the interest rate is decreased by two and the final interest rate is six so as you can see with this multiple if condition over here we have successfully implemented extra condition that we have for disability over here now for your core to work, the indentation matters a huge deal because the computer will think what you want it to do different things depending on the indentation level. Because if you mistype any indentation level over here, the result will be completely different. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have learned about multiple if condition and we have implemented in real life project over here. So hopefully everything is clear about multiple if condition. Now in this lecture we are going to talk about logical operators now up to this point you have seen us use of if statements elif statements multiple if statements and even nested if statements but the thing that we have not been able to do so far is to check for multiple condition in the same line as it's shown over here so if we have three different conditions and if we want to put all of them in the same line over here we need to use logical operator so let's say in our burger order example, the user wants large burger and they ordered extra cheese and mushroom. So how can we put all of these conditions in the same line of code over here? So in this case, for putting this one in the same line of code, we are going to use logical operators. So there are three main logical operators that are really useful. And, or, and not. The meaning of these operators are similar to their meaning in English. So let's look at them one by one to make things more clear. So the first one is an operator. So when you combine two different conditions using an an operator, both of them have to be true for entire line to be the true. So if A is true and B is true, so in this case we are using an operator, so the output will be true over here. Now in this case, if any of these cases is false, in this case, for example, let's say B is false, here the output will be false so same rule is applicable for a over here so if a is false and b is true in this case it's going to return false so if both of them are false so it's obvious that it's going to return false over here so let's look at how an and operator works in practice in this case if i create a variable called a and assign a number to it so let's say we are assigning 11 to it and hit enter so if i check if a is greater than 10 in this case, you can see that it's returning true. So if I put, for example, A is less than 10, in this case, you will see that it's returning false because A is greater than 10 over here. Now, if I want to check two different conditions in one same line over here, I'm just going to use AND operator. So here, if I put A is greater than nine and A is less than, for example, let's say 12 and hit enter, you will see that in this case, it is returning true because both these conditions are true over here. So A is 11, which is greater than 9, and A is 11, which is less than 12. So that's why both conditions are true, so the output will be true. So for example, if I put A is greater than 12 and A is less than 14. So we know that A is less than 14, but A is not greater than 12 because A is 11. So if I hit enter, you see that in this case, it's returning false because one of these conditions 
over here is false so that's why in an operator it's returning false over here so that's what happens when you combine different conditions using and operator over here now if you only needed one of these conditions to be true in this case we are going to use or operator instead of and operator so in case of or operator if a is true and b is false in this case it's going to return true so if a is false and b is true in this case also it's going to return true so if any of these cases over here is true the output will be true over here so it's obvious that if both cases are true it's going to return true if both cases are false it's going to return false over here so in case of or operator it's returning only false when we have both cases are false over here now if we come back to the console over here one more time so in this case if i put the same line of code with or operator for example if i put a is greater than 12 or a is less than 14 and hit enter you see that in this case it's returning true because here one condition is true which is a is less than 14 so that's why it's returning true over here so it doesn't matter if one of condition is false or not if any of them is true in this case it's going to return true now the final operator is not operator all that this does is it just basically reverses the condition so if this condition is false in this case it's going to reverse it to become it to true so in this case if a is true in this case the output will be false because not operator reverses any condition over here so here for example if i write not a is greater than 12 hit enter you see that it's returning true because a is not greater than 12 over here so this condition is false so with you by using not operator over here it's going to return true over here so for example if i put not a is less than 12 in this case it's going to return false because a is less than 12 is true so it's reversing this one to the false over here now how can we use this one in practice now if you come back to our mortgage calculator let's say government decided that if the credit score is between 900 and 1000 then the interest rate becomes 3 over here so we need to add this extra condition to our mortgage calculator so how can we do that to check that if the score is between 900 and 1000 so for these cases we are going to use and operator so let's head over to our mortgage calculator and implement this condition in practice so this is our mortgage calculator that we have implemented before so here first we are checking the salary then we are checking the credit score and based on credit score we are calculating the rate so our condition is like this if the credit score is between 900 and 1000 in this case the interest rate will be 3 so to implement this condition i'm just going to put it over here inside this nested chain condition over here so here i'm just going to put enter so i'm going to write if condition like this if credit score is greater and equal to 900 and we are going to use and operator over here credit score is less and equal to 1000 in this case the rate will be 3 so here we need to add this if condition inside this if statement over here so that's why i'm just going to change it to elif statement because in this case we want only one case to be executed so if this is the case it's going to execute only this part if this is the case it's going to execute only this part and it continues like this then after calculating the rate we can print out saying that the interest rate is three so we can put another print statement over here with the same indentation level with this rate over here and put three over here now with this we have successfully implemented the case in which we are checking that if the credit score is between 900 and 1000 over here so we are doing it by using an operator and we are writing these two conditions in one line over here and the reason that i've joined it with a list statement over here is i want only one condition to be executed over here now if i run our program so the first thing that it does is going to ask our salary for example if i enter 2600 and hit enter you'll see that it says that you are eligible for mortgage and what's your credit score for example if i say my credit score is 950 and hit enter you'll see that it says that the interest rate is three so it's calculating only this part and it's continuing to the this part over here in which it's asking for our disability so if i put yes over here and hit enter the interest rate will be one because here according to our credit score the interest rate is three and minus two because of the disability will be one over here now with this 
we have successfully implemented this condition in our mortgage calculator over here. Now with this we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture we have learned about logical operators in Python. So hopefully everything is clear about three main logical operators. So see you in the next lecture. Till now we have implemented various conditional statements in practice by developing this mortgage calculator over here. Do you ever wonder what will happen if we run this program and instead of an integer number, if we put by mistake a string for a seller equation over here. So what will happen in this case? So if I run our code, so instead of integer number, if I put, for example, any letter, T letter over here and hit enter, you'll see that in this case, I get a trace back and I get an error, which is value error, which makes sense because we are trying to get T from the console and convert it to integer number, which is not possible because T is a string and it cannot be converted to integer. So this situation is not desirable. And if this happens somewhere out within our actual program, in this case, as soon as the error happens, it does not actually continue to the next lines. So the lines that are after this input function over here will be ignored. So they are not going to be carried out because the error occurred before these lines over here. So in our case, as you can see, our program stuck over here. So it asks, what's your salary over here? Then after this one, these lines that comes from this input function are ignored. So they're not being carried out over here. So our program stuck over here. So how can we deal with the errors in our program? So this is a good point to start thinking about the errors because in the future, we will come across a lot of errors. In the first section of this course, we have talked about different types of errors. But these types that we have learned are general types of errors. But in reality, we can face lots of errors that we are going to learn during this course. So to deal with errors in Python, we use try and catch conditional statements. What we do over here is we catch these errors. So this is a conditional execution structure built in Python to handle these types of expected and unexpected errors called try and accept. The idea of try and accept is that you know that some sequence of instruction may have a problem and you want to add statements to be executed if any error occurs. These extra statements are ignored if there is not any error. The extra statements that we are going to write in the accept block are ignored if there is no any error. So in generally, you can think of try and accept feature in Python as an insurance policy on seconds of statements. So it's ensuring that our program is not going to start. It's going to do something if you face any problem. So when something goes wrong, in that moment, we catch that exception. It does not have to fail catastrophically. We can actually fail more gracefully and we can decide to do something else when the error occurs. Here is what the code looks like when we are dealing with these exceptions over here. So we have a try, except else, and finally, finally keyword over here. There are four keywords that are really important when it comes to handle the errors. Now let's get started with the first keyword. Now the first keyword is try keyword. So it comes for a block of code where you are executing something that might cause an error. So basically you are trying to execute a piece of line. In most cases, it probably work, but sometimes it might not work. So for example, in the case of mortgage calculator, we are executing the input function. In most cases, we are going to get the integer number, but by mistake, if someone enters string, then in this case, we are going to get an error. So this means that this part of code in most cases will probably work. Then the next step is to define accept block. So this is the block of code you want the computer to execute if there is an exception. So if something goes wrong, then we are going to carry out this piece of code over here. So in case of mortgage calculator, if someone enters string, instead of the integer for the salary, in this case, we are going to execute this part saying that, for example, please enter integer number, or we can say that there was an error in our code over here. Now then we are going to continue to the else keyword. So this allows us to find some code to execute if there were no exception. So if you try this thing that we have over here, which might fail, but actually it did not fail, you succeeded and there were no any problems, well, in this case, you are going to do whatever inside this else block over here. So in case of mortgage calculator, for example, if you develop proper mortgage 
o'clock later. In this case, in the else block, after doing everything, you can send an email to the user about their final result of Morgos calculator. And finally, we have a finally keyword over here, which basically just a block of code to carry out no matter what happens. So it does not matter if this thing you tried failed or succeed. It does not really actually care. So this part of code will execute anywhere. So this basically used in the softwares when you are just clearing the cache and deleting the everything at the end. So in our case, in case of mortgage calculator, we can just printing out saying that thanks for using our calculator over here. Now let's see how can we use try and accept block in practice. So we are going to use it in the mortgage calculator to make our calculator a lot safer. So this is our mortgage calculator. So as you mentioned, so if we put as a salary string number over here, it's going to cause an error. Now we know that this is the line of the code that causes error. So after this line of code, the other lines will not be executed. So what I'm going to do over here is I'm just going to copy this line of code from here and, and pass it in different files separately to make things more clear. Then we are going to come back and implement try and accept block for this mortgage calculator over here. Now here I have passed this line of code over here. So if I run it and put as a string over here, for example, R and hit enter, you'll see that here we are getting an error. So I'm just going to include this part of code inside try and accept block. So what I'm going to do over here is first I'm going to write try keyword. Then after try keyword, we need to put colon over here. Now after putting colon, if I hit enter, you'll see that the cursor comes to the indentation level. So this means that this line of code should be located at this indented level over here. So I'm just going to put it over here as indented over here. Then after doing so, we need to provide accept block. Now take into account that you can skip else and finally keywords, but you cannot skip accept keyword when you write try over here. Because in this case, if I run our code, you will see that it says that we have a syntax error over here. So this means that we have to write accept block also when we are writing try. So in this case, it's going to be the same level with, with the line of code that we have inside try block. So that's why I'm just going to put at the same indentation level, print statement like this, there was an error. Now, in this case, if I run our code, you'll see that it's asking our salary. So if I put, for example, for salary 20 and hit enter, you will see that nothing happens because this is executed successfully. But instead of 20, if I put some characters over here, for example, A and hit enter, you'll see that in this case, it's coming over here saying that there was an error. So this means that whenever we have an error for this line of code over here is going to skip this one and it's going to continue to the accept block over here. So that's how try and accept block work in case of Python. Now we have talked about else and finally statement. So after accept block, we can put else statement like this. So this means that whenever this part of code is executed successfully, we can use it inside else statement over here. So as you remember, we were checking for the eligibility of a person for mortgage. So we can write it over here like this. If salary is greater than 2000, in this case, we were printing, you are eligible. Otherwise, we were saying that you are not eligible. So in the else statement, I'm just going to put quickly, you are not eligible. So as you can see, whenever we are writing this if condition over here, we are writing as a nested if condition after else statement over here. So after else, the first if condition over here will be the, at the same indentation level that we have the code inside, except and try block over here. Then it's obvious that after if condition, these print statements will be indented inside this if else statement over here. Now, if I run our code one more time, if I enter character and hit enter, you will see that it says that there was an error. Otherwise, if I enter integer number, you will see that in this case, it says that you are not eligible because I have entered 20 over here. So this part of code was successfully executed. Then it continues to the else block over here. So inside this else block over here, it is checking that if the salary is greater than 2000, it says that you are eligible. Otherwise, it will say that you are not eligible over here. So as you can see, with this, we have successfully implemented else block of try and accept statements over here. Now at the end, we are going to implement final block. So finally, keyword also will be located at the same indentation level with try, accept, and else statement. So we are going to put finally with the colon. Then at the end, we are going to print out saying that thanks for using our calculator.
So as we mentioned before, this part of code will be executed no matter what happens over here. So if this part of code is failed or not, finally statement will be executed. So if I run our code, and for example, as a salary, if I enter 3000, you'll see that it says that you are eligible and at the end it's printing out thanks for using our calculator. So instead of, for example, integer number, if I put character over here, hit enter, you'll see that it says that there was an error and thanks for using our calculator. So as you can see, this part of code is executed no matter what happens in our case. So if you go back to our mortgage calculator, so we can execute our code over here like this. So first it's printing out welcome to our mortgage calculator. So in this case, we are not going to have any problem. Then we are going to put try block like this. So if I hit enter, it's going to be located at the indented level. So I'm just going to put it like this. So then we are going to put accept block over here. So after getting the salary, I'm going to put accept block. So here I'm going just going to print for exactly for this error. So we are going to put enter an integer number. Then after doing so, we need to ask our program to do something. So what can I do over here is we can ask from a user one more time for their salary by saying that you have to enter an integer number. So if I just copy this part of code over here and pass it over here one more time, you will see that in this case, it's going to ask from a user their salary one more time if they enter some string character over here. Now in the future, we are going to learn that we can write our accept block for a specific errors. Now this is advanced topic, so we are going to cover it in our upcoming lectures. Now here, you just need to take into account that we are using accept block for any error over here. Then after getting the salary, we can put rest of these codes that we have written over here inside else block. So this means that if this part of code is successfully executed, in this case, we are going to continue to the else block. Now, in the future, you are going to include all these part of codes inside this try and accept block. But for explanation of the try accept and else blocks, I'm just going to put it inside else. So after else, we are going to put colon. So I'm just going to select all this code from here and put all of them as indented level. So if I click tab button, so it's going to indent it all this line of code inside this else statement over here. Now at the end, we can put finally keyword and saying that thanks for using our calculator. So with this, we have successfully implemented try and accept block for this mortgage calculator over here. Now, if I hit enter, now in this case, as you can see, first it's greeting us, then it's asking for our salary, which is located inside try block over here. So if I enter 3000, you'll see that it's continuing to the this part of code over here saying that you are eligible for mortgage, then it's asking for our credit score. So this part of code is successfully executed. That's why it continued to the else part of code over here. As a credit score, if I put 800 and hit enter, it's going to ask our disability. So in this case, I'm just going to put no and hit enter. You see that it's saying that the final interest rate, which is coming from here, is 6%. Then at the end, it's executing the final part of try and accept block over here. So which is thanks for using our calculator. Now, if I run our code one more time, and instead of entering integer number over here, if I enter any character, you'll see that it's saying that enter integer number. So it's executing this part of code and it's asking for our salary over here. So for example, if I insert 3000, you see that without going to else statement over here, it's continuing to the final statement because else part of this code will be executed if we have not any error over here. So in this case, we have error over here, but it continued over here and asking our salary and without continuing this part of code, it's continuing to the final statement over here. Now it's possible to create this part of code as a separate function and then put it over here when we have even error and if we corrected it, it can execute this part of code. But this is not the scope of this lecture. Now in our upcoming lectures, when you have reached the intermediate level of this course, you can handle such cases in which you have exception and you are correcting the part, this part of code and you can continue to this part of code over here as well. So with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have explained try and accept block in Python. So hopefully everything is clear about try and accept block. So see you in the next lecture.
Hello everyone and welcome to the new section of Python for Everyone course. So the section is called functions. So in this section we are going to talk about built-in function which includes type and mass functions. Then we are going to continue to define what's a model and we will talk about mass model. Then we will continue with the randomization and indentation in Python. Then we will create function with input which includes parameter and arguments. Then we are going to discuss what is the difference between positional and keyword arguments. Then we will continue with the functions with outputs and multiple returns. Then we are going to use the doc strings in functions. Then we are going to compare print and return statement. While we are doing all this, we are going to do lots of exercise to practice what we have learned. So after finishing this section, we will implement what we have learned in real life projects like leap year project with the function. So as you remember, we have created leap year project before. So here we are going to implement the same project by using functions. Then we will continue with the second project, which is going to be cross pay. So here again, we have implemented cross pay without functions. So we are going to use functions to implement the cross pay. You will see that by this way, you are going to become more professional developer because when you are doing some projects you don't need to write the code standalone you have to implement the functions and then reuse the codes by using the functions then the next project will be cold warm and hot so here we are going to define a function which takes a temperature as a parameter then it's going to return hot if the temperature is greater than 28 then it's going to return warm if temperature is between 18 and 28. Then it's going to return cold if the temperature is below 18. So as you can see as an input, if you put 18 over here, it is returning warm. Then the last project that we are going to implement the things that we have learned is going to be maximum of three numbers. So we are going to define a function which is going to take three integer number as a parameter. Then it's going to return the maximum of these integer numbers. So head over to next lesson to learn the things that we are going to implement in this real life project. So see you in the next lesson. All right, now in this section, we are going to talk about something called functions. As we perform various functions during our daily lives, such as mother, father, son, daughter, or manager or employee, we can also get our code to perform different piece of functionality. In the context of programming, a function is a piece of code written to carry out specific tasks. When you define a function, you specify the name and the sequence of statements over here. Then later on, you can call that function by their name. So here, we can define our function with the function name. Then later on, if we need this function in our program, we can use function name to call this function over here. So functions are a really handy way of taking complex set of instructions and packaging them together inside a block of code that has a given name to it. In Python, there are three types of functions. The first one is built-in functions. The second one is user-defined functions. And the third one is anonymous functions, which is called also Lambda functions. Now, if we think back, we actually come across built-in functions and we have been referring them in our previous lectures and projects when we needed to use one. Now, Python provides a number of important built-in functions that we can use without needing to provide the function definition. So in our previous lectures, we have used input function, which is built-in function. So we are using input function to get a value from a console to our program. Then we have used print function to print a statement. Then we used len function, which is calculate the length of any given string. Then we have used count function, and then we have used lower function in our previous projects and lectures. So the creators of Python wrote a set of functions to solve common problems and included them in Python for us to use them. Now, if you search on the internet for Python built-in functions, the first link will take you to Python documentation where you can see a bunch of built-in functions that we have been using. So here, in this list, you can see all built-in functions in Python over here. So till now we have used, for example, input functions. So if I click on it, it has a definition over here. And as a sample, they showed over here, how can we use it? And another function that we have used in our previous lecture is that length function. So as you can see, it says that return the length of any given object over here. So by using length function, we can find the length of any given object. So by clicking any of these functions, you can read about the definition of them and you can see examples how they used in the practice. Now, if we head over to replet.com and then we start typing one of the functions that we have learned, which is, for example, type function. 
and after that we are going to put two parentheses over here and the reason we know that this is function because the name of function is followed by the set of parentheses over here now we know that if you put something inside this parentheses let's say if you put 33 over here then if i run our code whatever the type of this value inside this parentheses will get out over here in the console so as you can see in this case we don't have anything because we need to print out the value that comes from this main py file but if I put it straight over over here in the console and hit enter, you will see that in this case, it's printing out the type of 33 over here, which is integer. So we are using this type function to identify the type of 33, which is built-in function. So this function is developed by creators of Python for us to make our life easier without writing the custom type function by ourselves. Now, another function can be, for example, len function. So as you remember, we have learned len function. So if I put, for example, inside this len function, my name, which is Ershad, and hit enter, you will see that in this case it's returning six because there are six characters in my name over here. So this len function also is another built-in function that's provided by Python. So there are many built-in functions in the Python, so you can find the list of built-in functions in the resource section of this lecture, as I showed you in the documentation. For, so for example, another built-in function can be maximum and minimum function so which gives us the largest and smallest values in a given specific list so for example if i use maximum function for string over here let's say i'm going to put hello and hit enter you'll see that in this case it's returning o because if you order this string alphabetically o will be the last character according to alphabetical order now if i use the same function for example for minimum you see that in this case it's returning h because first we are counting the upper cases then we are continuing to count lower cases now instead of uppercase h over here if i put any everything in lowercase in this case you are going to see that it's returning e not h because we have put it in lower, all of them in lower cases so in this case e comes before h in alphabet alphabetical order that's why it's returning e over here now these functions are not limited to looking at the strings they can operate on any set of values so we will see them in our upcoming lectures so as an example we can check another built-in functions over here so as you remember in our previous lectures we have learned about type conversion functions so we know that we can convert one data type to another data type so for this we are using conversion functions so these are also built-in functions in python that converts values from one data type to another one so for example in function convert any given data type to the integer so for example in this case if i put 33.3 and hit enter you will see that in this case it's returning 33 so it's converting this floating number to integer now if i put for example float 33 in this case it's going to convert this integer number to float number now here an important moment is we have to follow the rules of the built-in functions over here because if I try to convert string to integer by using integer function, for example, if I put hello over here and hit enter, you'll see that in this case, we are getting value error. So we have discussed this one also in our previous lecture. So here I'm just showing you that these conversion functions also are built-in functions that we have learned and we have used till now. So when we are using these functions, we have to read the documentation very carefully to avoid such errors over here. Now with this, we have come to the end of these lectures. So in this lecture, we have identified what is function and we have learned that there are three types of functions and we have covered the basic built-in functions in Python. Now in our upcoming lectures, we are going to learn about other types of different functions and we are going to create our own functions. So see you in the next lectures. All right, now in this lecture, we are going to talk about randomization in Python because it's really, really important when we create computer programs that have a degree of unpredictability. Now, the biggest category of these is games. So can you imagine if you had to play Tetris and every single time the block that fell down was predictable? So you always knew that it's going to be a T and it's going to be an L. So it's obvious that there will not be no fun in that game. So the games like Tetris use randomness to select falling down objects. Now in nature, in our daily lives, it's really easy, easy to create randomness. If you splash some points on canvas, that's going to be pretty random. Now we are talking about computers and these machines are what we call them deterministic. 
they will perform repeatable actions in a fully predictable way. So how can we make these machines that operate basically based on ones and zeros to get them to create some random numbers? Well, to get a random number in computer, we need to implement a whole bunch of math to create what is called pseudo-random number generators. And the one that Python use is called Mersenne Twister. Now, if you really want to read about it, you can have a look on Wikipedia and look at under algorithmic detail section. But to be honest, it's a little bit too much information for anyone, unless you are really, really interested in these types of number generators. Now, we have talked about a lot about randomness. Now, let's see it in action. So let's see how can we generate random numbers in Python. Now, it's obvious that we are not going to implement the Mersenne Twister by ourselves because it is horrendously complicated using lots and lots of math and probably it will take us months to write the code that is mentioned in this documentation over here. Now, the question is, how can we get random numbers? Now, as we discussed in our previous lecture, when we were talking about mathematical operations, we mentioned that to use complicated mathematical operations, we import math model and use a question from this math model. Now, here to generate random numbers, the Python team have already created a model which is called random. Now, I highly recommend to read the documentation of any given model before using it because you can find more useful information in the model documentation. Now, if you search on Google for Python random model, the first documentation that comes from Python documentation. Now, if I click on this, you will see that it says that this model implements pseudo random number generators for various disparate distributions. So if I go a little bit down, you will see bookkeeping functions, functions for bytes, function for integers. And even if you go down, you will see some examples that is used over here using random model. So from this documentation, you can see that it contains a whole bunch of functions that you can use for generating integers or random floats. So let's see how can we tap into this model. Now, as we mentioned before, to be able to use any model in our program, we have to import it. So the first thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to import random model. Then we will able to use this random model in our main py file. So according to documentation, for example, if you want to generate random integer number, we have to use random models rand int function. So it says that in documentation that it return a random integer n such that it is located in this range that we provided over here. So in practice, if I write something like this, for example, random integer is equal to, I'm going to use the randint function. So I'm just going to put model name, then randint. So as you can see, we need to provide two parameters over here. So for example, let's say I want to generate random number between 10 and 20. So in this case, when you are using randint function, it includes 10 and 20 as well. Now, then after getting this value, I've assigned this return from randit function to random integer. I'm just going to print out this one to the console. So if I just do it like this and run our code, you will see that in this case, our random number is 18. Now, if I run it one more time, this time the random number will change to 19. So if I run it one more time, it might be the same number or it will change and bring out the number which is between 10 and 20. Now here we have seen how we create random whole numbers. But what if we want to create a random floating number? Now here, as I mentioned before, if I put after model name dot, it's going to bring all functions that I have inside this model over here. For example, in this case, if I select random and come on it, you'll see that it's it says that this is generating the numbers between zero and one, and the return value is float. So in this case, if I run it like this, and I'm, I'm just going to create result variable over here. So I'm just going to delete the integer. So in this case, I'm just going to print out result and run our code. You'll see that in this case, it's generating a number which is located between zero and one. So here, take into account that one is not included. Zero is included, but one is not included. So if I run it one more time, it's generating another number. If I run it one more time, it's generating another number over here. So if you want to generate a number between zero and one, in which one is not included, then we can use random function over here. Basically, this function is the most used function in randomness because by using this function, you can generate numbers between zero and one or zero and five or zero and 10 over here. Now, the question is in the definition of this function, it says that it's generating a number 
between 0 and 5. Now, what if I want to generate a floating number between 0 and 5? Now, how might we do that? Now, it's not complicated as you think it is. You'll be able to do it just looking at this code over here. So have a think about it and see if you can come up with your own answer. Then I will go through it with you afterwards. So pause the video and think, how can we use this function to generate a random number between 0 and 5? So hopefully you have done it by yourself. Now let's do it together. Now we know that this random function generates number between 0 0.00 and 0 0.999999. So how can we make these numbers to be between 0 and 5? Now, if you multiply this random number by a number, let's say we are multiplying it by 5, in this case, it's going to generate between 0 0.00 and if I multiply 9 with 5, it's going to be 0 0.45 and something like this. So in this case, it's never reached 5, but the largest number over here will be 4.9999 and something like this. So let's do it in practice. So what I'm going to do, so I'm just going to take this result equal to result multiply by 5. Now if I run our code, you will see that in this case it's returning 0 0.11101 and if I run it one more time, for example, in this case it's printing out 4.7 and it continues like this. So as you, every time you see that it's, it's generating a floating number between 0 and 5. In this case, you need to take into account that we are generating num floating number. So we are looking for generation of floating number. As I explained before, if we want to generate integer number, in this case, we are going to use randit function. Now the question is, what can we do with these random numbers? And why do we need these random numbers over here? Now, if I just copy and pass the code of the love calculator that we created before, we can see that it's a kind of base on pseudoscience. Now, like in random numbers, we have a certain number of letters that exist in true and love keyword. And based on your names, we are finding the letters over here and saying that if you are compatible or not. So we can easily see that this is a random because we cannot predict the compatibility of two persons based on the letters in their name. So here also randomness plays a role. So if it is random anyways, so why don't we use a random number generator saving our lives all of the trouble that we are counting T's, O's and E's over here? We can just simply use random model over here and generate a number between 1 and 100. And based on this number, we can interpret the score over here. So what I'm going to do in this case, I'm just going to delete this part in which we are counting the letters. Then initially, I'm going to import random model. Then over here, we are going to calculate the last score that we created over here. This is the variable based on Randit function. So it's going to be like this. Left score is equal to random dot rand int. So it's going to generate between 1 and 100. So based on this left score, we are going to print out the message over here like this. Now here you can see that we have saved a lot of time by using random model. Anyway, counting the letters in love and true keywords is also kind of random. So that's why Instead of counting them, we can use just this random function over here. Now, if I run our code one more time, you'll see that first is ask our name. So if I put Jack over here, so for the second name, if I put Jenny and hit enter, you'll see that it says that your score is 90. So it's generated the score based on this randit function over here. Now, if I run it one more time and put same names, you will see that in this case, we have different results because here we are using random function over here. So most of programs, that is based on randomness, use random model to generate a score or to generate the objects in the games. So after completing the love calculator like this, who can tell us that there is a difference between the previous methods? So actual users do not see this code, you're putting their names and generating the message over here. So no one can identify that if it is based on the true and love keyword or it's based on random model. So with this example, you can see how can we use random model in our programs over here. So as I mentioned before, random model is especially used in case of games. So by generating them random numbers, the games are unpredictable. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have discussed random model and we have implemented it in practice over here. So hopefully everything is clear about random model. So see you in the next lecture.
All right. Till now, we have used built-in functions like print function, length function, or input function. And we have used model functions like advanced math functions or random generator. But the question is, if we want to make our own function, how will we do that? If we want to make our own function, the first thing that we are going to do, we are going to start out with a keyword which is called def. So I'm going to write over here def. This is because we are creating or defining a function. So this def keyword comes from the defining word. After the def keyword, we are going to give our function a name. For now, I'm just going to call it my first function. So it's going to be like this, my first function. Now the thing that differentiate a function from variable is the parentheses. So this means that after the name, we need to provide parentheses over here. And after the parentheses, the final thing that we need to put a colon after parentheses. Because this says everything that comes after this line over here will be indented and belongs to this function over here. A function definition specifies the name of a function and the sequence of the statements that execute when function is called. Once we define a function, we can reuse the function over and over throughout our program. Now let's make a really simple function that just says two lines of code. So if I hit enter after the colon, you will see that the cursor comes to the indentation level inside this function. So this means that the code that we have in this indentation level will be included inside the function. So here I'm just going to put two statements inside the function. I'm going to print, hello, I am a function. Then I'm just going to print out saying that bye for now. So whenever we are calling this function, these two lines of code will be executed. Now I have created my very first function and I have placed lines of code that are associated with this function all indented level after the definition over here. Now if I go ahead and run our code, you will see that actually nothing happens over here. The reason is for now we have not executed this function over here. So this means that we can define lots of function ahead of time and they are only executed when we trigger them. So in this case, we have not called our function, we have not triggered our function, so that's why that's why when we run this code, nothing happens over here. So for example, we have seen that there are lots of functions in math model, but whenever we import the math model, not all of them are executed. The ones that we call are only executed. So if we have not called our function, the function will not be executed. So to call our function, all we have to do as we did before for built-in functions, we have to put the name of function, which is in our case, my first function. So take into account that we are not going to put it in the indentation level. It has to be it with the same level with the function definition. So here I'm just going to put my first function and after function, I need to put parentheses as we did when we are calling built-in function. Now in this case, if I run our code, you will see that First is printing out saying that hello, I am a function and by for now. So as you can see, whenever we put the function name and call the function, the code inside function gets executed over here. Now in our case, our function does not require any input. So here, when we are calling our function, you see that we have left the inside parentheses empty because in this case, our function is not required any parameter. But for example, if you look at built-in function, which is print function over here, you see that inside parentheses, we have provided some arguments over here. So this means that this function requires parameter, but in our function, there's no parameter. Actually, we will talk about it in our upcoming lectures, but for now, you just need to know that in this simple function, any parameter is not required. Now, as we mentioned before, we can call our function how many times that we want in our inside program. So in this case, if I just copy this line of code and pass it over here, you will see that our function will be executed two times. So here, the first thing is it's executed over here like this. So first it's executed this function and printing out this message over here. Then second time it's executing the same function and printing out message over here like this. Now, if I just copy this line of code and put inside Tony editor, you will see the order of execution when we are calling the function over here. Now, if I pass the same code inside Tony editor, you will see how the execution takes place when we are calling this function over here. Now, I'm just going to click the debug button. Then we are going to continue to with step into button. 
So whenever we click this, you see that the first thing that it does, it's going to call this my first function over here. So if I click it one more time, it's going to check this function, and then it's going to type into to this function over here. So first, it's going to start from the first line of code over here. So as we said before, in Python, the execution starts from top to down. So in this case, first it's going to check first line of code. So if I click one more time, it's going to check the print statement. Then it's going to print out, hello, I'm a function inside in the console over here. So here it shows that this is not, it's not returning anything. It's just printing out this statement to the console. Then it's going to continue to the next line of code. So in the next line of code, we have by for now. So it's going to print out this code to the console over here. Now at the end, it's going to finish out saying that this function does not return anything. So our program will stop over here. So as you can see, when we are calling this function over here, it's going to execute the all lines of inside this function from top to down. Now, just to recap, this is how we create a function in Python. So first, we define the function to specify what it should do. And we do that by using the dev keyword over here. Then we give a name to our function, which is in our case, my first function over here. Now, after the name of function, we need to provide parentheses and column. Then after that, we get to put the lines of code which will be included in this function. And remember that this line of code over here, which goes into the function, will be carried out when the function is triggered. And they must be indented like this. So once you have defined the function, you have actually created the recipe. So the next step is to actually use it, which in programming lingo we will say calling the function. So to call a function, we just need to provide the function name and parentheses after function over here. Now, if you have arguments for the function, we are going to provide the arguments inside these parentheses, but for now we don't have any arguments. So that's why we are just putting the function name and parentheses after that. And once the computer see this line of code, it will go and carry out all these instructions inside function that we defined over here. So it's going to implement these instructions line by line from top to down. Now to learn functions very well, let's look at the carol the robot, which is similar to the functions. Now the robot is going to perform the task that we want to do, no more, no less. For example, if we wanted a robot to go to the store and pick up some milk for us, we just need to give the specific instruction. We cannot say, go and take some milk from the store and come back. So we need to specify the instructions step by step like this. So we need to say that move out from the house and then turn left and move some blocks to the forward, then turn right and go inside store and buy some milk and get the milk and come back with the same way that you went by giving specific instructions over here. So we have to give all these instructions to our robot to get the milk from the store. So here, as you can see, we have to program each and every, every step. But say if this functionality of getting the robot to go and pick up some milk for us is needed every single day, then we have to write all these instructions day after day. And at some point, we will be just bored and our fingers will be hurt. We will stop doing this because we don't have a way of bundling all these instructions together. So that's where functions come in. So functions will give us a way of referring all these instructions at the same time. So we can put all these instructions inside a kind of box so we can name it get milk. So with this way, we can give our robot a single instruction and it will carry out all those lines for getting some milk from the store. So as you can see, we have put all the instructions inside functions. So every day we just need to call get milk function so our robot can get a milk from a store. Now, hopefully with this example, you have get an idea of how can we define our own function. So with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have defined our very first function and we have learned why we need functions and how they are working. So hopefully everything is clear about defining functions. See you in the next lecture. Till now, we have mentioned how important it is in Python to be aware of indentation. So when we create a function like this, every line that comes after this definition over here that is indented is going to be inside this function. So by indented, I mean it's shifted by four spaces like this. 
So if you imagine each dot as a space, then this is a single block of code. And if you want to continue adding lines of code inside my first function, then we will continue adding lines of code which are indented over here. So here again, you see that this second print statement over here are indented with four spaces. Now, if my code was written like this, on the other hand, then the block of code is in fact only this part. And this print statement will not trigger when this function gets triggered because it is independent from this function and it's not indented inside this function over here. So here the block of code will be only this part. So when we call my first function over here, it's going to print out only hello world. So this part of code will not be printed out. Now a simple way that I like to think about this kind of indentation is kind of the file structure that you see when you go into Finder on your Mac or when you go to Explorer on Windows. Now if you have a function, we can think of this function as a folder over here. So our function name was my first function and here I have created my first function like this. Anything that goes into this folder, for example, if I take this file from here and throw it inside this folder, you will notice that this file gets indented. And this way, it shows clearly that these two files, print hello world and print see you, are living inside this my first function folder over here. And this is equivalent of this code where we have a function name as a folder and inside this function we have two files over here. The first one is print hello world and the second one print see you. So the code of block in this case will be whole function over here. On the other hand, if I take this print hello world file outside of this folder over here, you will see that it's not indented anymore. So this shows that this part of code is out of the this folder over here. So it's applicable for this file also. If I take it out, it's going to be outside of this folder. So for simplicity, I'm just going to put one of them inside this folder. And this second file, which is printing CU, will be outside of folder over here. Now in Python, the equivalent of this will be like this. So as you can see here, this second print statement, which is printing CU, is not indented anymore. So this means that it's outside of my first function folder over here. So it's not inside of my first function over here. So as I mentioned before, the code block in this case will be like this. So this second print statement is not included this function over here because it's not indented. Now indentation gets a little bit more complicated when you have other blocks of code. For example, if, elif and else statements. So it's very important that you get used to looking at, at blocks of code like this. So for example, our function before was very simple. Now by adding these if conditions over here, we have made our function more complicated. Now here, as you can see, we have indented all this line of code by four square, which are represented by four dots over here. Now, if we want to have another block of code inside this if statement, we have to indent the code over here with extra four space over here. So in this case, this print one over here is inside this if statement. So as you can see, it is indented by eight spaces because first four space is for this function and the next four spaces is for if condition over here. Now here, this is the function block. So as you can see, it's including all indented codes over here. Then we have another blocks inside this function block over here. Now the first block is this is if block. So as you can see, this if block is indented inside this function. Then after this if condition, if you want to write any code, it has to be indented by four spaces after this if condition. So as you can see, if a is equal to one, we are going to print out one. That's why print statement is indented inside if condition because it's going to be executed only this condition is met. Now the next code of block will be elif block. So here also you can see that this print two statement is located inside this elif statement. So if a is equal to two, in this case, we are going to print two. So print function has to be indented inside this elif block over here. Now you have to be able to see all of these while just looking at the indentation. Now, if you want to present this, then it's almost like creating a new folder over here. So if I just create a new folder like this, so I'm going to name it if a is equal to one, 
Then I'm just going to take this folder and put it inside this my first function folder. You will see that this folder gets indented. Now, if I create a new file over here by just copying this file, so I'm just going to put it print one. Then if I move this file in, inside this folder over here, you will see that this file gets indented inside this folder over here. So as you can see, it's representing the way that we have inside if condition. So this print one is located inside this folder. So it is indented like this. So as you can see, this print one file gets indented eight spaces over here. Now this folder is indented for space, but this print statement, which is printing one is indented eight space over here. So whenever we are putting if block, which is located inside function, we have to indent this code block twice. So it's equivalent to eight spaces in our code. Now, every time when we are talking about indentation, we have been talking about spaces. And actually, there is a two ways of creating indentation, spaces and tabs. You don't have to use just spaces. You can also use tabs that's created using tab key on your keyboard, which can look a little bit like this. So the question is, should we be using spaces or should we be using tabs? So there are lots of developers are arguing in coding communities regarding this. And in 2017, Stack Overflow Developer Survey shows salary differences between developers who use tabs and spaces. They ask the developer, do you use spaces or do you use tabs? And then they compare it against their annual salary. And somehow they have managed to show that people who use spaces seems to earn a lot more than people who use tabs. Now, this is not official statistic. This survey comes from the Stack Overflow survey. Now, official guide from the Python community is in fact to use spaces. Now, if you click the link from the resource section of this lecture, it will take you the official guide from Python. Now here you can see the style guide for Python code. So here you can see that the, there is a section over here which says tabs or spaces. Now if I click on this, it will take me to the place where it says that spaces are preferred indentation method. And in fact, in Python 3, you cannot mix a code file that use tabs and spaces for indentation in the same file. And it also tells you that in order to indent a line of code, it should be indented by four spaces over here. Now using four spaces for a lot of people may seem quite inefficient because I have to hit my space bar four times in order to achieve a single indent. So how many indentations in our code? And this seems very, very inefficient. But luckily in most code editors, they actually have a setting that allows you to indent using spaces by changing indent size to four. So for example, in Replit, if you go to the settings, you can see that there is an indentation type over here. So if I select space and put four over here, so whenever I click tab button, it's going to be indented for spaces over here. So as you can see, it is indented for spaces. So this means that you get to hit tab once and your code is in line with the guidance because behind the scenes, your code editor inserting four spaces. So with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have explained how important indentation is in Python. So hopefully you have understood everything related to indentation. Now in this lecture, we are going to learn more about functions. Previously, we have learned that functions are a really handy way of taking a complex set of instructions and packaging them together inside a block of code that has a given name to it. And when we want to execute all this line of code over here, all we have to do at any point later in our code is just to call our function by typing its name and set of parentheses. Now, in our case, our function's name is my first function, and we can call this function by typing the function name, which is my first function and parentheses over here. And when this line of code is run, it's going to search where the function is defined. So it's defined up over here. Then it's going to execute all lines of code that are contained within this function. Now here, to see how it works, I want you to head over to Replit and create new function called grid. Now here, to create a function, it's obvious that we need dev keyword. So I'm going to write dev keyword, and we know that it's a keyword, and that's why as soon as we type it, it changed the blue color. 
And after keyword, we have to give a name our function. Now in this case, we are going to name our function greet. Then after that, we are going to put parentheses. Then we are going to put column over here. So after column, if we hit enter, we are we enter into a block of code because we are indented over here. Now the first thing that I'm going to do to create print statement which says just hello. So I'm going to put print statement hello. Then I'm going to add next print statement. It's going to be how are you? Print how are you? Now we have created our function. Now it's time to trigger the function or in programming lingo call the function. And as we said before, we do that by calling the name of function and adding set of parentheses. So here you need to be careful that when you are calling function, you don't have to put it its indented level. It should be with same level that we have declared it. So I'm going to put greet. Then if I hit run, you will see that it's going to find the function that we declared over, over here and it's going to execute the all lines of code that we have in our function over here. So that's pretty simple. Notice that every single time if I call this function over here, it's going to do the same thing. It's just going to print out these two lines of code to the console. Now in reality, it's rare that you want to repeat the same instructions every single time when you call function. It would be nice if you could modify some parts of the code inside function and allow a little bit variation. For example, it would be nice if we could greet somebody by the name. So let's say if I put my name over here, Ershad, instead of just saying hello, we can say Ershad over here. So after hello, if I put Ershad, and here I can put over here as a, also, how are you, Ershad? Now, if I run our code, you will see that the output is changed. So here it says that, hello, Ershad, and how are you, Ershad? Here again, my name is hardcoded over here. Now, if we want, for example, for each time when we call our function to put different names over here, how can we achieve this functionality over here? So instead of each time greeting the Ershad, we can greet a user based on the username that we provided to our program over here. So the main question is, how can we achieve this functionality? Now we need to look more closely at these parentheses. Now what we can do is we can actually add the name of variable inside these parentheses over here to start giving our functions some input. So let's say there's a variable called something that's going to be passed to our function over here. As soon as we get this variable as an input, we can do anything with this variable over here. So in this case, this is something. So this means that we can do this with something over here. And this is something can be used inside this block of code. And when we call our function, we have to add data inside this parentheses over here. So in this case, the calling function will be like this. So let's say we have decided to pass one, two, three over. Well, in this case, when this line of code gets triggered, the computer is going to search for where this function is declared. So it's obvious that we have declared it over here. Then it's going to pass over this piece of data, which is one, two, three, over to this variable over here. So now effectively inside this function, which is my first function, we now have a variable called something, and that is equal to one, two, three. And it can be used inside block of code to do something with this piece of data over here. So instead of something over here, if we call our function with one, two, three, it's going to be do this thing with one, two, three. Now it's a bit like plugging a USB stick into our computer. If we took a different piece of input, we will end up with different file being shown by the computer. So this means that we have two different USB sticks over here. So for this one, we are going to have different inputs in our computer. For the second one, we are going to have completely different inputs in our computer. So this means that computer can do something different depending on the input that we give it. And if we change that input, it will receive a different piece of data. Now, in addition to this simple function over here, we can also create a function that allows input. So I'm just going to comment over here, put function with input. And to do that, you saw earlier on the syntax that it's going to the same as before we use def keyword. So I'm just going to put def keyword. Then before I put just greet. So in this case, I'm going to name our function greet with name. Then after name, we are going to put parentheses over here. Then instead of leaving this inside parentheses, we need to create a name of variable that's going to be passed over here. So let's just call it name because 
that describes the data that we are going to be received. So in this case, we are going to receive the name of person to greet the person. To, so that's why I'm going to name the parameter name. Then after parentheses, we need to put colon over here. Now after putting colon, if I hit enter one more time, it's going to be indented over here. So we can write our code inside this function over here. Now here, one more time, I'm going to use print function. Now inside print function, we are going to use this name variable over here. Now it's obvious that here again, we are going to use f string. So to use f string, I'm going to put f. Then after f, I'm going to put quotes. So hello. Then inside braces, I'm going to put name. Now we can do the same operation for the second print statement. So in this case, I'm just going to copy and paste it. So instead of hello, I'm going to put how are you and name over here. Now here, I'm just going to comment this part. So I don't need to call this function over here. So I'm just going to call the second function with the parameter. Now in this case, when we are calling this function greet with the parameter, you see that it shows name parameter over here. Now if I select it and open parentheses, you see that the prompt says that it requires a parameter. So we need to provide an input over here. Now in this case, as an input, if I put LSHRAD and hit run, you'll see that in this case also it's printing out hello LSHRAD and how are you LSHRAD. Now instead of LSHRAD, if I put EDDY and run it, you see that this time the output will be different. So in this case, based on the parameter, we can change the execution of the function like this. So we are providing an input. So based on this input, it's providing an output to us. So every time when we execute this function, it gets a modify a little bit changing the input. Now, when we are talking about functions with inputs, there are two things that we are going to work with, and that's really important to differentiate them. So we know that when we call this function, we need to pass over this piece of data. And effectively, we are creating a new variable called something, and we are setting it to equal to this piece of data that we are passing to it. Now in programming lingo, you will hear this being referred as a parameter and this piece of data being referred as an argument over here. Now the argument is actual piece of data that's going to be passed over this function when this is called over here. Whereas the parameter is the name of data and we use the parameter inside function to refer to it and to do things with it. Now very often on the internet, when you come across somebody explaining something to be on a stack overflow or in some piece of documentation, you will hear them referring these two types of things, the parameter and the argument. So if you need to come back and listen to this lesson and remind yourself the difference between those things. The parameter is the name of the data that's being passed in and the argument is the actual piece of data. Now, sometimes people also get confused on the internet between these two words, but as long as you know what that means, then you will be in a good place. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have learned functions with inputs. Hopefully everything is clear about them. So see you in the next lecture. Now in the last session, we saw a very simple form of function that allows for input. Now in this lesson, I want to take even further and I want to create a function that allows for multiple inputs. So let's comment out the previous code that we created over here. So as you remember, this was a simple code. So I'm just going to comment out this code from here, the one that we are calling the function. Then I'm going to create a new function, which will take two parameters. So it's going to be name and city. So here, one more time to create a function, I'm just going to use dev keyword. So in this case, the name of function will be greet. So I will put with, so let's put name and city, so nc. So here it's going to take two parameters. Now, as a challenge, I want you to quickly think about how you might add two parameters. One's called name and another one is called city into this function declaration over here. Now pause the video, have a brief thing, and then we will go through it together. All right, we know that if we want to add one parameter, which is name over here, we just need to put name of the variable. And this is how we will do it we will just add it inside this parentheses over here. Now, if we want to have more than one parameter, all we have to do is to add comma after this parameter, then we are going to add second parameter. Now, in this case, the second parameter will be city. Now, 
After adding the parameters over here, I'm just going to put colon over here and hit enter. So after hitting enter, as you can see, the cursor comes to the indented level. So this means that whatever we are going to write inside this function is going to be inside this function over here. Now then inside this function, we are going to use the name to print out something hello name. And we are going to use city parameter to ask whether in their particular location. So one more time here again, I want you to pause the video and think how you can you modify this function over here to greet the person and ask for the weather over here. Now, hopefully you have done it by yourself. Now, if you haven't done it, let's start do it together. So here, I'm just going to call print function. So this part of code basically will be the same. So I'm just going to copy it from here and pass it over here. The one that we created in our previous lecture. Then we are going to use same print statement. Then we are going to use f string one more time over here. So inside f string, we are going to put what is weather like in. So we are going to put the city name inside braces. So it's going to be like this city name. Now with this, our function is completed. Now, if I call this function with the name of greet with NC, it's going to prompt me to add both these inputs over here. Now, after this function over here, I'm just going to call this function. So it's going to be greet. So we have, our function is this one. So we have created greet function over here, greet with name function. And in our previous lectures, now in this lecture, we have created greet with NC. So as you can see, it's prompting this one. And here you see that it's requesting two parameters over here. Now, after putting the name of function, if I put parentheses over here, you see that first it's requiring the name, then it's requiring city parameter. Now, which parameter you are typing over here is going to underline that parameter. Now, first we are going to type my name, which is Ershad. So it's going to be like this. Then if I put comma over here, you will see that the underline changed to city. So this means that it's requiring the city name. So in this case, I'm just going to put, for example, Berlin. Now, if I run our code, you will see that in this case, it's greeting Ershad. So this means that it takes this Ershad parameter from here and replace it with the name variable and putting it over here. Then the second line is, what is weather like in Berlin? So it's taking this Berlin from here and put it inside this city and printing out as an output like this to the console. So as you can see here, it takes these parameters, replace these variables over here without any issue. Now, the question is, if I take these parameters over here, and change their places, what will happen? So instead of Airshot over here, if I put Berlin, and instead of Berlin, if I put Airshot, what will be the output in this case? Now, in this case, if I run our code, you'll see that first it's saying, hello, Berlin, and what is weather like in Airshot? So as you can see, it didn't take the name parameter as Airshot, it take name as Berlin and city as Airshot over here. So actually what happened here is it takes the position of the data, looks at the both these arguments over here and first it gets assigned the Berlin to the name, then it's getting assigned Elfrad to the city over here, then it's using these variables inside this code over here. Now in this case, name is equal to Berlin and city is equal to Elfrad. That's why it is printed out over here as an output, something strange. So as I mentioned, Berlin is assigned to name and Ershad name is assigned to city over here. And in Python, this is called positional argument. Because when we call the function, we have not specified anywhere which particular parameter we want to associate this piece of data that we have over here. So it's just gone and looked at the position of these variables and taking them over here. So this means that when we are declaring our function, we have set as a first parameter name, then the second parameter city. So that's why as a first value that we are sending to the function, it's going to take Berlin. And the second value is Elfrad. That's why it's assigning Berlin to name and Elfrad to city over here. Now, this is the default way of calling function because when we are typing our code over here, we get the hints to which piece of data you need to enter. But also you can refer the function, look at the order of parameters when you are declaring it. So as you can see, when we look at the declaration of this function, we see that first name, the second one is city. Now, if we had more input, Let's say in this case, we had A, B, C, and we put the arguments one, two, three, then it means that our variables that get created will be A is equal to one, B is equal to two, and C is equal to three, because in this case, we are calling it 
as the order that we have declared over here. Now, if you switch around the arguments in the function call like this, in this case, A will be 3, B will be 1, and C will be 2. So it might be doing slightly unpredictable things over here. Now, whenever you are creating code and you are using these positional arguments, you are just inserting data one by one like this. It does not something completely unexpected. Be sure that to check your position and to make it match with the position of parameter that you are inserting the data over here. Now, if you want to be more clear when you actually call the function and you don't want to counter this problem, well, in this case, you can use something called keyword arguments. So instead of just adding the arguments in the function call like this, you can actually add each of parameters name and equal sign to say that the first parameter is equal to this one and the second parameter is equal to this one and the third parameter is equal to this one. So in this case, A will be one, B will be two and C will be three. And now when we actually change the order around, it does not matter how we order these parameters over here. It's going to be the same values for this parameter over here. So even though we have changed the order of the parameters over here, A is still one, B is still two and C is still three. So now I want to take this function over here that we created and instead of positional argument over here, I want you to use the keyword argument. So this is another challenge. So here I want to pause the video and think how can you use keyword arguments for this function call over here. Now, hopefully you have done it by yourself. If you haven't done it, let's do it together. So one more time, we are just going to call our function. So I'm going to put parentheses over here. So inside parentheses, the first thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to put name is equal to Elshad. As we said before, when we are using positional argument, we have to put the name of parameter. So in this case, name of parameter is name. Then the second parameter is city. So in this case for city, for example, I'm going to put London. Now, if I run our code, you will see that it says that hello Elshad and what's weather like in London. Now, even if I change the order of these parameters over here. So instead of first putting name, if I put city over here and, and after that, if I put comma and run our code, you'll see that in this case, nothing is changed. So it's going to print out hello Airshot and the weather, what's weather like in London. So as you can see, whatever we put over here, it's going to assign London to city and Airshot to name over here. Now this can make your code less error prone, but it does make each line of code longer. So I recommend you using your judgment to figure out when you want to use which type of argument and depending on need, you can pick between these two. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have learned how can we declare a function with more than one and what is the difference between positional and keywords arguments. Hopefully everything is clear about this. So see you in the next lecture. Alright, now in this lecture, we will talk about functions with output. So we have already seen a couple of things that we can do with functions. The first thing I show you was to create a very simple standard function using def keyword, then name, then empty parentheses, then colon over here. Then within the body of function, you can do a bunch of things which will be carried out every time when you trigger or call the function like this over here. And this type of function basically just help you to reduce the amount of code you have to write when you have instruction that you want to execute it repeatedly. Now, the next type of function that we saw actually had something inside these parentheses over here. And this something is an input, which can be passed over when we call the function. Now, in this case, when we call this function, we are passing triple one over here, which is argument, which gets passed into this parameter called something, and then it's get used within the body of function. The second type of function is a function which allow for inputs. And this gives us ability to modify the code in the function and get it to do something different each time, depending on the input that was passed in. Now we are going to continue to the final type of function, which allow us to have output once the function is completed. Now here, we are going to start with this simple function. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to write def keyword, then the function name, then inside parentheses, for now, I'm not going to put anything. So it's possible that when you are creating functions with the output, you can put inputs also, but for simplicity, we are not going to put input over here because 
inputs and outputs are completely separate from each other. So this is a normal function and you have seen it many times. And within the body of function, I'm just going to do some specific calculations. So I have created a variable, which is result. And I have assigned the one plus two to this variable over here. So I'm calculating one plus two over here. Now then I can use output keyword, which is return keyword. Then after return keyword, I can put this result that I've calculated over here. In this case, the output is the result. And what that means is when I call this function later on and it runs, then it will go ahead and output this result and it will replace this function over here. Now this is result held in the code where the function was called. Now actually I can save it to another variable as a result of this function over here. So if I create a variable over here called output and I can assign this result that I am getting from this, this my first function to this variable over here. So in this case, the result is three. So this means that three will be assigned to this output over here. Now in this case, this code might look like this. So without using any variable over here, we can just return this calculation. Then in this case, when we are calling our function, we can call it like this. So we are creating output variable over here, then assigning it this function. So this function will return this three from here and it will assign to this output variable over here. Now, the way that I think about the function with outputs is almost kind of like a machine. So in this case, this machine has an input with empty bottle. So if you put empty bottle to this milk machine over here, it's going to process something over here. Then it's going to output a bottle with full of milk. So in this case, the function has input, which is empty glass bottle, and it has an output, the glass bottle filled with milk. And in the middle, there is some processes or some code that is being executed to create this change over here. Now this ties together all things that we have learned about functions. So basically it has input with empty bottle. So it's doing some processing over here and it's giving output as a bottle with full of milk. So to put everything together, let's see how this is working in practice. Now, basically till now, when we are using built-in functions, we have used the functions with outputs. We have used the functions like math function or some other built-in functions such as len function. These functions basically are the functions with outputs. So for example, if I import math model over here and use the one of the function of math model, in this case, you will see that it's going to return something. So for example, I'm going to use the square root function. So I'm just going to put math dot, math dot square root. So in this case, it requires one parameter. So as you can see, I need to put any number over here. For example, for simplicity, I'm going to put 16. Now, if I run our code, you will see that in this case, nothing happens in the console because it's returning value, we are, but we are not printing that value to the console. Now to see the value that we are getting from this function, we can use just this function inside print statement. So if I use this inside print statement, we know that print statement prints whatever it has inside this function to the console. So if I run it one more time, in this case, you will see that it's printing out four because this function returns four. So it's printing out four to the console. So we can even save this function's output. For example, I'm going to create variable like this. And then after saving this output to the output variable, we can print out to the console. You will see that same thing happens over here. So, so as you can see, it's printing out 4.0. So this means that this function square root function is a function with outputs. Now the functions that do not have any output are called void functions. So if any function is not returning anything, in this case, we are calling these functions void function. So for simplicity, for example, Let's just create a function, simple function over here. Def, for example, I'm going to put print twice. So it's not going to take any parameter. I'm just going to print out hello to the console twice. So if I run this function, which means that if I call this function over here, you'll see that it's going to print out hello twice to the console. So it's printing out straight away. But if I just create a variable over here, for example, output variable, and assign this value to this output and try to print out the output to the console, 
you will see that in this case it's going to return the type of num because here the function does not return anything so that's why it's just printing out to the console this hello hello is coming from this print statement and it's not returning anything that's why but what python does over here is it checks that if we don't have any return statement over here it's printing out none over here now the question is how can we create function with the output in practice so what i'm going to do here i'm just going to create a function which called format name and this function will take two parameter first name and last name and it's going to change this input so to the title case so in this case if i put as input for example elshad the output will be like elshad so here there's another challenge so i want you to pause the video and create a function which takes two parameters then we will continue from there now hopefully you have done it by yourself so if you haven't done it let's do it together so the first thing that we are going to do we are going to use dev keywords then we are going to put the name of function so as i mentioned before it's going to be format name so it's going to take two parameters so the first parameter will be first name so i'm just going to put f name and the second parameter will be last name then we are going to format these names to print out title case now here you might not know how to find out the title case now as always what we are going to do we are going to search to see how can we find the bulletin function to convert these names to the title case so what i'm going to do i'm going to open google i'm going to search python title case function now here if you go to on stack overflow you will see that someone asked question how to convert string to the title case in python you'll see that whatever we are putting as an input is going to print out as a title case like this so the answer is you are writing the string like this then put dot and using title function like this so in this case in our case we are going to put first name dot title case so what i'm going to do over here is so i'm just going to print out the result that we are getting from the title function so the first is i'm going to put f name dot so in this case we can call title function then i'm going to do the same thing for the second parameter that we are getting from function so it's going to be l now in this case if i run our code so i'm just going to call this function so i'm going to put my first name with the small letters and i'm going to put my surname with lowercase letters also so at the end let me just put with capital letter now if i run this so here we have put l last it has to be l name last name so if i run this you'll see that it's converted it to elshad and karimov with the title case now here instead of just returning these two names over here we can actually combine them together and return them so what i'm going to do i'm going to save this formatted name to a new variable so in this case i'm going to put variable over here formatted name formatted first name so this means that this title function will return the formatted name so i'm going to save it to this formatted name variable so i'm going to do the same operation for this formatted last name so instead of f i'm going to put over here l so i need to delete the print statement then i need to put like this now after doing so we can just print out these two variables to the console so here i'm going to use f string so it's going to be like this then inside f string we are going to put braces then inside braces we are going to put first formatted first name then comma then formatted last name now if i run our code one more time you'll see that in this case it's combined these two variables together and print out to the console so basically instead of print statement over here we can use return keyword to return this expression from this function so i'm going to delete print statement from here so instead of print i'm going to put output keyword which is return and it's going to be like this so if i run our function in this case you'll see that nothing happens into the console so this means that we have get the value from this format name function but we have not saved it anywhere and we have not printed out to this one to the console so what i'm going to do i'm going to put create a new variable over here which is output then at the end we are going to print out output to the console so if i run our code one more time so in this case you see that the same output printed out to the console so basically with this we have created a function 
in which we have inputs, two inputs, and then we are doing some processing on these inputs. Then we are returning output with a title case and combining them together. Now we can visualize this by copying this code from here and passing into Tony to see how the execution occurs in this case. So inside Tony, I'm just going to pass the code over here. Then I'm going to click debug current script. Now, when we click the debug current script, so we know that when we are calling the script in Python, first it's going to check the first line. So in the first line, we have comments. That's why it's going to skip to the third line. Now in the third line, it's going to check the body of the function. We know that function will not be executed if we are not calling this function. So that's why in this case, nothing will happen over here. Then if I click step into it, it's going to continue to the next line. So in the next line, we are calling this function and saving it to the output. So what's going to do? If I click step into one more time, it's going to check this function. Then it's going to check one by one the parameters. So in this case, as a parameter, we are sending sending Ershad. Then the second parameter is Karimov. Then it's going to run this function over here. So this means that it's going to continue to the code of this function. Now in the first line of code of this function, we are formatting the name as a title. So this means that it's going to take the name. So as a parameter, we have passed Ershad. Then it's going to convert it to the title case. So as you can see, it converted to title case. In this case, it's like this, and it save it to formatted F name. Then it's going to continue to the next line. So in the next line, it's going to take the second parameter. So the second parameter is Karimov like this. Then it's going to call title function and convert it to the title case, and it's going to save it to this formatted L name. Then if I click one more time, is going to continue to the third line of this function. So in the third line, we have return statement and the formatted uh, expression like this. So this means that it's going to format the names like this. So as you can see, the name is Ershad with comma Karimov with title case. So it's going to return this one. So this means that if I return this, it's going to continue our code and save it to output variable over here. Now after saving it to output variable, it's going to continue to the print statement and then in the print statement, it's going to print out this value to the console. So as you can see, the shot Karimov printed out to the console. Now with this, we have seen how function with output works. Now here, the important moment is this return keyword over here. Now, whatever we put after return keyword over here is not going to be executed inside this function. So for example, if I put print statement after this return keyword, so I'm just going to print out test, and rerun our code, you see that it's just printing out Ershad Karimov to the console. So this print statement over here is skipped because when we are calling this function, all codes continue to till over here, then it will just skip the code that comes after the keyword. So the return keywords is really the most important thing in order to create a function that has output because everything that comes after it is going to be replaced where the function is called. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have discussed how functions with output works. So hopefully everything is clear about them. So see you in the next lecture. All right, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about a new concept, which is called doc strings. Doc strings are basically a way for us to create little bits of documentation as we are coding along in our function or in our other blocks of code. Now, previously, we have seen that when we use other functions, which are built-in functions in Python, like len function, you can see as soon as I open the parentheses, I can see a little piece of documentation. So if I just write over here len and open parentheses, you see that the little documentation comes over here, which says that return the number of items in a container. So this is the simple documentation about this function and tells us what this function does. So this piece of documentation is docstring. Now the question is, how can we create same kind of documentations for the functions that we are creating? So by using def strings in our functions, we can tell what our function will do. Now, how can we put docstring in inside our functions? We will put it in the first line of code. So when we hit the enter after column over here, the line that comes over here is the first line in our function. So the doc string has to go first line after the declaration. So here, as you can see, we have defined the name of function and the inputs, then the colon, then after colon, when we hit the enter, the cursor comes to the indented level. Then in this indented level, we can write our doc string. Now to create a doc string, you have to use 
three quotation mark. So you have to put three quotation mark like this. So inside three quotation mark, I need to write our doc string like this. Now we here inside these three quotation marks, we can write that this function for marks first and last name. Now here, when you are writing your documentation, if you don't have place, you can hit enter and it comes over here inside this uh, doc string over here. Now, whenever I call our function one more time, now if I call our function over here, you will see that this definition that we write inside doc string is come over here. So it says that this function for must first and last name. Now, as I mentioned, it can be multiple lines of code. So without anything, you, you can hit enter inside these doc strings over here. But we know that in Python, if you just create a variable, for example, string variable, if I put a string here inside these quotes, I cannot put enter. In this case, it's not recognizing this as a string. But when we use doc string, we can write as many lines as we want. And it will be interpreted as the same thing all together, as it was fitted on the same line like this. Now with these doc strings, we are able to documenting our functions and giving each function a little bit explainer. Now in Python, you can also use this triple quotation as multiple line comment. Now, as I mentioned, when we write the comment, for example, I want to write sample comment over here, sample comment over here, if I hit enter, it's going to go to the code loop line. So we cannot put multiple comments with this sign over here. Now, as I mentioned, you can use this triple quotation as multiple comments lines. So we can put something like this. So if I hit enter how many times that I want, whatever I write inside this triple quotation is going to be recognized as comment. But in the official documentation of the Python, it says that it's advisable to avoid multiple comments like this. What's actually much easier, just write multiple comment, then we just need to highlight the code that we want to comment and hit command forward slash on Mac and control forward slash on Windows. That's a much better way of differentiating the comment from the actual piece of the code. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have discussed how can we add doc strings into our functions or code blocks over here. So hopefully everything is clear about Talk strings. All right, in this lecture, we will talk about difference between printing something to the console over here versus returning something as an output from the function. Because a lot of students get very confused at this stage and they think that why don't I just print off these results instead of returning them from function. So what's the actual difference between return and print statement? Now in this lecture, I want to address this. At the moment, we have got these four functions and we call it and we pass over some inputs. So once we get this output from these functions that we are using, we are printing out this answer to the console over here. Now in the current state of calculator, it's hard to see the difference between print and return statement. But here's the question. What if I wanted to take the output that comes from the calling these functions? over here and instead of just storing it inside variable and then printing out what if we want to pass it as an input to another function so let's say at this point we have decided that we are going to ask to pick another operation from the user so once we get the answer we are going to use that answer in another operation over here now to do so after this print statement i'm just going to ask for new operation so to ask for new operation i'm going to name it new operation variable is equal to so as you can see we were asking the operations like this so i'm just going to copy this part of code and pass it over here we are using input function so i'm just going to change the operation like this pick another operation from this list now after picking another operation from this list we are going to ask for the third number so one more time i'm just going to copy this code from here which is for the second number then i'm going to change it to ask for third number so the name of variable will be n3 and what is the third number because we are going to use third number to do operation with the value that we are getting from this output over here so this is the answer based on the operation we are getting the answer and based on this answer we are going to calculate another operation with the third number that we are going to provide now we see that if we choose another operation we need to repeat these steps over here in which based on the operation we are calling different functions that we have declared over here. 
Now we have learned that to get rid of repetitive code, we can create this part of code as a function. So I'll create a new function over here and put all these if statements inside the function. So I'm just going to name the function name calculate. So it's going to be def calculate. So as a parameter, it's going to take three parameters, n1, n2, and operation. Then after declaring it, I'm just going to put column over here. Then I'm going to select this part of code from here and click tab to put this if elif conditions inside this function over here with indentation level. Now after calculating everything over here, I'm just going to return answer from this function. Now after returning it, we need to call this function to print out result to the console like this. So here, after declaring it, I'm just going to create a new variable, which will be output is equal to calculate. So it's going to be calculated based on n1, n2, and operation that we are getting from console over here. Then I'm just going to change this answer to output because it's going to be calculated based on this function that we have declared over here, and it's going to save the output to this output variable, and we are going to print out this output to the console. Now after doing so, and finally, we are going to get the calculation function based on this new operation then and the number that we have picked over here. And we are going to calculate new answer based on this number that we get from the console and based on the output that we get from the previous calculation. So here, I'm just going to create a new variable, which will be new answer. It's going to be called calculate. So instead of answer, we can put output over here because here we have created as an output. So it's going to be new output. So as a first parameter, I'm going to select the output that we have calculated before. So it's going to be the first parameter and the second parameter will be the N3, which we have picked as a third number. Then operation will be new operation that we have picked over here. So based on this, we are going to calculate our new output over here. So basically here, instead of writing output like this, I can just copy this code from here and paste it instead of output over here inside this calculate function. So basically we are calling this calculate function twice over here. So the first number will be the output that comes from the first calculation. And the second output will be from the outside calculation function. So as a second parameter, we have taken the third number that we are getting from the user. Then after calculating this, I'm just going to print out one more time to the console something like this. So I'm just going to copy paste it here. And instead of operation, I'm going to put new operation. So I'm just going to copy and paste it over here. And instead of output, I'm just going to put new output over here. And N1 also should be the output that we get from the previous call of this function. Now with this, we have successfully implemented the second function in which we are picking another operation to calculate it. Now, if you run our function, so first it's going to ask the what is the first number so for simplicity i'm just going to put two and hit enter then the second number so let's put four then hit enter so i'm just going to select plus sign so if i put plus sign it's going to return six because two plus four is six then we need to select another operation so here i'm just going to select multiplication operation so if i select multiplication operation and hit enter it's going to ask for third number so if I select three, in this case, the answer must be 18 because, because six multiply three has to be 18. But here you can see that the output shows six multiply with four because here we have forgotten to put N3, not N2. So the output has to be like this. So if I rerun it with the same parameter, two, four, and select multiple, select plus sign. And as another operation, I'll select multiplication then three in this case you will see that the output shows correct so six multiplies three is 18 over here so in this case i have successfully calculated another operation over here because i have an output from my calculation function over here this is because of this return keyword that we have put over here we are able to get result from this calculate function and after getting this result from this calculate function we are able to take the result from the calculate function and plug it right back to another calculate function over here. And as I mentioned, I'm able to do so because I'm using return statement over here. And that's why I have outputs from my functions over here. So this will not be possible if I'm using a print statement instead of return statement. So if I put print statement over here 
and in these functions over here in this case we are not able to get results from the functions over here it's just going to print out the result of the console we will not able to get result and use it in in another function call over here and we cannot save the output in any variable over here now with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture uh, i have shown you practically what's the difference between return and print statement over here so hopefully everything is clear over here by using this practical example so see you in the next lecture All right, welcome back to the brand new section of the Python for Everyone course. So in this section, we are going to learn about iteration and Python list. So here we are going to include lists, for loop, and we are going to use range function with the for loop. Then we will continue with the while loop, and we are going to use continue and break statements inside the loop. So here again, after finishing this section, we are going to continue to implement everything that we have learned in real life projects. So after this section, we are going to develop four different projects which are very interesting so the first project will be dice rolling i know that many of you already know what's dice rolling so we are going to simulate the dice rolling and here is going to be two dice so then we are going to continue to the fizzbuzz game so this is also fun game so here in this project i have provided the descriptions so this is a group word game for children to teach them about division so i'm not going to explain the details because we are going to develop it after this section everything that we are going to learn so here again we are going to use the different types of the loops so here we are going to concentrate on iteration now the next real project will be guessing the number so here we are going to create a program which will generate a random number which is unknown to the user between upper and lower bound that we are going to provide then user needs to guess what is the number so this is also a very fun game so here again we have the instruction for this game then after that we are going to continue to create password generator so we know that in the recent years password generator is very essential because if you use very simple passwords so hackers can easily get your password and store in some third database and share with others then your accounts might be hacked so for that we are going to create password generator which is going to generate very complex passwords so here you see that we have a password over here which is very complex now here i want to share a website with you where you can check that if your email is pound or not so the website is called have i been pound so here you can open this website and write your email and check that if your email or password is saved in any database out there for instance if i just go ahead and put over here email address like this info at appmillers.com and click pound you will see that in this case this is a good news my email is not found anywhere in the database out there so you can put your email and check that if you find your email out there in a database so if yes you can go ahead and change your password using our password generator project over here then the next project that we are going to create is going to call rock paper scissors i know that many of you played this game with your friends during your daily lives so here we are just going to simulate this game so the instruction for this game is given over here like this so as you can see after finishing this section we are going to create five different projects which are very interesting so when you are ready head over to the next lesson to get started so see you in the next lesson now in this section we will talk about iteration but before diving into the iteration I want to talk a little bit about Python list, which will be discussed in detail in data structure section. The reason that I want to talk about list in the beginning of this section is that we will use list to understand iteration very well. So it's highly recommended to be familiar with list before continuing to the iteration. As I mentioned here, I will just provide general concepts about list. And the list is what you would call a data structure. What does that mean? It's a way of organizing and storing data in Python. We will talk about different types of data structures in our upcoming lectures very detailed. But for now, we will learn only list, which is needed to understand iteration in detail. And here, I want to mention that data structures and algorithms are very essential for making very fast programs and for passing interviews. So if you want to get deep knowledge about data structures and algorithms in Python, try my the complete data structures and algorithm course in Python 
which includes more than 100 interview questions and all concepts regarding them. You can find the link, of course, in the resource section of this lecture. Now we have already seen ways of storing single piece of data in Python, and that was done through simple variable, where we just said, for example, a is equal to 3 or b is equal to 4. So by that, we are storing these values inside these variables over here. But that's just storing one piece of data, such as a number or a string. But sometimes we want to store group of piece of data. The data that has some sort of connection with each other. For example, if you want to store all names of the countries in the UK, then it does not really make sense to store them individually, because they are kind of belong together and they have relationship with each other. So it would be nice if you had a variable that is called countries in the UK, then you will be able to store all names of UK countries together in one variable. Now, in other cases, you might also want to have order in your data. For example, if you are storing all people in the queue, then you want to be able to keep hold of order in which they join the queue. You don't want to let the person to come and skip the queue and, and go to the first place to withdraw money from the ATM. Now, in this case, when a new person comes, he or she has to stay at the end of the queue. So this is why we need to learn about list. So the list look pretty simple like this. It's just set of brackets and many items stored in it. And those items can be any data type. They can even have mixed data types, like you could store number, string, and Boolean values together. It does not really matter. But what does matter is syntax. In Python, list always starts with object open bracket like this and closing bracket like this and then in between you have your items separated by comma and in order to store it in a variable then it's same way as we have done before the only difference is right side of this equal sign over here so as you can see in the left side we have a variable name which is the list name in this case and on the right side we are creating the list like this so we have left and right brackets and inside brackets we have items separated by comma. So for example, if you want to store a bunch of drinks, it might look like this. The name of list is drinks, and we have juice, coke, beer inside this list over here. So let's look at this using real code. Now let's say we want to store all names of the countries that are located in the UK. Now without knowing the list data structure, we might have written like this. So it's going to be like this. Country one is equal to, for example, first country is England. Then country two will be Scotland and it continue like this. So we will have to create as many variables as we have countries. So for example, for all countries over here, we have to declare variables one by one. But now we know about list, so we can create a single variable and we can call it countries of UK. So instead of creating countries one by one, I'm just going to create a variable which is called countries of UK. So in this case, it's going to be like this country of UK and then as you mentioned when we are creating a list we have to put left bracket open bracket and closing bracket like this then inside these brackets we can write our country names so in this case the first country will be England and then to separate the items we need to put comma and the second country will be Scotland and we can continue list by just adding commas over here after this country and adding piece of data after this comma then adding another piece of data then one more time put comma and adding another piece of code and it will continue like this and this way we end up with a list data structure and now interesting things about uk countries is that different countries join uk at different times and actually you can head over to wikipedia and you can see that each country is joined the union in different times so here i just want to mention that i'm not here to teach some politics or history about the uk but the reason that i'm telling this is that the order of data matters when we are creating lists because if you wanted a list of UK countries that are in the order that they join the kingdom, then the order which they are stored in our data structure is, is now immensely important. So this is another thing that you get with lists. You can use a list to store many pieces of related data, but they also have an order and the order is determined by the order in the list. So the first piece of data over here will be in the first place, second item will be in the second place, and it will continue in the order that we declare our countries over here. Now here's the list of countries ordered by the date they join the United Kingdom. Now you can see that if later on I decided that I want to know which country joined the first, then I can print this variable from this 
list over here, which is called countries of UK. So to print the first country from this list over here, all I have to do, I'm just going to write print statement. Then inside print statement, I'm just going to put the name of list, which is countries of UK. Then I can add set of square brackets. Then inside this bracket, I just need to type zero as an index of piece of data I want to pull out of from the countries of UK. Now, if I go ahead, run this code, you will see that it's printing out England to the console. Now, if I keep increasing this number for, for example, if I put one over here and run our code, you will see that in this case, it's printing out Scotland. So now you might be wondering, that's kind of weird. When you type zero, you get England, right? So surely England should be the first item in the list. So this is kind of peculiarity with the computers and programming language. You'll tend to find the programmers start counting from zero. So England is at zero. Then Scotland is located at one and then Wales located at second index. And this idea might be seem a little bit weird at first. Why this first item is located at zero index? But if you think about that index number that is 0, 1, 2, instead of being position, actually being an offset or a shift from the start of the this list over here, then in this case, juice is right at the beginning of the list. So it has offset or a shift of 0 from the beginning. But the coke is shifted from the beginning by 1. So you can see that it's shifted from beginning by 1. And beer is shifted from beginning by 2. And then it makes more sense that the first item in the list is at the beginning of list, so it has no offset. So it has offset of zero. And you'll find that in many, many programming languages, there are similar data structures to the list. And this is how they are usually ordered starting from zero and adding by one. And now you can see that when you want to get hold of particular piece of data stored inside the list, you get the name of list, and then you add set of square brackets. And whenever you see the square brackets, you should be thinking that this might be related to list because when you create list, you use square brackets. And when you try to get items out of the list, you also use a square bracket. And then inside of the square brackets is where you put the index or offset of the item that you want to get. Now, in this case, if I want to get the value of the wealth, in this case, England is located at the index of zero, which is zero offset from the beginning. Then Scotland is located at the index of 1, then Wales is located at the index of 2. So if I write over here 2 and run our code, you will see that it's going to print out Wales. And now, if I want to save this value that we are getting from the list into another variable, we can write it like this. So I can put it like this. For example, I can put the name of the variable Wales. So it's going to save the Wales inside the Wales variable. And we can print out Wales to the console like this. So if I run our code, you'll see that in this case, it's printing out Wales to the console. And here, in addition to using the positive indexes over here, we can also use negative index. So instead of Wales over here, I'm going to put country. And then I'm going to print out country over here. So for example, if I put minus one over here, what do you think what will happen? So if I run our code, you'll see that in this case, it's printing out Northern Ireland. Because whenever you, do, you put the minus index over here, it starts from the end of list and printing out the values to the console. Now, in this case, if I put minus 2, you will see that in this case, it's printing out wells to the console. Now, here, the interesting moment over here is that at the beginning, we are starting from the 0. But when we start from at the end, we are starting from minus 1. Why we are not putting minus 0? The reason is minus 0 is not actually a real thing in math. So that's why we are starting from the minus 1. So this means that you can have positive indices and negative indices. So by using these indexes, we can pull out things out of the list by putting them inside square brackets after the name of the list. Now you can also change the items in the list using very similar code. So in this case, so I'm just going to copy this part from here and pass it over here. For example, if I decided that Scotland is not spelled like this, it's spelled like this. So to access the Scotland, we know that we need to put the index of 1 because it's start from 0 then 1 then I can put the equal sign which means the, which means that I'm going to assign a new variable to this cell over here so it's going to be so let's say we have decided that it's spelled like this Scotland so if I run our code for example and printing out the same index to the console in this case you'll see that it's printing out Scotland so instead of 
printing out specific value if i just print out the list itself you'll see that in this case it's printing out as a scott node not with c it's printing out with k over here so by using the list name and inside square brackets the specific data is indexed in this case we can update that index over here now actually in python documentation you can find more functions about list over here so in our data structure section we are going to talk about these functions very details here you just need to take into account that whenever you want to do anything on this you can refer to documentation to use these functions over here so for example if you use append function append function add item to the end of the list so in this case if i head over to our code you'll see that if i decided that new country is joined to the countries of uk all i have to do i need to put the name of list then dot so then i can put for example append so here let's say a new country which is test one is joined to the united kingdom if i rerun our code you'll see that in this case test one is joined at the end of the list over here so by using a pet function we can add new items to the list over here and as i mentioned the important moment over here is you don't have to memorize all the functions that are related to list or any other data structures because this is the whole point of documentation and also we have google because there's a much information in the world to memorize so it's very inefficient way of learning to memorize everything that is related to programming or any other things so the question is how do you actually use it to do what you want to do so what i recommend is when you come across a new thing such as a list data structure is just to have a look through the documentation and read it and see what's the possible things you can do and once you have got the idea of this, this possibility the next time when you need to use it inside your code you'll just remember it and google it and find the syntax and documentation and examples how can we implement it in your code you just need to memorize that this is possible using lists instead of that you should spend your time trying things out and try to get things to work instead now as i mentioned before we are learning lists over here to understand the iteration very well so that's why with this i'm ending this lecture over here with this lecture we have learned a general concepts about list from the next lecture we are going to start to learn about the iteration and we are going to use list in our iterations so see you in the next lecture now in this lecture i want to talk about the concept of loops things that have to happen over and over again it's obvious that computers are often used to automate repetitive tasks repeating identical or similar tasks without making error is something that computers do well and people do poorly because iteration is so common python provides several language features to make it easier sometimes you want to loop through a sort of things such as list of words lines in a file or list of numbers when we have a list of things to loop through we can construct a definite loop using for statement this is the first type of loop i want to introduce you which is called for loop and it can be used really easily in a combination with the list which we have learned in previous lesson and this is the reason i have explained list in this section even though it's type of data structure by using for loop like this we can go through each item in a list and perform some action with each individual item so the general syntax of for loop is like this first we are writing for keyword then the item this is the custom name that we are giving the list of items over here then in keyword then list of items then here in indented level we can perform any repetitive action on items over here now let's see how this is working in practice now let's say we have a list of vegetables like this so this is the name of list which is vegetable then in the list we have carrot broccoli and corn and if we want to access each item in this list individually and print out them one by one then we should use for loop so to use for loop first we start with for keyword so i'm going to write for keyword then we give a name to a single item so in this case we have a list of vegetables so for single item i can give a name of vegetable as i mentioned this is a custom name that we are giving so we can put anything that we want over here so in this case we call it vegetable then we use in keyword so this is a general syntax then finally we are going to give the name of the list that we want to loop through so in this case the name of list that we want to loop through is vegetables so i'm just going to copy it from here and pass it over here and then we cap it off with a column then 
after putting colon we hit enter and we go to the next line so as you see when we go to the next line the cursor comes to the indented level over here so whenever we put a colon and hit enter the next line of code always become the indented level so this means that whatever we are writing in this indented level is going to be inside this loop over here now inside this indentation level i'm going to go ahead and print the value of each vegetable variables over here now to do so i'm going to write print statement then inside print statement i'm going to write vegetable now notes over here that we are not writing vegetables name of list we are writing the, the name that we have provided over here now after writing it if i run our code you'll see that it's printing out the items inside list one by one so first it's printing out carrot which is the first item in the list then it's printing out broccoli which is the second item in the list then it's printing out corn which is the last item in the list now the important thing to realize here is that basically you can imagine that behind the scenes what this code is going to do is it's taking this list of vegetables and it's signing a variable name which is vegetable to the each of this item so the first time this runs vegetable is equal to carrot then it's run vegetable is equal to broccoli then it's run vegetable is equal to corn over here now to see how this is working we can just copy this code from here and open the tony editor and see how the steps are working over there so if i just pass it over here inside the tony editor and try to debug this by clicking the debug current script you'll see that first it's going to establish the vegetable strings over here now if i click step into it it will check all elements inside this vegetable list so it establishes all elements inside the list which are carrot broccoli and corn now then i'll continue to click step into it you'll see that on the right over here it's showing the variable name which is vegetable and the values over here so the first variable name over here is vegetables which holds the list of strings now if i continue to the loop it's going to loop through the list of vegetables and it's going to assign the variable name vegetable to each of items over here now if i click step into it you will see that first it's continuing to carrot so as you can see when it comes over here in the vegetable variable over here we have carrot now then it's going to print out carrot to the console so as you can see the carrot printed out to the console now if i click one more time it's going to continue to loop one more time because we have still elements in the vegetable list so as you can see in this case it's going to assign broccoli to vegetable variable over here now after doing so it's going to print out one more time variable which in which we have broccoli so it's going to print out broccoli to the console as you can see over here now if i click one more time you'll see that it's going to continue to the loop one more time so it's going to repeat all these tasks until we have finished all elements inside the vegetable list so as you can see if i click one more time variable value change to corn and it's going to print out corn to the console now after printing out you can see that all steps are completed because we have finished all elements inside vegetables list so as i mentioned it continues this until it prints all elements of this list to the console now as i mentioned loop allows us to execute the same line of code multiple times in this case we are executing print statement three times but our loop is not limited to just executing a single statement we don't just have to print out name of the item from this list we can execute a whole block of statements multiple times then we can do many things inside this loop over here at indentation level so let's say that in addition to print out vegetable i'm going to write another print statement and i'm not going to print only the vegetable name we can put something else over here to concatenate with the vegetable name so let's say instead of printing out vegetable name i'm just going to add some values over here now let's put pi for example over here now in this case if i run our code what will happen so let's run and see it so you can see that first is printing out vegetable then it continues to print out vegetable with the pi so as you can see here again it is printing out all elements of the list with the second line of code so this second line of code also is repeated three times so so first is printing out carrot from here then it's printing out carrot plus pi then it continues to print out broccoli then broccoli plus pi and corn and corn plus pi. now this is how we can implement a simple loop that loops through a list and assigns a variable name to each of items in the list in order and then inside for loop after the colon in indentation level we can do something with temporary variable for each of items over here now here i've been talking 
a lot about the concept of being inside loop versus outside of the loop. And this is really, really important. So whenever you see a colon over here in if statements or in loop statements, the indentation level becomes really, really important. Because if it is intended, this means that this part of code over here will be executed inside loop. So it might execute it until loop reached the end of the list over here. Now, for example, over here, instead of printing vegetable, if I print out vegetables, what will happen? So if I put vegetables over here and run our code, you will see that this list of vegetables will be printed out three times to the console. Now, if I just comment this part, for example, this two line of code over here and run our code, you will see that we have three elements in our vegetables and this print vegetables will be printed out to the console three times because we have three elements in our vegetables list over here. And the reason that's printing out vegetables three times is that it is indented level over here. Now, instead of inside loop, if I put it outside of loop, so I'm just going to uncomment this part from here and run our code, you'll see that in this case, first is executing the loop statement, which is printing out carrot, broccoli, and corn to the console. Then it's continuing to this part of code over here, which is printing out the whole list itself. Now, hopefully with these examples over here, you start to see how loops are really handy at executing repetitive instructions over and over again and getting the computer to save us time and energy. Now here, if you have difficulties understand how these loop statements are working, I advise you to copy this code to the Tony and check it step by step by debugging it and check how the execution is performed. So this is all for this lecture. So in this lecture, we have learned the first type of loop, which is for loops. And for loops are really handy when we are dealing with the list or other data structures. So see you in the next lecture. Now in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the updating variables. Now let's say we have a variable A like this, in which we have the number of one. Now, if I go ahead and print out the value of this A variable to the console, it's obvious that in this case, it's going to print out one to the console. Now, as you can see, it's printing out one to the console. Now, in the third line, if I change A values to two and print out one more time A to the console, you will see that in this case, we have updated the value of A and it's printed out to the console two. So in the third line, we have updated the value of A to two and then when we, when we print out A to the console, we see that in A we have two. Now, a common pattern in assignment statement is an assignment statement that updates a variable where new value of variable depends on old value. Now, in this case, if I write something like this, A is equal to A plus two, what will be the output of this print statement? Now, in this case, it's obvious that previous value of A is one. So in A, we will have one plus two, which is three. So if I run our code, you will see that in this case, it is three. So this means that we are getting the current value of A and adding two, then we are updating the current value of A to this value over here. Now, the reason why I'm talking about them here is that inside loops, we normally update the current values of variables with the values that depend on their old values. So as you can see over here, the old value is one. This new value of A is depend on the old value. So the common error over here is many people try to update the current value of variable with the value that does not exist. So this means that if I just delete this part of code from here and rerun our code, you will see that in this case, I have error. So we are trying to update a variable that does not exist. So that's why we are getting an error because, because Python evaluates the right side of this statement first, then it continues to the left side. So when it comes to the right side, it faces with the A and it shows that A is not defined over here. So this error is for this A, which is on the right side of this equal sign. So this means that before you can update a variable, first you have to initialize it, then we can update it with the current value. So this means that before updating the A, A's value, first I have to initialize it with the initial value. So, so normally before loops, we are setting it to zero and then we are updating it inside loop like this. So let's say we have a list like this. So I'm just going to put num is equal to one, two, three. Now, if I just, now if I loop through this list for instead of num, let's put nums over here, numbers. 
for num in nums if i just print out their value num you'll see that it's going to print out one one two three now in this case if i try to get the sum of these items over here what i'm going to do over here inside this loop i'm going to create a new variable and put s plus now so this means that this s variable depends on the previous value of s so first we are taking this one then we are going to add this one then we are going to add three over here now if i run our code you'll see that we are receiving error because we have not initialized s over here so because when this line of code is over here it's going to take s and we have not initialized s that's why it's giving error saying that s is not identical now before going to loop statement if i initialize s with zero because when we put num plus zero over here nothing will change so that's why we are initializing s to zero in case of multiplication we can initialize it with the one now in this case if i run our code and print out s to the console you will see that it's going to print out s three times because in the first run the value of s was zero then zero plus one is one is printing out this one then in the second run the value of s was one so s plus two is three is printing out three to the console then in the last run the value of s was three and three plus with the c3 will be six so total sum of these items over here is six now with this hopefully you have understood that whenever we are updating a variable that depends on the all values of this variable first we have to initialize this variable this is a common error that happens inside loops over here so that's why you have to be very careful about this Alright, when we are talking about functions, we have created a function like this, which checks if the password is valid password or not, based on their length. So this was an exercise and we have created a function like this. So this function takes one parameter. So based on this parameter, password parameter, we are checking that if the length is greater than 8, it means that this is valid password. If it is not greater than 8, it means that it's not a valid password. So if you run our code, you will see that in this case, this password is valid password now the question is if we have list of passwords like this and we want to check all these passwords one by one to see that if these passwords are valid or not to do so i'm just going to comment out this part so we can call this function which is password controller inside loop so this means that we can create a function and call a custom function that we have created inside any loop so we know that to loop through the list we are going to use for loop so first we are using for keyword so i'm just going to put alias over here which will be the password then we are going to put in keyword and we are going to loop through this password list now if i just print out this password to the console you'll see that it's just going to print out all passwords from this list to the console so we have four passwords over here so it's printing out all these passwords to the console now instead of printing out this one putting this one inside standard print function we can put it inside this password control so instead of print i'm putting password controller now to be able to see the result in the console we have to print out the output that comes from this password controller to print out the output that comes from the password controller i'm just going to create a new variable over here then assign the value that comes from this password controller then print out the password first then the result so based on this one we can see password and result next to each other now if i run our code you'll see that first password is square so this is false because the length of this password is less than eight then the second password is this one which is one two three four five six so this one also false because the length is less than eight and the next one is this one this one is true because the length is greater than eight and the next one is this this one also is false because the length is less than eight so this means that by calling this function inside this loop over here we can check all passwords inside this password list over here now with this we have learned that we can create any custom function by ourselves then we can use this function inside for loop over here now we are going to learn about while loops also so you will see that we can use functions inside while loops also so with this example we have understood that any function that we are creating we can use it inside loop over here in indentation level so hopefully everything is clear over here.
Now up to this point, we have only been using loops in association with lists. We have been looping through the list and getting hold of each of the items in the list and do something with it. So as you can see in this case, we were looping through the list called vegetables and printing out vegetable to the console. So we are holding the each vegetable inside this vegetable variable then printing out to the console like this. But we are not always going to be working with the list using for loops. Sometimes we might want to use a loop completely independent of list. Now let's say we have a real life question like this which asks the sum of integer numbers from 1 to 100. Instead of inserting them one by one then summing up them by looping through the list we have a more efficient way because it's really a headache to insert all numbers from 1 to 100 in a list one by one. And also the question might ask for summing integers from 1 to 1000. So this is almost impossible to insert them one by one to the list. So to sum, so to sum these numbers in an efficient way, first we have to learn about using loops with range function. Now the range function is something is really really helpful if you want to generate a range of numbers to loop through. And the syntax by using the range function inside loop will look like this. Here we still have got four and in keywords highlighted in blue. And instead of looping through the list, we define how our loop is going to work by creating a range. So in this case, I'm creating a range between A and B. Then I'm going to get hold of each number in that range inside this number variable and do something with this number. Now in this case, if I put for A 1 and for B 10, it's going to print out all numbers from 1 to 10, but not including the 10. Now, for example, I'm just going to comment this part. So if I write a loop with range from 1 to 10, it's going to be like this. For number in, we're going to put range. So I'm just going to put from 1 to 10. Then I'm going to print out that number to the console. Now, if I run our code, you'll see that it's going to print out numbers from 1 to 9. So 10 is not included over here. So if you want to get numbers from 1 to 10, you have to put over here 11. So as you can see, in this case, last number is 10. So when you are using range function, the second parameter over here, which shows the end of the range, is not included. So you have to always add 1 by over here. Now, by default, we'll step through all the numbers from start to end and it will increase by one. But if you want to increase by any other number, then you have to add another comma over here and provide number. Now in this case, if I run our code, you will see that in this case, it's starting from one, then plus two, then plus two, then plus two, and then plus two. So the increase rate over here is by two. So if I put three over here, for example, it's going to run one, four, seven, and 10. So as you can see, it's increased by three. Now this is how range function work. Now let's, now let's come back to problem that I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson. So how can we add up all numbers from one to 10 using code? So well, it's going to involve for loop over here and it's going to involve range function. Now I'm just going to delete this part and for printing out the numbers from one to 100, I'm going to put 101. So if I run our code, you will see that it's printing out all numbers from one to 100. Now then we have to sum up these numbers over here. Now to sum up these numbers over here, as I mentioned before, we need to use accumulator. So here I'm going to declare a new variable, which will be the total. So I'm going to initialize it to zero because when we are summing up them, we are going to add with the zero. Now then inside this loop over here, in indented level, I'm going to put total plus equal number. So with this, we are adding looped numbers to this total over here. Now at the end, we can print out total to the console. So here outside of the loop, I'm going to put total print total. Now if I put print inside this loop over here, it's going to print out the total in each step. Now let's run our code. You'll see that in this case, the sum of the numbers from one to 100 is 5,050. Now to see the details, how this is calculated, if I just select this print statement and hit tab and put this inside this loop over here in indented level and run our code, you will see that in each step it's calculating the sum. So first it starts from the one, one plus zero is one, then one plus two is three. So it's called continuing like this until end and at the end we have 5050 over here. 
Now with this, by using range function over here, we have successfully calculated the sum of numbers from 1 to 100. Now let's head over to the next lesson and try a complete challenge using range function to see if you manage to internalize and understand everything we talked about in this lesson. So for all of that and more, I'll see you there. All right, guys, in this lecture, I want to talk about while loop, the loop that will continue going while a particular condition is true. Real life example for while loop can be a car with full tank of fuel. So while the fuel tank is not empty, car will work. Otherwise, it will not go because the fuel tank is empty. So let's compare this against the for loop that we have seen before. So we have two kind of for loops. The first one is where we are looping through the list of items and do something with each item in this list over here. And the other one is using range function where we create a range between A and B and we use number in that range to do something. So in this case, we are just printing out this number to the console. The while loop looks like this. And in this case, while a particular condition is true, then we go inside the loop and we do something repeatedly. And it's only when the something becomes false then the loop stops. So let's look at what the code look like in real life example. So here I have heard one challenge that you did previously. And for this, we created for loop in order to get our robot to jump over this hurdle six times to get the final destination. Now we could also do the same thing by using while loop. And this is how we will do it. So here, the first thing that we are going to do, we are going to create a variable in which we are going to save the number of hurdles. So number of hurdles. So we know that if you count the number of hurdles, we have six number of hurdles. So I'm going to assign six to these hurdles, number of hurdles variable. And then we use a while loop to loop through these hurdles until the number of hurdles reach zero. So this means that I'm just going to delete this for loop from here and I'm going to write our while loop like this. So it's going to be like this. While number of hurdles is greater than zero, in this case, we are going to call jump function inside this while loop. Then this means that we are doing something inside this loop. Well, in this case, what we need to do is to perform jump function. Now after jump, before going back to the this while loop over here, we have to decrease the number of hurdles. So number of hurdles will be decreased by one in each step. So I'm going to put minus equal sign and one. And in order to better visualize what's happening here, I'm also going to add a print statement to print the variable to the console after making it minus one. So I'm just going to put print statement over here, number of hurdles. Then let's go and step through this one. So first we are defining the number of hurdles. Then we are continuing to the number of hurdles loop. So while the number of hurdles is greater than zero, we are continuing there. So then it continues to the jump function. So it's going to jump over the hurdle. Then after reaching it, it will continue to do this part. After finishing jump function, as you can see, it's jumped from the first hurdle over here. It continues to the number of hurdles. So it's going to decrease the number of hurdles. Then it's going to print out number of hurdles to the console. So as you can see, it's printing out over here. So I'm just going to put it over here to see it very clearly. So in this case, the number of hurdles become five. First, it was six from the first loop. It becomes five. So this means that we have five hurdles left over here. Now, if I continue to click on this one more time and reach to the number of hurdles and minus one, in this case, you will see that in the next step, it's four. And if I continue one more time to jump, when we reach the number of hurdles, it's going to be three and it continues like this. And when we reach the next one, it's going to be two. Then one more time, we, when we continue this, it's going to be one. Then one more time, it's going to jump. So in this case, you will see that number of hurdles will become zero. So after reaching zero, it stops over here because in this case, the loop stops over here because number of hurdles is not any more greater than zero. So this part of code becomes false. So the loop stops over here. So our robot reached to the final destination. Now, as you can see, this loop continues until the number of hurdles reached to the zero. So when the number of hurdles reached to zero, 
This, as I mentioned, this condition becomes false. So we exit out of loop and we end our program over here. Now, this is how while loop works in real life example. Now, the syntax for the while loop looks like this. First, we have while keyword over here. Then we have some sort of condition that we are going to test. So previously we saw that it was number of the hurdles being greater than zero. And whenever this condition is true, then it's going to look inside the while loop at indented level. Now we are performing these instructions inside while loop over and over again. And finally, when it gets the end of the while loop, it becomes back to the beginning and test this condition again. And if this is still true, if this condition is still true, then it's going to go through and loop until this condition becomes false, at which point it ends and exists the while loop. You can also read the while statement as if it were English. It means while the number of hurdles is greater than zero, jump, then reduce the number of hurdles by one, and finally display the values of hurdles. So as you can see, we can read it as it were in English. More formally, here is the flow of execution for a while statement. First, we are evaluating the condition yielding true or false. Then if the condition is false, we are exiting the while statement and continue to execution of the next statement. If the condition is true, we are executing the body that we have inside while loop. Here you need to take into account that the body of loop should change the value of one or more variables so that eventually the condition becomes false and loop terminates. If there is no iteration variable, the loop will repeat forever and resulting in an infinite loop. And one of the things you might be wondering right now is that we have learned about for loop and we have learned about while loop. And if I can use both of them, why will I choose one over another? When would I use a for loop and when would I use a while loop? What I will tend to say is that for loops are really great when you iterate over something and when you do something with each thing that you are iterating over. For example, if you are iterating through a list, you are saying for each item in our list of items, we can do anything with these items over here. For instance, it can be just simply print out items to the console. But here the same thing cannot be done very easily using while loop. Now similarly, we can use range function inside for loop. For range from A to B, we can print all numbers to the console over here. Now you want to be using a while loop when you don't really care what number in a sequence you are in and which item you are iterating through in a list and you just simply want to carry out some sort of functionality many many times until some sort of condition that you set. And this is also a good point to mention that while loops are a little bit more dangerous than the for loops because in for loops you are setting ahead of time how many times something is going to run. It's going to stop once it's reached the end of list of the items in this case. But for while loop, it will continue running until this particular condition that we set over here becomes false. If you have some sort of condition that actually never become false, well, your while loop becomes something that is known as infinite loop. Now, let's say we have a while loop tested while 4 is greater than 2. Then we are doing this, then we do this, and then we do this. So we know that 4 is always greater than 2. So this means that this is an infinite loop. So this condition will never become false. So our loop will run infinitely. Now, every single programmer at some point in their lives will create an infinite loop. Don't worry about that. When you create an infinite loop, you just need to quit the program and restart it and try to prevent this happening in the future. Now, let's say we have a loop like this. So while 4 is greater than 2, we are printing out 1 to the console. If I run this, you will see that it's going to run infinitely. So all you have to do in this case, you just need to close the program and stop this over here. So in this case, we can just click Ctrl C to interrupt this program running infinitely. Now, very often I find that it's really helpful when you don't know why you are getting an infinite loop to simply just print out this condition to the console over here inside loop. So if I just print out for greater than two, then put the statement over here and run our code, you'll see that every time it's printing out true to the console. So this means that our condition will never become false. So this will run infinitely over here. So by printing out condition inside loop, you can figure out why you are getting infinite loop over here. Now from here, you can easily see that it never becomes false. Now in the next lesson, I've got more exercise coming up for you, which are related to while loop. So by doing these real life exercises, you'll understand while loop very well. So see you in the next lecture. Now in this lecture, we are going to learn about continue and break.
So we are going to use continue and break keywords inside loop over here. Now, sometimes when you are in an iteration of a loop, you want to finish the current iteration and immediately jump to the next iteration. In that case, you can use continue statement to skip to the next iteration without finishing the body of loop for the current iteration. Continue statement is used to skip the rest of code inside the loop for current iteration only. Loop does not terminate, but it continues on with next direction. The general syntax of continue statement in for loop will be like this. So here we have a for loop like this. So we are looping through the list of items and we are doing something to each item over here inside this loop over here. So if some condition met over here, we are going to put continue. Then we do another thing inside this loop over here. So the question is, when the execution reaches to its continue statement, what will happen? So in this case, our execution will go back to the next iteration over here. So this means that if the condition is met, this part of code, which is after this condition, will not be executed. So in this case, we are going to skip this part of code over here. So the logic behind the continue statement is that whenever a condition meets, it's going to skip the rest of code inside the loop for the current iteration, then it's going to continue to the next iteration. Now the syntax of continue statement for while loop is similar. So in this case, while something is true, we are doing something repeatedly. Then over here, if the condition is met, we are continuing, then we are doing some other thing inside while loop over here. So if this condition met over here, the execution will go to this part. So this means that if condition is met, this part of code do something inside while loop will be skipped. So the rest of code after this if condition over here will be skipped and our loop will continue to the next iteration. So here you need to take into account that the loop does not terminate, it's just continuing to the next iteration. It's just skipping the current iteration and continuing to the next iteration. Now let's see how this is working in practice. So let's say we want to write something printing all numbers from 1 to 10 except 5. So how can we print that? So we know that we can print out all numbers from 1 to 10 by using for loop like this. So I'm going to use for loop with range function. So for num in range starting from 1 till 11 because we want to print out 10 as well. So we have to include 11 over here. 11 will not be included in our print statement. So if I just print num and run our code, you'll see that it's just going to print out all numbers from 1 to 10. But here the question is when we reach 5 over here, we have to skip it. So how can we do that? We can do it by using continuous statement. So if num is equal to 5, we're just going to put continue. So this means that when the number reaches 5, it's going to skip this part of code and continue to the next iteration. So in this case, if I just clear this and run our code, you'll see that first is printing out 1, 2, 3, 4. When it reaches 5, it's continuing to the next iteration, which is 6. So we are skipping 5 over here. Now we can write same code inside while loop like this. So I'm just going to delete this part. So first I'm just going to create a num variable. It's going to equal to 11. Then we can write while loop like this. While num is greater than zero. In this case, I'm going to put num minus one. In each station, we are going to decrease number by one. Then we are going to check that if num is equal to five. So in this case, I'm just going to put continue. Otherwise, we are going to print out num to the console. So if I just clear and run our code, you'll see that in this case, it's printing the numbers from 10, 9, 8, 7, then when it reaches 5 over here, it skip this number over here. So that's how continuous statement works inside the loop. Now we know that when we use for loop, it iterates over a list or range of numbers until it reaches the end. And similarly, while loop iterates over a block of code until the test expression is false. But sometimes we wish to terminate the current iteration or even the whole loop without checking the test expression. Now we have learned that if we want to terminate the current iteration, in this case, we use continue keyword. But the question is, how can we terminate whole loop and continue to the code that is located outside of the loop over here? Now for these cases, we use break keyword. Now the syntax of the break keyword for for loop is going to be like this. 
so here you see that one more time we are looping through the list of items and we are doing something with the each item over here so we have a condition inside this loop like this if this condition is met we are going to put break over here now the question is after break statement which part of code will be executed so we have learned that break statement is responsible for terminating the whole loop so in this case if this condition is met our execution will continue to this part over here so the rest of items over here will not be looped and we are not going to do anything with the rest of items it's just going to continue to the outside of loop and whatever we have outside of loop is going to execute this part of code now similarly the break syntax for while loop will be like this so here again if some condition is true we are doing something repeatedly if this condition is met we are going to put break so this means that our loop over here will be terminated and the execution will continue to this part of outside of while loop so we, whatever we have in the outside of the while loop we are going to continue to execute that part now if you look at this one in the practice so here if i just write for loop like this the one that we have written before num in range between 1 and 11 so in this case we have written that if num is, is equal to 5 continue otherwise you are printing out numbers to the console so if i run it you will see that it was keeping 5 over here now the question is now the question is instead of continue over here if i put break what will happen so this means that it's going to stop execution when it reaches 5 so it's just going to print out all numbers from 1 to 4 so when it reaches 5 over here and the loop execution terminates over here now after loop if i put something the end and run our code you will see that after printing out 4 it continues over here when it reaches 5 it continues the execution part over here which says the end so with break statement we can terminate our loop and continue to outside of loop over here so with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture we have explained continue and break statements inside loops so hopefully everything is clear about them All right, guys, welcome back to our brand new section of Python for Everyone course. So in this section, we are going to learn about strings. So here we'll concentrate on string operations, string methods, parsing string, string formatting, and escape sequence. So we will discuss strings in detail, and we are going to do lots of exercises that are related to strings. Now, after finishing this section, we are going to implement everything that we have learned over here in a real life project. So the project name will be string formatting. So we need to create over here program which prints out student names and their score as shown below. So here student names and scores will be given in the list. So we are going to format it to be shown like this way. So as you can see, we have a name column, then we have score column, and we have taken all names and scores from these names and scores list. So this means that we are going to implement everything that we have learned in this section in this real life project. So once you are ready, head over to the next lesson to get started. Till now, we have been using strings in our programs. So in this section, we will discuss more about strings. Basically, a string is a sequence of characters. A character is a symbol. For example, in English language, we have 26 characters. Computers do not deal with the characters. They deal with numbers. So these are binary numbers. So in the first section of this course, we have discussed that computer recognize these characters as numbers like these binary numbers. Even though you might see characters on screen, internally it's stored and manipulated as a combination of zeros and ones. Strings can be created by enclosing characters inside single or double quotes. Even sometimes triple quotes can be used in Python, but generally multi-line strings and doc strings. So as I mentioned, till now we have used strings in our programs. So let me create a variable like this and assign a string to it. So my name is Elshad. So we have created a string with double quotes over here. So we can even create it by using single quote, as we mentioned. So this is how we are creating a string in Python. So when we are talking about list, we have mentioned that list use indexes for accessing its elements. So in string also, we can use indexes to access any character over here. So let's say I have a string like this. So I have created a variable fruit 
then assign apple to this variable so in this case apple is a string so we can access the characters of this apple string by using indexes so if i write something like this so i'm just going to put letter is equal to fruit with the index of one so what will happen if i just print out this letter to the console so as you can see it's printing out p so this is a second letter in our string but we have put one index over here for most people the first letter of apple is a not p that is printed over here so as we mentioned in case of list the index in the case of string also is an offset from the beginning of the string and the offset of first letter is zero so in this case a is the zeroth element then p is the first element and then second p is the third element well in this case b is right at the beginning of the string so it has offset or shift of zero but a is shifted from the beginning by one so the index of a will be one so we can call it offset so the offset of a from beginning is one then the second a shifted from beginning by three so this is located at the index of three then it kind of makes more sense that the first item in the string is at the beginning of the string so it has no offset that's why the index starts from zero in strings as well you can use any expression including variables and operators as an index but the value of index has to be an integer so instead of one as an index we can put a variable so i'm just going to create a variable which is a is equal to for example two so instead of one over here if i put two what will happen so if i run our code you will see that in this case it's also printing p so this is the second p that's coming from out of this index so let me just put three and rerun our code you see that in this case it is going to print out l a is located at the index of zero then first p located at the index of one then second p is located at the index of two then l is located at the index of three so we can use an expression inside index over here but instead of a over here if i put for example 1.5 and run our code you will see that python will raise error saying that string indexes must be integers so we cannot put any float number over here so the string index must be integer and in our previous lectures we have learned that we can use len function to print out the length of string so if i just run len function and print out the value from the len function to the console in this case you will see that it's going to print out five so the number of letters in this apple string over here is five so let's try for for example another fruit so i'm just going to put instead of apple over here banana in rerun our code you'll see that in this case the number of characters in this string over here is six so many people use this length of strings to get the last letter in the string so first instead of printing it to the console i can create a variable for example l variable which which is length is equal to length of fruit then instead of printing this length to the console you might be tempted to write something like this so you can just print out fruit with the index of l so in this case l is six so if i try to run this code you will see that we have an error saying that string index out of range now here i want you to pause the video and think what might cause this error over here now hopefully you have come with your answer now if you haven't let's debug this code step by step so what i'm going to do i'm just going to print out l to the console to see the length of the fruit for simplicity i'm just going to comment out this part so you'll see that this is six so let's count that if we have an index of six over here so b is located at the index of zero then a is located at the index of one then n is located at the index of two then a is located at at the index of three then n is located at the index of four then the last a is located at the index of five so here you can see that we don't have any element with six index so that's why python raises error saying that string index out of range so we don't have sixth index over here. so the length of string is six but at the sixth index we don't have any element over here now to be able to use len function to access the last character in the this fruit string over here all we have to do we can put length minus one inside brackets so in this case if i read on our code you will see that it's just going to print out banana which is the last page so let me put another string over here for example apple and read on our code you will see that the last string is e now in case of banana it was printing out a which is the last a over here 
Now, alternatively, you can use negative indices, which count backward from the end of the string. So here, instead of L minus 1, if I put just minus 1, it's going to print out the last character in this string over here. So this is also the last A in our string. So in this case, the last letters index will be minus 1. Then it continues backward like this, minus 2, mi minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, and minus 6. So as you can see, we don't have minus 0 over here. Because in math, we don't have minus 0. So we have only 0. That's why it starts from 0. But when you come backward, it starts from minus 1 and come until the length of string. So here, interestingly, if you want to access first element, instead of 1, you can put something like this. We are calculating the length of the fruit. Then we are putting minus L over here. And run our code, you will see that it's printing out B, which is first element. This is because we don't have minus 0 in math. So it starts from minus 1 and it continues until minus 6 over here, which is the length of array. We can even go further access a range of items in a string by using slice operator. So the slice operator in case of indexing is column. So I'm just going to delete this part of code from here. Let's create a new string. So I'm going to put it new string is equal to let's put hello python. So if I use slicing operator, I'm just going to call it inside print statement to be able to see the output in the console. So I can put something like this. So to be able to see the range, so I'll put first index, which is zero. It's going to start from zero and it will continue until fifth element over here. So if I put slicing operate, we are going to able to see only the specific range of letters here. So if I run our code, you will see that it's printing out only to the console hello. So H is located at the index of zero. So it starts from zero, including zero. So we have put zero over here. Then is the second element, which is located at first index. Then L is the second index then the second l is the third index and the o is located at fourth index so as you can see we have put five over here the, but fifth element is not included so you might be interested that this is a space over here maybe it's because of space so i'm just going to delete space return our code you will see that in this case it's just printing out hello as well so the last index is not included the first index is included so instead of first index if i just delete first index and skip the first index put column and the last index run our code you will see that by default it is taking first index so it's starting from the first index so we can do the same thing for example for the second index also so if i delete the say second index and leave it empty and run our code you will see that in this case it starts from the first index so it's skipping the zeroth index over here and it continues until the length of the string so it's printing out the rest characters to the console so if we skip the first index, it starts from zero. If we skip the last index, it continues until the last element in this string over here. For example, if I want to extract only Python from this string, we can put six and leave the second index empty, skip it. So run our code, you will see that it's extracting only this part of string to the console. So the operator returns the part of the string from the end character to the end character, including the first, but excluding the last. Now you might be interested, what if I skip both indexes over here? So if I delete six and leave only colon over here, what will happen? If I run our code, you will see that it's just printing all strings to the console. So we don't have differences between printing out the string itself or putting slicing operator. So both of them will print out the string itself to the console. So this is another interesting moment you might be interested. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have learned how can we do string manipulations in Python. So see you in the next lecture. Now in this lecture, we will talk about string traversal. So what is traversing a given string? So traversing means visiting all characters of the string over here. Now let's say we have a string like this. So we have created a fruit variable and we have assigned a string to this fruit variable. So string traversal means that we are going to visit all characters of this string one by one. So it's going to happen like this. First we are visiting B, then we are visiting A, then we are visiting N, then we are visiting this A over here, then N, then at the end A. A lot of computations involve processing of a string one character at a time. Often they start at the beginning 
and select each character in turn, do something with it, and continue until the end. This pattern of processing is called traversal in programming. One way to write a traversal is with a for loop. To see it in practice, I'm going to create a variable over here is equal to fruit variable. Let's in this case put orange. So traversing this string here means that we are going to visit all characters one by one and print out them to the console. So to visit all characters, so here again we are going to use in operator with for loop. So for char in fruit, so I'm going to put the name of fruit. So we have we have said that we have saved the orange in this fruit over here. So I'm going to put fruit over here. So it's obvious that after that in for loop we are putting column. Now if I hit enter, it's going to be in indentation level. So what I'm going to do, I will just print out char. Now if I run our program, you will see that all characters of this string are visited one by one. So first we have visited O, then R, then A, then N, then G, then E. So this is one way of traversing a string. So you will use these traversals in your programming in the future. For example, when you are dealing for counting the number of characters in a string or summing the digits of any given number by traversing one by one, and you can use in some other examples. Now you might be interested that if this is the only way we can write our traversal, so the answer is no. We have another way to write a traversal, and it's obvious that we can write it with while loop. So to be able to traverse this fruit string here, we need to write while loop. Now to use the condition inside while loop, as we said, we are going to start from the first element. So the index of the first element is zero. So I'm going to create an index over here and set it to zero. Then I'm going to write while loop like this. While this index is less than length of fruit, so I'm going to put length function. So we know that in this case, the length of this fruit is six. So it's going to continue until the six. So that's why we are putting less than. If we put less than equal, it's going to raise index error because with the sixth index, we don't have character here. So it starts from zero, it will continue until fifth index. Now then, we are going to create a letter variable over here and assign character to this variable over here with the index of index. Then we can easily print out this letter to the console. So print out means that we are visiting this letter. Then before closing this while loop here, we need to increase the index by one. Otherwise, we will have infinite loop. So I'm going to increase by one. So it will be increased until it reaches the len minus one, because here we have put less than len of fruit. So each time through the loop, the next character in the string is assigned to this variable, letter variable, and loop continues until no characters left. The loop condition is index is less than len of fruit. So as I mentioned, when the index is equal to the length of string, this condition will be false, and the body of this loop will not be executed. So the last character accessed is the one, which is len of fruit minus one. So in this case, len of fruit is six. So if we count it, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the last character will be located at the index of five. Now, if I run this loop, you will see that we will have the same output that we had before. So here we have error. So it says that a CR object is not callable. So this means that instead of bracket over here, I need to put square bracket. So I have used a CR object to be acted like function by mistakely because I have put over here parentheses. So if you change it to the square parentheses and rerun your code, you will see that it's working the way that it worked. So first we are visiting O, then we are visiting R, then A, N, G, E. So we have this orange. So if I put instead of orange over here, different fruit, for example, apple, rerun our code, you will see that it starts from A and continues until E. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, I have explained how can we traverse through string and traversal means that we are visiting each character of string over here. Now in the upcoming lectures, we are going to solve exercises that are related to string traversal. So see you in the next lectures. Now in this lecture, we are going to look at string operations. Now we can perform various operations on strings. Here I'm just going to look at uh, some of them. But in upcoming lectures, we are going to cover almost everything about the strings and reach the advanced level of this course. Now here, till now, in our programs, we have used plus sign for adding, for example, integers. So in this case, if I put, for example, 2 plus print 2 plus 3, 
and run our code, you will see that it's going to print out five. So plus sign is addition operator between the integers. And we have learned that we can use plus sign with the strings also. So let's say I have a str string one, which is hello. And the second one, let's create str two, which is world. So if I just print out the sum of these two strings plus str two, you'll see that it's going to concatenate them together. So plus sign in strings used to concatenate them together. So for integers, we are using as addition operator, but here it is used for concatenating them. So we have used these operators before. Now there are some other operators that can be used with strings. Now the first one is in operator. So we can test if a substring exists within a string or not using keyword in. The word in is a Boolean operator that takes two strings and returns true if the first appears as a substring of second. So let's clarify this. So let's say we have created a string like this. So I want to check that if, for example, L exists in this hello over here. So we can do it by using in operator. So I can write it like this, L character in str1. So if this is going to return true, it means that L exists in this str over here. Otherwise, if it is returning false, it means that it does not exist. So I'm just going to print out output to the console by using in operator. So you can see that in this case, it's returning true because we have L in this hello word over here. Now, instead of L, if I put A and run our code, you will see that in this case, it's returning false. So by using in operator, we can check that if any given character is exist in this string over here or not. Or we can put instead of character over here, substring. So let's put, for example, hello. So if I run our code, you will see that in this case, it's returning true because hello exists over here. So by using in operator, we can easily find any substring inside given string. So this is very useful, especially when you are looking for a substring inside the long strings in Python. Now the next operator is string comparison. So we have learned about the comparison operators, equal sign, bigger sign, and less sign. We have used them with the numbers, so you need to take into account that it's, they are working with the string as well. Now the first sign is equal sign. So we have used this one also. So we can write it like this. So I'm just going to create new string and I'm going to ask for a string from a user. Then I'm going to check that if this string is the string that we are looking for or not. So we can write it like this. If new string is equal to, so this is equal operator. For example, let's say hello. In this case, I'm just going to print out saying that the word is correct. So this means that this word is equal to the word that we have inputted over here. Now, if I run our code, so instead of hello, let's say hi, you see that it's not going to print out anything, but instead of hi over here, if I say hello, it's going to print out correct. So this means that double equal sign together can be used as equal operator for comparing the strings. Now we know that there are other operators like less or bigger. So in this case, if you put, for example, less over here, it's going to put the words in alphabetical order. So in this case, I can put it like this. If my new string is less than this string over here, it means that this new string comes before this word over here. So we can print out it by using a string. So we can put like this, your word, which is the word that we are going to insert new string comes before hello. So let's run our code. So instead of hello, I'm just going to put, for example, apple. So it's obvious that apple in alphabetical order starts with A, comes before hello. Now, if I just put over here world, you'll see that it's not going to print out anything because world comes after the hello in the alphabetical order. That's why it's not printing out anything to the console. Now, if I write it something like this, a leaf new string is greater than the hello and print out the output like this, I'm going to put after over here. Now rerun our code. Let me put world again. You'll see that. So I need to change this part also, which has to be greater than. So let me put world again. You'll see that in this case it says that your word world comes after hello. So it's obvious that it's coming after hello. Now interesting moment over here is if I just run it and put with uppercase world, you'll see that it says that your word world comes before hello. So this is because 
Python does not handle uppercase and lowercase the same way that people do. All uppercase letters come before all lowercase. So that's why if I put in the uppercase row, it comes before hello. So because uppercases comes first, then the lowercases. So a common way to address this problem is to convert string to a standard format, such as lowercase or uppercase before performing any comparison. So whenever we are comparing two strings by using comparison operator, we have to convert them to all of them to uppercase or all of them to lowercase. Now, sometimes people tend to use assignment operator to change the strings. So let's say we have a new string like this. So one more time, I'm just going to put over here, hello world. So we know that by using string indexing, we can access the any character inside this string over here. So we can just print out, for example, new string with the index of zero, the first letter to the console. Sometimes people tend to use this indexing with assignment statements to change the, for example, first letter over here. Now, if I write something like this, new string with index of zero is equal to, for example, instead of hello, let's put P, which is going to be pillow over here. Now run our code. You'll see that Python raised error saying that str object does not support this item assignment. So the reason for this error is that strings are immutable, which means that you cannot change an existing string. So the object in this case is the string and the item is the character that you are trying to assign. For now, an object is the same thing as a value, but we will refine that definition later. And an item is a, one of the values in the sequence over here. Now you might be interested if the strings are immutable, so we cannot change it. So how can we, for example, replace this letter over here with the P? So there's an alternative way. The best way you can do it is to create a new string, which is a variation on the original. So we can do it like this. So it's obvious that, let me just copy it from here and pass it over here as one. We can create it with slicing operator. So I'm going to access this new string. So we can put start from the first index by skipping the first letter and put it like this. So if I just print out this new string over here that we created, you will see that the first letter is, so I'm just going to delete this part. So our new string is like this. So it is a low world. So this means that if I want to replace the first letter, instead of assigning to the place of this character, we can put a new character over here by, by using concatenation operator. So if I put it like this, you will see that in this case, our string changed to hello world, but we have not done anything to this original string because it's going to stay in its place. So if I just going to print out the original string, you will see that it's not modified, but we have created a new string with the new result like this. So this is our new string. So this is the old one. So as you can see, the old one is not changed. So by using concatenation and slicing operator, we can create a new string based on the old string but the modification will not affect the old string over here. Now, these are the some operations that we can perform on string. So hopefully you have initial idea of about string operation. So see you in the next lecture. Now in this video, we are going to talk about string methods. Now, there are lots of string methods in the Python documentation. We are not going to cover all of them. Here, I'm just going to show you how can we use the method that we need and how can we find them. Now, let's say we have a string like this. So I'm just going to create a string, which is called my name. So I'm going to put my name to this variable over here. So my name is Elshad. So we have created this variable over here and assigned a name to it. Now we have learned that if we want to check the type of this variable, we can use type function. So if I put type and put the variable inside these brackets over here and print out the value to the console, you can see that it's printing out the type of this variable to the console like this. So this is type of str, which is string. Now, apart from the type function, there's another function which is called dir. So by using this function, we can get the list of the methods that is available for this object that we created over here. Now you might be interested, before we were telling this variable, now we are telling it object. So I'm going to discuss the objects in our upcoming lectures when we are talking about object-oriented programming. So here you just need to know that uh, the strings that we are creating over here is objects. So to see the methods of the objects, we can use the RR function. 
So I'm going to put it something like this. So if I put dir inside, I'm going to put the variable that I created over here. And one more time, I'm just going to print out the result that comes from this method to the console to see the list of the methods that's available for this object that we created over here. So as you can see, after running this code, there are lots of methods that are exist for this object over here. Now you might be interested why we are calling them methods, not functions. Now here, you just need to know that methods are the functions that are built into the object and available for any, any instance of the object. So for example, let's say we have a method like this capitalized. So if you want to get the information about this method, you're going to use help function. So here we can put something like this, help capitalize. So here it, it is the method of the str object. So that's why I need to put str in front of this capitalize over here. Now if I run our code, you see that this help function prints out the description of this method to the console. So it says that return a capitalized version of a string. More specifically, make the first letter character move uppercase and the rest of lowercase. So by using help function, we can get information about any method that we are getting by using the RR function. So the full list of the string methods can be found in this link in the Python documentation. I'm going to put the link in the description of this lecture. So here, there are lots of functions and descriptions over here. Now, the thing is, how can we use this function? So we have said that we have created a variable like this. So let's see how can we use, for example, capitalize function for this string that we created over here. Now to call method of this variable, my name, all I have to do, I need to put name dot, then I can put the method name. So if I put capitalize, you see that Replit offers it to me. So if I just click enter and put parentheses over here, it's just going to call this method over here. So after doing so, if I just run our code, you'll see that nothing is changed over here because we have not printed it out to the console. But here, uh, our word is with capitalized, so I'm just going to change it to small letter. So I'm going to print out the result to the console like this. So if I run it, you'll see that before it was like this, now it's changed the, now it's changed the name variable like this. So first letter becomes the capitalized. Now, if I print out the variable itself to the console, you will see that it has not changed the variable. This function is just returning the new string, but it's not touching the old string over here. So as you can see, calling a function is different than the calling method. When we are calling function, we are just putting the function name, for example, print function, and inside parentheses, we are providing the uh, any parameter that we have. But in case of methods, we are calling method by using their objects. So first we need to put the object name, then dot, then method name. So here we might have arguments. So in this case, in capitalized function, we don't have any argument. That's why we have just let it, left it empty. Now let's look at another function. So let's say uh, we are going to use another function which converts this name to all of them to uppercase. Now in this case, we can use upper function. So as you can see, if I just before using this upper function over here, call help function. So I'm just going to put str.upper because this is the type of string. So we have to put str.upper and run our code. So as you can see, we have an error over here because we have provided parentheses over here. So when you are calling uh, for a description of the method, you don't have to provide the parentheses over here. All you just need to do, you have to put the object type and then its method. So now if I run our code, you see that it says that return a copy of string converted to uppercase. Now let's see how it's going to return for this string that we created over here. So I'm just going to delete this part and put my name dot upper. So if I just come on this function, it's going to load the description. And in the description, we can see that return a copy of string converted to uppercase. I'm going to assign it to the new variable and then print out to the console. So I'm just going to put my name one is equal to this one. Then let's just print out my name one to the console to see that how this is working. Now, if I run our code, you see that it converted all characters from this my name string into uppercase. Now, similarly, we can use lower function over here to convert it lower. So let me just put it uh, Elshad Karimov like this. Let's run our code. You see that in this case, it has converted everything to the small cases. Now in Python, a method call is called invocation. So in this case, we will say that we are invoking lower on the 
third over here. So which is my name on the my name over here. So for example, there's another string method named find search for the position of one string within another. So in this case, when we call this method, we are going to say that we invoke find on the string and pass letter that we are looking for as a parameter. So in this case, we have seen that in these methods, we have not passed in a parameter. So let's say I'm going to use a method which needs a parameter. So in this case, I'm going to use find method. So find method finds any substring inside given string over here. So in this case, it's going to return the index. So I'm going to put index find, for example, inside this function, let's find A. Now, after finding it, let's print out to the console to see how this is working. Now, if I run our code, you see that it's returning 4. So this means that it has found A at the index of 4. So this is 0th index, then the 1st, then 2nd, then 3rd, then 4th. As you can see, A is located at the 4th index over here. So whenever we are calling a method which has a parameter, so here we are going to put the argument inside these parentheses over here. Now here, if you go to the description of to this function, you can see that it takes more than parameter. Actually, we can put substring, then start position, then end position. So after A, if I put, for example, 5 and run our code, you'll see that in this case, it's returning minus. So this means that it couldn't find the A in this string over here because we are starting from D, from the fifth index. This second argument states that we are starting from the fifth index and looking inside this string and it couldn't find lowercase a over here. Now, instead of this uppercase a, if I put lowercase read on our code, you will see that the output is changed. So in this case, the index is eight. So it has found a at the index of eight. So let's continue to another method. So here I'm just going to provide another uh, most used method. So this is responsible to remove white spaces, tabs or new lines from the beginning and end of the string. So this method is called street method. So let's say, for example, I'm just going to create a line variable like this. So here I'm just going to put hello world with the space. So let's say if we want to remove the empty spaces or tab and new lines from beginning and end of this string, we can call the strip function of this line over here. So I'm just going to put it like this strip. I'm going to assign it to new variable. Then here again, I'm going to print out the value to the console to see the output very clearly. Now, if I run our code, you see that. Let me just print out the original string as well to see the differences. So originally it was line, now it is new line. So as you can see, initially we have spaces over here at the beginning, at the end. And by calling strip method, we are removing the spaces. Now, this is another useful method, especially when you are parsing the strings and when you want to delete the spaces or new lines from the end and beginning of the string. So with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, I have shown you few methods of the strings and I showed you how can you find the description about the, these methods and how can you use them. Now, it's not possible to cover all methods of the strings in this lecture. I highly recommend you whenever you need any string method, you are just searching for it and read from the documentation and use it because it's not possible to remember all methods. All you have to do is to use the DRR function and find out the methods. And by using help function, you can get the description of methods and how to implement them. So hopefully everything is clear about string methods. So see you in the next lecture. Now in this lecture, we will talk about string parsing. Now what exactly is string parsing? Now here, parsing means we want to look into a string and find the substring. Of course, we are going to use string methods for parsing. And here, you can use more than one method combination to parse the string. For example, if you were presented a series of lines formatted as follows. So we have created a variable over here and assigned this string to this variable over here. So here you can see that this is showing that we have received an, an email on this date over here. Now we want to pull out only the second half of this email over here. So we want to take out the domain from this string. So how can we do that? So we can do it by using string method. So first we are going to use find method. Then we are going to use slicing operator to get this substring from this whole string over here. So the first thing that I'm going to do 
I'm going to use find function to find the index of this at sign over here because we want the this part of string which is after the at sign. So first we need to use find method to find the index of this at over here. So find method is responsible for finding an index of any character in the string. So that's why I'm just going to create a new variable over here, which is going to be at index. So then I'm going to put the string that we created over here, which is data dot find. We are going to find at symbol over here, the index of at symbol. Now, if I just going to print out the result to the console, you will see that it's going to print out the number to the console. So the index of at inside this string over here. Now the index is 18. Now, after finding the index, we need to find the first space after this at over here. So after at, we have edu.co.uk. So here we have first space. Now, how can we find the space over here? One more time, we are going to use find method. But in this case, we need to provide the starting index. Because if I just search for the space, it's going to find this space over here. We have it. So I want you to skip this one and start to search after this at sign over here so we have learned that the index of the at sign is 18 so we are going to search for the first space after at sign so i'm going to put it like this space after at is equal to one more time i'm going to put the string which is data and i put find so we are going to look for the space so as a second parameter i'm going to pass this at index over here that we have found before now after finding it i'm just going to print out one more time this string also to the console so it's going to be like this so if i run our code you see that the at symbol is located at the index of 18 and the first space that comes after the at symbol is located over here which is index of 28. now after getting these indexes over here we can extract this piece of data from this string by using these two indexes over here now we can do it like this so i'm going to create a new variable which is called domain is equal to we are going to put the string which is data then we are going to provide starting index now we know that when we provide a starting index it's going to include the index itself so at the index of 18 we have add so that's why i'm just going to put plus one over here to skip at itself then i'm going to put column then it's going to continue until the space after at index. So I'm just going to copy it from here and pass it over here. Now then I'm going to print out domain to the console to see that if we find the correct result or not. Now if I run our code, you see that this substring from here is extracted correctly. So we have used find method and slicing operator to extract this part of string from this whole string over here. Now, when it comes to parsing, another important method for strings is a split method. So split method takes as an input string and outputs list of words contained within string by separating or splitting the words on the all white spaces by default. It also has an optional argument for limiting the number of splits. So I'm just going to delete this part of code from here and I will create a new string which is called my string. And I'm just going to put it like this. I love learning Python. Then I'm going to use split function to split out this string over here. So I'm going to put output. So I'm going to assign the output that comes from this split function to this output variable. So I'm going to put my string dot split. So as a parameter, I'm not going to pass for now anything. I'm just going to print out output to result to see how this is working. So if I just print out output, you see that it took all words from here and created list and inserted into list these words over here. So as you can see, by default, the separator is spaces over here. Now, if I put, for example, as a first parameter over here, underscore and run our code, you will see that in this case, it's just inserted all this code as a one element into list. So to be able to separate by underscore, I have to put underscore between these words over here. Now, if I rerun our code, you will see that in this case, it's splitted based on this underscore and each word over here is a separate element in the list. So we can even go further and provide another parameter over here, which is max split is equal to, for example, let's say one, it's going to divide this 
string into two parts so because it's just going to take only first underscore over here so i is another element and love learning python is another element if i put two over here we will have three elements over here if i put for example three it's going to split all alerts over here and we have four elements because we have three underscores over here so based on three it's going to do everything together now you might be interested that if you want to do the reverse operation for example we have a list like this and we want to convert it back to three so in this case also we have another method for the strings which is join method so what i'm going to do i will create a new variable over here and join them back so i'm just going to put join back so here the first thing that we need to do so if you want to put underscore between these words over here we are just going to put underscore then dot so we are going to put join function so here we are just going to pass this list so as a parameter we are going to pass this list then one more time i'm just going to print out join back so if i run on our code you will see that in this case first it took this string and split it to elements in the list then it combined all of them together now instead of underscore over here if i just put space and run our code you will see that it's just going to combine them together with space between them so this is how we are splitting the word into the list and combining them together so with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture i have explained the most important methods which is useful for string parsing so hopefully everything is clear about this but if you need more methods regarding the strings all you have to do is to search on the internet and read the documentation so see you in the next lecture all right till now we have used single quotes double quotes for declaring strings but the question is if we want to print a text like this so let's say he said what is your name in this case we can neither use single quotes or double quotes because in this case it's going to result syntax error so let me just create a variable over here saying question is equal to let me just put single quotes over here for this string over here and run our code you'll see that it's giving us invalid syntax even instead of single quote if i put double quotes over here one more time you will see that we have syntax error in our string over here so how can we declare a string in which we have single quotes and double quotes now one way to get around this problem is to use triple quotes so instead of here double quotes if i put triple quote like this so i'm just going to put it at the end so here i have triple quotes and here also i have triple quote and if i just print out it to the console you'll see that it will work without any problem so as you can see the message that we want to print out to the console is printed as we have declared over here so here we can put another double quotes because we should have a closing double quotes over here so if i rerun it make it like this if i rerun it you will see that it's printing out the way that we asked before now the alternative way of doing this to use escape sequence an escape sequence starts with backslash and it is interpreted differently if we use a single quote to represent a string all single quotes inside the string must be escaped similarly if we use the double quotes all double quotes inside the string must be escaped so how can we do this as i mentioned we can do it by using backslash which is for escaping sequence so in this case we have done this with using triple quotes so i'm just going to comment over here triple quotes then let's declare it with using single quote but escaping single quotes so i'm just going to put escaping single quotes so i'm just going to copy the same quote from here and passed it over here now in this case the question will be like this so here we are going to put single quotes then all single quote quotes inside this string over here must be escaped so as you can see we have one two three single quotes over here so these ones will be the main single quotes so we are not going to touch them we have to escape this one which is in the middle of the string so before that we are going to put backslash so in this case it's going to be escaped now if i rerun our code you see that for both cases it's printing out same result now similarly we can do the same thing for double quotes so i'm just going to comment escaping double quotes so here again i'm going to copy the same code but this time i'm going to put over here double quotes so one double quote so another one should be over here now in this case we are not going to escape the single quote 
we have to escape the double code. So one double code is over here. We are going to put escape sign over here and another one is over here. So we have to put escape sign for this one also. Now, if I read on our code, you will see that for all cases over here, it's printing out three methods. So we have learned three ways of escaping double quotes and single quotes in this lecture over here. Now in the resource section of this lecture, I'm, I'm going to att attach the list of escape sequences that is supported by Python. So in this list, you can find which escape sequences we have in Python. So let's look at another example. So I'm just going to delete this part. So let's say you want to print out the path to the console. So we have said that we can use backslash for escaping. Now, what if we want to print out backslash itself to the console? So let's say we have a path like this and we want to print out this one to the console. Now, in this case, if I just straight away print it out, you will see that it's not printing out the way that it should be. Because in this case, this is new line character. So it's putting new line character over here. But actually, we should print out this path. So how can we do that? So one more time, we need to put one more backslash in front of this one because we need to ignore them. So if I read on our code, you will see that in this case, it's printing out the proper path to the console over here. So by using backslash, we can even ignore the new line character over here. And sometimes we may wish to ignore the escape sequences inside the string. So this can be done by placing uppercase R or lowercase R in front of string. So this will imply that it's a row string and any escape sequence inside this string will be ignored. So in this case, for example, instead of putting like this, if I put R over here in front of this and run our code, you will see that it's going to print out same result. So we don't need to provide any extra backslash over here. So instead of small R, if I put the uh, uppercase R, it's going to print out same thing. So whenever we want to ignore the escape sequences inside the string, we are using R in front of string. Otherwise, we are going to use backslash for escaping the characters like backslash, single quotes, double quotes, or some others. So hopefully everything is clear about escape sequences. Now in this lecture, we are going to learn about string formatting. So here we are going to learn three main approach for string formatting in Python. So let's get started. So in order to have a simple example for experimentation, let's assume we have got the following variables like this. So we have error number like this, and we have name variable in which we have a name of person. So based on these variables, you would like to generate an output string containing a simple error message. So let's say we need to generate a simple error message like this. Hey, Eddie, there is a this error number over here, error. Now we need to represent this integer error number as hexadecimal number for error message and the name variable as a string over here. So the first formatting style that we are going to look at is old style formatting, which is used percent as a formatting operator. Now, when we use this operator with the integers, it's modulus operator, but when we are using it with the uh, string, it is formatting operator. Now, the reason why we are calling this old style formatting is because in the recent version of the Python, we have new style formatting, but this style of formatting is not deprecated. That's why I'm explaining it over here. Now, this operator lets you do simple positional formatting very easily. So if you ever worked with the printf style function in C programming language, you will recognize how this works instantly. Here's this simple example. So let's say if I put my print statement like this. So hello, then I'm going to put percent %s, then outside of this quotes, I'm going to put one more time percent and name. So if I run our code, you will see that it's going to print out hello Eddie. So as you can see, by using percent as format specifier, here we tell the Python where to substitute the value of name represented as a string. So we are taking the value of name from here and substitute it inside this string over here. So this s represent a string over here. There are other format specifiers available that let you control the output format. For example, it's possible to convert numbers to hexadecimal notation or add space padding to generate nicely formatted tables or reports. So here again, I'm going to provide a link to the Python documentation in which you can read more about old style formatting. So I'm not going to include everything over here. I'm just showing you how it is working. Now, as we said before, to print out the error message as a hexadecimal number into the console, we are going to use 
another format specifier. So in this case, we are going to use something like this. So here, if I put print, so here, if I put percent %x, percent %x is responsible for converting the integer number to hexadecimal number. So here, I can put it like this, error no. So if I run our code, you'll see that this error message is converted to hexadecimal number over here. Now, if you want to print out this message that we have shown before by using the formatting style, in case of old styling, we are going to do it like this. So I'm just going to write print statement. Then inside print statement, we are going to make multiple substitution in a single string. So here, one more time, I'm going to put, so to print out this message, I'm going to put, hey, then I need to provide the string. So I'm going to put percent %s. Then after that, we can write, there is a, so we need to provide the error code over here. So I'm just going to put 0x, then percent %x error. So here we need to do our substitution. So when it comes to the multiple substitution, the format changes like this. So we need to put percent, then inside brackets, we need to provide all substitution. So the first one is the name. So we need to provide in order that we have specified over here. And the second one is error number. Now, in this case, if I run our code, you will see that it's going to print out this message to the console over here like this. So by using multiple substitution, we have formatted our string like this. So uh, S is substituted with the name because S is the first one and the name is the first one. Then here, percent %x is substituted with the hexadecimal uh, representation of error number over here. Now, when you are formatting it like this, you have to be very careful that the order has to be same as that we specified inside this string over here. Now, if you don't want to care about order, you can pass the substitutions by mapping. So we can write this one like this. So I'm just going to delete this part from here and pass it over here. So let me delete this part. So we are going to do the same thing by using mapping. So all we have to do over here, after this person over here, I'm going to put brackets. So then I'm going to put name. So here we can put between these two error number. Then outside of the quotes, we are going to provide our mapping. So mapping will be like this. So we need to provide percentage. Then per inside curly braces, we are going to provide name, column name, then comma. And for error number, we are going to put like this. Error number is going to be error number. Now in this case, this error number will be substituted with this one and this name will be substituted with this one. Now in this case, if I run our code one more time, you will see that it's printing out same message to the console. Now here, you don't need to care about the order. So if I just cut this one from here and pass it over here, you will see that nothing changed. So it's replacing the name with the name and error message with the error message. But in this case, if I change them, in this case, we will have different results because we are changing the order of the substitutions. So as you can see, we have an error message over here because this we cannot convert name string to hexadecimal number over here. So that's why when you are formatting it without mapping, the order has to be the same. But when you are formatting it with mapping, the order can be changed. So this mapping makes format strings easier to maintain and easier to modify in the future. And here, as I mentioned, you don't need to worry about making sure the order you are passing in the values match up with the order in which the values are referenced in the format string. Of course, the downside of this technique is it requires more typing over here. Now, this is all for the old style formatting. Now, the next formatted style is new style formatting, which is str.format. So I'm going to delete this part from here. So I'm going to continue to the str format function. So this new formatting style is introduced in Python 3. So this new style gets rid of the percentage operator and makes the syntax for string formatting more regular. Formatting is now handled by calling dot format function. So we just need to call dot format function like this. Now, for example, we can format hello Eddie like this. So I'm just going to put print statement. So inside print statement, I'm going to put hello, then comma, we can put curl braces like this. Then outside of the string, we are going to put format name. So in this case, it's going to take this name and put it over here instead of these curly braces over here. Now, if I run our code, you'll see that it's printing out, hello, Eddie. Now, the question is, how can we format it 
as the way that we did before in old styling to print out error message as hexadecimal number over here. Now to do so, I'm going to write the print statement like this. So here again, I'm going to put print statement and inside print statement, I'm going to put something like this. Hey, let's put curly braces. Then we can put there is a zero X and curly braces again, error. Then we can put dot format. So inside parentheses, we can put name and error number. Now, if you run our code, you see that it's printing out the message like this. But here, the problem is it has not converted it to the hexadecimal number, but it's printing out as a number over here. Now, to be able to convert it to the hexadecimal number, inside these curl braces over here, we need to put colon x. Now, if I run our code, you see that in this case, it's converted to hexadecimal number. Now, here again, when you write it something like this, you need to be very careful about the ordering over here. Now, if you don't want to use the ordering as we did before, here again, it's possible to use mapping. Now, to be able to use mapping, I'm just going to copy this code from here and pass it over here. Now, we can put over here name. Then here, we can put error number. Then again, over here, we can map it like this. Name is equal to name and error number is equal to error number. Now, if I run our code, you will see that in this case also it's printing out same message. Even if we change the order of the substitutions over here, we will not have any problem about printing out the message to the console. So as you can see, without any problem, we have printed out message to the console. Now, this is how the simplest way of the format method works. Now, here again, to be able to get used to how the formatting works, you need to read the documentation and practice more about format function. And finally, the last formatting approach in Python is fstring. Now, this is added in Python 3.6. Until now, we have used in our functions fstrings many times. So this means that when you are using fstring, so I'm just going to comment this part. You are putting f in front of the string. So we are going to put f. Then inside quotes, we are going to put whatever we want to put. Now here, if we want to print hello, Eddie, we are just going to put hello. And inside curly braces, we are going to put name. Now, if I run our code, you will see that it's printing out hello Eddie. Now here, instead of name over here, you can put whatever expression you want. You can put, for example, the uh, operations or calculations and whatever you want. Now, for example, I can use F string with the operations like this. For example, 10 plus 10, we can put easily 10 plus 10 over here. It's going to calculate 10 plus 10 which is 20 over here. So as you can see, by using f string, we can put any expression inside strings over here. Now the question is, how can we print out this error message to the console using f string? Now in this case, one more time, I'm going to print out with the f in front of the quotes. So here we are going to put hey, then the name. So we have a name variable over here. So it's going to be the inside curl braces. Then we are going to print out there is a error number. And then after that, we are going to put error like this. Now, if I run our code, you'll see that in this case, it's printing out error number itself. But in our case, we need to convert it to the hexadecimal number. So to be able to convert it here again, we are going to put colon, then dash and X. So in case of F string when we are converting it to hexadecimal number the symbol remains same but in front of symbol we need to provide dash now if you run our code you see that it's printing out same message over here now, I might, now let me just delete this part and print out both message together to see that if they are exactly the same or not so as you can see it's printing out the same message to the console like this so in case of f string we are putting dash in front of x but in case of formatting, we are just putting x itself after the column. But in the old style, we were using something like this, percentage with the x. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, I have combined three string formatting style in Python and explained bas basics of them. Now, one more time, I want to mention that it's not possible to cover all formatting styles in one short lecture. All you need to do is to search on the internet and read the documentation whenever you need a specific formatting style. So hopefully everything is clear about this lecture as well. So see you in the next lecture.
Welcome back to brand new section of Python for Everyone course. So the section will be Python list. So here we are going to learn everything about list. So we will concentrate on list operations, list methods, lists and functions, nested lists, object and values, and we are going to do lots of exercises. So here again, we are going to discuss everything related to Python list in detail. And after finishing the section, we are going to implement what we have learned in real life projects. So the first project is build roulette. So here we are going to create a program which asks for names. Then it's going to select the random name from the list of the names that we have provided. Then the person that is selected for everyone's food bill. So this kind of really interesting game that you can play with your friends. And the next project will be find the golden star. So here we are going to write a program which will automatically place the golden star in a map and we will find it by marking a spot with an X. So we have to find the golden star in the map that is given. So here again, we are going to use the list to find out the golden star in the map. Then the next project will be escaping the maze. And the goal is to be able to write some code here in Rebox world and get our little robot to navigate to the goal through a maze, no matter what the maze looks like. So every time when we open the project, the maze will change. So we have to write the program to be able to escape our robot through these various maze over here. So the next project will be cryptography in Python. So it's going to be Caesar Cipher. So this is a very interesting project. So the Caesar Cipher is the way of encoding the text. It was seen as early as during the times of Julius Caesar. So when he had these top military message, what he will do is he will shift each letter of the alphabet by a certain predefined amount. Then he can encrypt this message and send it to the others in a safe way. So this is also a very interesting project to implement what we have learned related to list. Then the next project will be story maker. So here we are going to implement what we have learned till now. So first we are going to create sentence maker function. Then we will create a loop which asks for input from a user. Then we are going to combine everything together. So this is a very nice project which will help us to revise what we have learned till now. Then at the end we are going to create a big project which is called hangman. So in Hangman project, we are going to implement everything that we have learned throughout this course. So it's going to be building the basically Hangman game. So Hangman is a game for two people in which one player thinks of a word, then draws a line on the page for each letter in the word. Then the second player tries to guess the letters that might be in the word. So if the second player guesses the letter correctly, the first player writes the letter in the proper blank. But if the second player guesses incorrectly, the first player draws a single body part of hanging man. The second player has to guess all letters in the word before hanging man is completely drawn to win the game. So I'm going to explain everything in details when we are creating this game. But here you need to take into account that when we are creating this game, we are going to implement everything that we have learned till now in this course. And this is very important to practice everything. So once you're ready, head over to the next lesson to get started. All right, when we were talking about the iteration, we have learned the general definition of list. And as you remember, we have discussed it using states of UK. So we have created a list like this. And we have learned that by using the list name and indexes, we can access the elements of list and we can update the list or we can use some several methods to modify the list based on the Python documentation. Now here in this section, we will go further and learn more about list as Python built-in data structure. A list is a data structure that holds an ordered collection of items, i.e. you can store a sequence of items in a list. This is easy to imagine if you think of shopping list where you have a list of items to buy, except that you have each item on a separate line in your shopping list, whereas in Python list, you put commas in between them. The list of items should be enclosed in square brackets so that Python understands that you are specifying a list. Like a string, a list is a sequence of values. In a string, the values are called characters. In a list, they can be any type. The values in the list are called elements and sometimes items. So as we have learned before, we can create a list by putting square brackets. So if I put square brackets and put elements inside these, it's going to be a list of integers. So here you see that these values over here are integers. So that's why this is the list of integers. 
Now we can create a list of strings or any other types. So if I put instead of numbers over here, for example, names, Eddie, Jane, John, then in this case, it's going to be the list of strings. Now in case of list, we can create a list of different types. This means that over here in the names list, we can create another element with the type of integer. We can create another element with the type of float. So in this case, this list contains string, float, and integers. Now, if we have created a list without any element like this, in this case, this list will called empty list. So as you might expect, you can assign list values to a variables. So this means that I can put a variable over here like this. So it's going to be numbers is equal to this list. And we can put names is equal to this list, or we can put empty list like this. So whenever we are creating a list, we, have, we can assign it to any variable. Now, when we are talking about the string, we have mentioned that strings are immutable. So this means that if I create a custom string like this, so let's say it's hello. And if I try to modify this string based on the index, so I'm just going to, for example, access the first element and try to change it to L. In this case, you will see that we will have error because the strings are immutable. So we cannot change the string. But in case of list, they are mutable. So this means that if I want to change the first element in list over here, we can use index and change it. So in this case, instead of string over here, if I put names list and with the index of zero, so first I'm just going to print out the value to the console to see what is the value of the Z index. So in this case, the value of zero index is edit. Now, if I change it to some other name, so I'm just going to update it to my name. So let's say I'm changing it to l -shot. And one more time, I'm going to print out it to the console. So let's run our code. You will see that in this case, first it was edit. Then after update, it becomes l -shot. So we can easily update any element in list by using their indexes. This means that lists are not like the string. So we can change the list elements by using assignment operator. You can think of a list relationship between indices and elements. This relationship is called mapping. Each index maps to the one of the elements. List index works the same as string indexes. So here in the string, we said that it starts from zero and it continues until the end of this string. And in case of list, it's also going to start from zero and it will continue until the last element in the list. So this element will be the zeroth index. Then this element will be located at the index of one then this element will be located at the index of two, then this element will be located at the index of three, and the last one will be at the index of four. So any integer expression can be used as index in the list. So as we said before, we can use the index to access the elements of the list. So instead of, for example, zero over here, we can put even mathematical operations. So one plus one, if I run it, you'll see that it's going to print out John to the console. So one plus one is two and John is located at the index of two over here. So this means that as an index, we can use any integer expression. Now let's continue to the traversing of a list. Now the most common way to traverse elements of list is for loop. Now we have learned that traversing means that we have to visit each and every element of the list or string. So in this case, to be able to traverse through the list, we have learned that we can use for loop. Now the most basic way will be like this. For name in names, so then we can print out the name to the console. Now if I run our code, you will see that in this case, it's going to visit all elements of the names list and it's going to print out all of them to the console. Now this works very well only if you read the elements of the list. But if you want to write or update the elements, in this case, you need the indexes. So a common way to do that to combine range function with the length function. So in this case, by using for in loop, we can just visit the elements and printing out the console. But when we are dealing with the list, we don't always print out the names. Sometimes we might update the values or sometimes we might change the values inside the loop. So for this, we have to use indexes. Now to be able to traverse by using indexes, we are going to change our loop to use length function and range function. Now the loop will be like this for index in so we are going to put range so we know that if we haven't provide the first index the range function will start from zero so i'm not going to provide first parameter now the second parameter will be length of names now after doing so we can print out values to the console like this so i'm just going to put names 
then here inside square brackets we can put index now if i run it it's going to print out the same values to the console now here we can use this index to update all values to something now in this case we have strings over here so let's make for example change the numbers so instead of names over here i'm going to put numbers so let's say we want to multiply each element by two so in this case we are going to put it like this so instead of print over here i'm just going to put numbers index is equal to so let's multiply with this one with two then at the end after looping through this list i'm just going to print out numbers to the console to see that how this is changed now if i run our code you will see that initially our list was like this so by traversing using indexes we are able to update each element of list by multiplying two so the first element was 10 now it's 20 the second element was 20 now it's 40 the third element was 30 now it's 60 and fifth element is 40 now it is 80. So this means that whenever we want to traversal through list and update or change some elements, we have to use loop with the indexes and with the help of range function. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have learned how can we create different types of list and we learn how can we change the values by using traversing. So see you in the next lecture. Now in this lecture, we are going to look at list operations. So we will look at which operations can be performed on list. Now the first operator is slicing operator. So as we did in case of strings, we can use slice operator for list as well. Now we have learned that slice operator can be used a column between indexes. So here, let's say we have a custom list like this. So in which I have elements from A to F. Now, if you want to use slice operator we are going to put the name of list which is my list then inside square brackets we are going to put beginning index and ending index now we have learned that in case of string if we omit the first index the slice starts from the beginning of the string so it's applicable for list also and if we omit the second index the slice goes to the end and this is applicable for list as well so this means that if i just omit the first slice and put only the second one it's just going to continue until this index over here so it will start from the zeroth index and continue till this index over here now if i just print out this you will see that in this case it's just going to print out a and b because it's starting from zeroth index then continues to the first index then until the second index and it's not included second index as well over here now if you omit both of them it's not going to do anything it's just going to print out all elements to the console now if you want to take for example first three element you can put zero to third index and take first three elements so as you can see third index is not included over here now if you want to for example take from second element until the last in this case you just need to provide the index of the second element first then skip the second index now if you run it you'll see that in this case it's printing out elements from second element until the end so the slicing operator works the way that it worked with the strings. But here we have a slightly difference. In case of string, we cannot use slice operator to update the string because as we mentioned before, strings are immutable. But in case of list, we can use slicing operator to change the list elements over here. So now in this case, let's say we want to change B and C in this list. So in this case, we can write it like this. My list with the index of b index of b is one and the index of c is two but in this case we are just going to include three because if i put two over here it's not going to include c now for simplicity let me just print out this one to the console so i'm just going to delete this part run it you see that it's going to print out bc now by using slicing operator we can use assignment operator and put something like this so here if i put x and y you will see that in this case b will be replaced with x and c will be replaced with y now if i run our code one more time in this case you will see that it's going to print out x and y now if i just delete this part print the list itself you'll see that in this case 
instead of b and c we have x and y so this means that we can use slicing operator in case of list for updating the values in the list because as we mentioned before lists are mutable now let's continue to the next operator now the next operator will be in case of list concatenation operator now let's say i have two lists like this so concatenation can be done by using the plus operator so let's say we have two lists like this list one is equal to one two three and in the list two we have four five six now if i use plus sign with these two lists over here many of you might think that it's going to add this number so i intentionally selected integer numbers to show you that it's not adding these numbers over here it's just concatenating them so in this case if i just create list three is equal to list one plus list two and then at the end let's print out list three to the console and run our code you'll see that in this case instead of adding these elements one by one it's just concatenating them together now when we are talking about this lecture some people ask the question that what if we use minus over here instead of plus so in this case you'll see that we are getting an error because in this case this minus sign over here is not so perfect now we can use only plus signs and that's only for concatenation so take into account that you are not adding the elements you are just combining everything together so plus sign in the list are used for concatenation now the next operator is star operator star operator repeats a list a given number of times so let's say i have a list like this so in which i have only one element now if i do something like this let me just create list two is equal to list one star four in this case this one element over here will be repeated four times in the list two so it's going to be like list two so here we need to provide list one not list itself so as you can see the element is repeated four times now what if we have two elements over here now, if i run it you'll see that these two elements are repeated four times so if i have three elements over here it's going to repeat all elements four times so this is one this is second one this is third one and this is fourth time. so by using star operator we can increase the number of repetitions in a list so if you put four over here that the elements will be repeated four times if you put five over here the elements will be repeated five times and this can be done using star operator now the last operator that we are going to use for list is called exist operator so we can use it by using in keyword so let's say we have a list like this so i'm going to create one more time list one so here let's say we have a few elements from one to four then let's just put different types of elements so a b c d now by using in operator we can check that if any element exists in this list over here or not so if the element exists in this list it's going to return true otherwise it's just going to return false so i'm going to do it for example let's check if a exists in this list so a in list one so the syntax is like this so if i just print out this one to the console you'll see that in this case it's going to return true so this means that a exists over here now if i put for example h and run our code you'll see that in this case it's returning false now we can even check for integer numbers so when we are checking for integer we need to put three like this so run our code you will see that it's returning true now even instead of printing out this one to the console we can create a variable over here check and assign this one to this variable then at the end print it to the console so let's print check you'll see that this is also working the way that it worked before so by using in operator we can check that if any element exists in this list over here or not so this is very easy way of searching for element in the list but in this case instead of returning the index of this element in this list it's just returning true or false so based on this condition you can perform some operations on the elements of the list now with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture i have explained most used list operations in python so hopefully everything is clear about that so see you in the next lecture Now in this lecture we are going to talk about python list methods 
Now, when we are talking about the strings, we have mentioned that in Python, we have the arm function, which identifies the object's method. Now, in this case, let's say we have a list like this in which we have stored the animals. Now, if I call the arm method for this animals list and print out the output to the console, it's going to print out all methods that this object animal list has. Now, after printing out, you see that we have all these methods over here. Now, when we are talking about method, we are going to talk about only these methods in which we don't have underscore in the names of the methods. So the methods that we are going to discuss in this lecture is going to be append, clear, copy, and continuous until the end. So let's get started. Now, the first method that I'm going to discuss is going to be index method. Index method returns the index of specified element in the list. So let's see how this is working for this list over here. Now in this list, we have the animals. Now let's say if we want to find out the, this element's index, let's say horse index, how can we find it? So we can find it by using index method. So we know that when we are calling the methods, we are putting the list name, object name, then dot, then we are putting the name itself. So now when we put the name, you see that the index method over, appears over here. Now as a parameter, we are going to pass the element's name. Now in this case, if I pass horse, and let me just print out the value to the console, you will see that in this case, it's returning three. So this means that horse is located at the index of three. So dog is located at the, at the index of zero, cat is located at the index of one, then mouse is located at the index of two, then horse is located at the index of three. So the output over here is three. Now to make it things more easier, I'm just going to take the output of this method and assign to a variable and print this index to the console. Now in this case, it's going to print also the three. Now here, when we are calling the index method over here, you see that we have three parameters for this method over here. So the first parameter is the object and the second parameter is the start and the third parameter is stop. Now in this case, we have called it for horse. So the index was three. Now the question is, what if we have more than one horse over here? Now, if I just create another horse element over here in the list and run our code, you see that in this case also it's returning three. Now, to be able to get the second horse index, we have to provide as a start starting index, which is going to be searching start point for this element. So if I put, for example, over here three run, you see that in this case also it's returning three because it's located at the index of three. If I put four over here and run our code, you'll see that in this case, the index is fine. So in this case, it's returning the index of second horse over here. Now, after this parameter over here, we have third parameter. So the third parameter is for the last index. Now, if I leave it empty, it's going to continue until it finds the first element. Otherwise, if I put, for example, five over here, it will continue until this index over here. Now, the five is not included over here. So that's why we have error over here. It says that horse is not in this list because we are looking for horse only in the fourth index. Now, instead of five over here, if I put six, it's going to return five because the second index is included over here. Now, all in all, we can use index method to find the index of any given element, and we can put start and end index to find a specific element's index in a specific range. Now, let's continue to the next method. The next method that we are going to talk about is append method. Now, if you want to add any element to this list over here, we are going to use append method. Append method is adding element at the end of this list over here. So we have the animals over here. For, for example, let's say we want to add another animal <clears throat> to this list over here at the end of this. So for, to do so, we are going to call append method. So append method takes only one parameter. So for example, let's say I want to add fox over here. Then at the end, if I print out animals list to the console, you will see that fox is added at the end of this list over here. So as you can see, after bear over here, we have added fox. So by using append method, we can add a new element at the end of given list. Now, the interesting moment over here is if I just print out the result of this function to the console, you will see that it's going to print out none because append method returns none. So it's just going to add the element at the end of the list, but it's not returning anything. Now, similar to append method, we have another method which is called extend method. Now, append method add one element at the end of list, but extend method adds all the elements of iterable object to the end of list. So this means that we can create another list. So let's say I'm creating animals two 
is equal to so in this case let's put first element as a fox and then the second animal put rabbit now if i want to add all these elements to these animals list over here we are going to run extend method so it's going to be like this animals dot extend so as you can see as a parameter it takes iterable iterable means that it can be list tuple or or string so here we can put it like this so i'm going to pass animals to now after passing if i run our code you will see that rabbit and fox are added at the end of list over here so here again when we are running extend method the second list elements are added at the end of list over here so by using extend method we can combine these two lists together and add second list elements at the end of this list over here now you might be interested what if you want to add an element at any given location in the list so let's say for example i want to add rabbit after this mouse over here now to do so we can use insert method so i'm going to delete this part so insert method will add elements based on their index so once one more time we are going to put the name of list then insert then we put the insert method as you can see it takes two parameter index and object now the index of mouse is 0 1 2 so i'm going to add two over here then as an element i'm going to put rabbit now if i run our code one more time then print out to the console you see that rabbit is added at the index of two so it's added before mouse over here now if you want to add it after mouse you just need to put three over here and run our code you see that it's added after mouse over here now whatever index you put over here as a first parameter the element that we are going to add will be inserted at that specific location so we can achieve this by using insert method so as i mentioned insert method takes two parameters first parameter is the location that we are going to insert and the second parameter is the element that we want to insert now let's continue to the next method the next method is remove method remove method removes the first matching element from the list now the syntax again over here is same so we are going to put the name of list then we are going to put remove so let's say i want to remove horse from this list so i'm going to put horse run our code you see that in this case it's removing the horse from the list over here now if we have double horse over here and run our code you see that in this case it's going to remove only the first occurrence so it's going to search for the first one and remove that one from the list over here now for example we don't have rabbit over here if i try to delete rabbit what will happen in this case it's going to raise an error saying that the rabbit is not in this list over here so it cannot be deleted from this list over here now here again take into account that this method also will not return anything so it's returning now it's just modifying the existing list over here so if i just print out the output of this method to the console you will see that it's printing now so let me just put horse over here and run our code you'll see that one more time it's printing none to the console so this method also does not return anything now the next method that we are going to look at it is count method now the count method returns number of the times the specified element appears in the list now we have learned that by using len function we can count the number of elements in the list and by using count method we can count only the number of the specified element now in this case this function returns count itself so i'm just going to put count is equal to so let me put animals dot count so in this case we know that we have two horse over here let's put as a parameter horse so this takes only one parameter now if i run our code now instead of animal over here let's print out the count you'll see that in this case it's returning two so this means that we have two horses in our list over here now instead of horse if i put cat over here it's going to return only one because we have only cat, one cat in our list over here now the next method is pop method the pop method removes the item at a given index from the list and returns that removed item now this is very important over here that many methods in the python list does not return anything but pop method returns the item itself it's at the same time it's removing the item from the list over here so i'm just going to create item over here now instead of count let me just put pop then at the end let's print out item to the console and similarly let's print out animals to the console now if i run our code you see that we have an error over here so it says that str object cannot be interpreted as integer so this means that this parameter over here not has to be the element itself it has to be the index of element now if you want to delete the cat we have to provide 
index of one over here. Now, if I run our code with the index of one, you will see that cat is printed out to the console, which is returning from this pop method. And when we print out the animals list, we see that cat is missing from this list over here. Now, this is a very useful method because sometimes when we are popping out the elements from the list, we want to use that element in somewhere else. So that's why in this case, pop method is very useful. Now, instead of one over here, if I put over here, two is going to change to mouse. So mouse will be deleted from the list and it's going to print it out to the console because it's returned by the pop method over here. Now then, we are going to continue to the next method. The next method is reverse method. Now, in our previous lectures, we have used slice operator to reverse the list. But in Python, there is a built-in method which is reverses the elements of list. Now, in this case, it's not going to take any parameter. We are just calling it by typing the name reverse. So this method also does not return anything. It's just reversing the list itself. Now, if I run our code, you will see that our list was like this. Now, after calling the reverse method, it has changed the original list. So the original look, list looked like this. The last element was horse. Now, it is the first element. Then the last second element was beer. Now, it is the second element and it continues like this. The first element was dog and the, now it is the last element in the list. So by using reverse method, we can make our life much more easier and just straight away reverse the list over here. Now, here again, as I mentioned, reverse method does not return anything. So if I just print out the output of reverse method, you see that it's not returning anything. The reason that I'm mentioning is many people are tend to create a variable over here, for example, reverse list like this, then call reverse method and assign value to it. Then if you print out this reverse list to the console, you will see that nothing happens. In this case, it's just returning none. So it's not reversed. The reason behind this is that it is reversing the original list itself over here. So it's not creating a new list, it's reversing the elements in the original list itself. Now, the next method that we are going to look is sort method. Now, as the name implies, it sorts the elements of given list in a specific ascending or descending order. Now, if I call, for example, for this animal list sort method, then let's print out animals to the console. You see that it sort element from A to B, so in ascending order. Now, if you want to sort elements in descending order, we have another parameter over here, reverse. So we need to set it to true. Now, if I run our code, you will see that in this case, the order is changed. It is ordered them from Z to A. Now, if it was numbers, so let's say we have numbers from one to 10. In this case, if I just call sort method for these numbers, let me just print out the numbers to the console. By setting the reverse true, you will see that in this case, it's printing out from 10 to one. This number are already ordered over here. So that's why if you put the reverse true over here, it's going to sort them from 10 to one. Now, if I change the places of these numbers, put in random place and run our code one more time, you will see that here again, it's sorting in a descending order. If I just remove this reverse parameter from here, it's going to sort them in ascending order over here. So this is how sort method works in case of Python list. Now the next method that we are going to look at is copy method. So copy method returns a shallow copy of list. So to, to make the copy of this list over here, we can put like this new animals. So I'm going to put animals.copy. Then if I just print both of them to the console, so let's just print first animals, then new animals, you see that these two lists are copy of each other. So in this case, the copy method does not modify this uh, original list over here. It's just making copy of it and returning it. So if you assign it to new list variable over here, it's going to be a new copy of this list over here. Now, you might be interested that we can make a copy of list by using assignment state. So for example, instead of making copy over here, let me just comment this part, put animals over here and print out to the console, you'll see that in this case also we can make the copy of these animals. Now here we have an issue. If you modify the new list over here, the old list also will be modified in this case. So let's say if I just try to add new animal to the new animals by adding append method. So let's put fox to this list over here. You'll see that in this case, it's going to be added to both lists over here. Because the new list 
is referencing or pointing to the old list over here. Now, this is how Python works. So we are going to talk about this object referencing in our intermediate level of lectures. Here, I just want to show that if you make the copies list by using assignment statement, whatever you do in the new list is going to affect the old list also. Now, in this case, instead of using assignment statement, if I use copy and run our code at append to the this new animals list over here, you see that in this case, the old list is not affected. So it's just added to new list. So by using copy method, you can make the copy of list into a new list. So whatever you do in the new list, it's not going to affect the old list over here. Now, this is how copy method works in case of Python. Now, the last method that we are going to discuss today is clear method. Now, if you want to delete all elements from this list over here, you are going to just use clear method. So it's going to do like this, clear. So it's not going to return anything because it's clearing the all elements from the original list. So if I run our code and print out original list to the console, you see that we don't have any element in this list over here. So it removed all elements of original list over here and the return value from this one is not, it's not returning anything. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, I briefly explained the main methods of Python list. So hopefully everything is clear about them. So see you in the next lecture. Now in this lecture, we are going to look at Python built in functions that can be used with list. So by using such kind of functions, we can quickly look through a list without writing our own loop. So let's say we have a list like this. So in this case, number list. So let's say we have some numbers in this list like this. And we have learned that by using, for example, len function, we can find the number of elements in this list over here. So len is built-in function of Python. So this can be used with list to find out the number of elements in this list. So if I just print out the result to the console, you'll see that in this list, we have five elements. Now, another function that can be used with the list over here is maximum function. So by using maximum function, we can find the maximum element in this list over here. So let's say instead of len over here, if I use max function with this nums list and run our code, you will see that in this case, it's returning 30. So 30 is the biggest element in this list. Now, the next function is we can use minimum function. So if I put minimum over here and run our code, you'll see that in this case, it's returning five. So this means that the minimum element is five over here. Now, apart from these functions, we can use some function also. So some function obviously will take the sum of the elements and print out the result. So in this case, the sum of elements of this list is 80. So by using some function, we can easily sum up them. Now here, I want to mention that some function works only with, with the list where the elements are numbers. But other functions, for example, maximum function, len function, minimum function, are working with string type as well and other types that can be comparable. So these functions over here makes our life much more easier when we are dealing with the list. Now the next function that we can use with this list over here is delete function. Now we have learned before that we can use pop method to delete elements from this list over here. So pop method is a list method now, apart from the pop method, we can use delete method. Now, if I put, for example, del, del nums with the index of zero, then print out nums to the console, you will see that in this case, after running this, it's going to delete the first element from the list over here. Now, if I put one over here and run our code, you will see that in this case, it's going to delete the second element. Now, apart from the pop method of the Python list, we can use a built-in function which is called delete delete function to delete elements from the list over here. So as you remember, before we have created a program like this, which was taking a number from the console, and at the end when we write down, it was returning the average of these numbers to the console. That based on the count and the total value that we are getting from the console. Now we can rewrite our program with the help of list and with the help of built-in functions in Python. Now here, I'm just going to delete this code from here and we can rewrite our program like this. Now the first thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to create number list as an empty list over here. Then I'm going to write the loop like this. So while true, 
We are going to ask one more time from user to input number, enter a number, then we are going to check that. If input is equal to done, in this case we are going to put break over here to stop our loop. Otherwise, we are going to append the value that we are getting from the console to this list over here. So it's going to be like this num list dot append. So as a parameter, we are going to pass this input value over here. Now, before passing it, we need to convert it to float or integer. So in this case, I'm just going to put float function like this. So here, when we are appending it, I'm going to put value. Now, after doing so, if a user enters down, in this case, outside of loop, we are going to calculate the average. Now, how can we calculate the average? We can calculate average by taking the sum of the numbers. If I use the fun sum function, it's going to take the sum of the num list. So we can divide it with the length of the num list over here, which will be the number of the elements in the list. Then at the end, we can print out saying that average is like this. So this is the average that we are calculating from here and printing out to the console. Now, if I read on our code, you'll see that in this case, also the first thing that it does is going to ask for a number. So I'm going to put 20, hit enter, then it's going to ask for another number, then 30, then 40, then 50. Then at the end, when I'm enter done, it's going to print out the average of numbers that I have inserted over here. Now, as you can see, by using built-in functions of Python, we can create the program that we have created before very easily. So as you can see, by using these functions over here, we can easily calculate the average of elements very easily. So hopefully with this lecture, you have an idea of how built-in functions works with Python list. Now in this lecture, we are going to talk about how can we convert strings to a list or list to a string. A string is a sequence of characters and a list is a sequence of values. But a list of characters is not same as a string. To convert a string to a list of characters, you can use list function. So let's say we have a string like this. So let's put custom string is equal to, let's say, hello. Now, if you want to convert this string to the list in which we will have these characters as elements, all we have to do, we have to use list function. So custom list is equal to we are going to use list functions so as a parameter we are going to pass this custom string to the list over here now after doing so if i just print out this value to the console you will see that it's going to be the list of characters so each character over here will be one element in the list so as you can see h is one element e is one element l is one element so by using index operator we can even access this value so if i put zero over here if i print out it you'll see that it's printing out h if i put one over here it's going to print out l over here so the list function breaks a string into individual letters so if you want to break a string into words in this case instead of list method you can use split method so let's say we have a string like this hello world i love python so if i use list function for this string over here you will see that in this case each character over here is a separate element in this list over here but if you want to make these words each of these words a single element in the list in this case as i mentioned i have to use split method now to be able to use the split method we have to access it by using string name so instead of this method over here i'm just going to put custom string dots so as a parameter if i don't pass anything in this case it's just going to divide this word by the spaces between them now if i run our code you will see that hello is one element the second element is word the third element is i so as you can see with the world, we have dot with world because after dot we have space over here. So it had divided it by using spaces. Now here again, by using index, for example, if I put over here two, it's going to access the elements of this list over here. This is located at the index of zero. This is located at the index of one. So at the index of two is located I over here. Now if I put three over here, it's just going to print out what to the console. So as you can see, by using split function, we can convert a string to a list and default value in this case will be space. Now let's say if we have a string like this, hello world, and between them we have underscore. Now in this case, if we want to divide the two elements by using underscore, when we are calling split function as a parameter, we are going to pass an underscore over here. Now if I pass underscore over here, you will see that in this case, the elements are divided by using underscore. 
Now, if I don't put anything over here, when we have this word like this, in this case, this word will be one element in our list over here. So as you can see, in this case, we have only one list. So you can split the string by using specific character passing to split function. Now you might be interested that if we have converted this string to the list, is it possible to convert a list to the string? Now it's possible so we can use join function of string over here. Now if you use the join function, it's going to join these elements by providing a delimiter over here. Now let's say I have custom list like this, so I'm just going to put different names. Now if you want to join these elements in a, to a string, so in this case, all you have to do is, so let me just put custom string one over here is equal to, so if you want to join them with the space, you are going to put space dot join. And as a parameter, we are going to pass this list that we have over here. Now if I put this list over here and as a custom string, I put one over here. Then if you print out the custom string to the console, you'll see that it's going to join these names together with space because here we have put space. If I put, for example, dash over here and run output, in this case, this string will be joined with the dash. So if I put underscore, it's going to be joined with the underscore. So join function is a reverse version of the split function. So with split function, we can convert string to with given delimiter. With join function, we, we can join them together. So if we just put without anything over here, it's just going to combine them in one string without any space. So this is concatenating strings without space. So you can use empty string as a delimiter also over here. Now this is how we are converting list to string and string to list. So by using join function, we are converting list to string. By using split and list functions, we are converting strings to list. So hopefully everything is clear about these functions also. Now consider a situation of recording temperatures four times a day, every day. And we need to represent this data in our application using list data structure. So how can we represent that? Because in this case, as you can see, our data in the format of rows and columns. For the first day, we have four temperatures over here. And for the second day, we have also four temperatures. And for third day and fourth day, and it continues like this. So the question is, how can we represent this data in our list? Now, the easiest way of doing this, we can just take all day's data and create four different lists over here. So if I just pass all data over here, we can easily create four different lists. So day one is equal to like this for each day's temperature. So I'm going to include all elements into one list over here. So I'm just going to quickly create this four list over here. So we have created four different lists for each day over here. Now, when our data grows each day, we have to create separate list for each day, and this is not a professional approach. And as we can see, this daily data over here are somehow related to each other. This means that we can put everything inside one list like this. So I can create another list all days is equal to, so we can put as elements over here, day one, day two, day three, and day four. So in this case, we have a list that contains four lists. And if I go ahead and print out this list, you'll be able to see its structure. So print all days. It's going to print out the list to the console like this. Now here, you'll notice that there are two brackets at the beginning over here, and there are two brackets at the end of this list over here. Now, the reason for this is that this is over here is one list, and this one is the second list, and this one is the third list, and this one is the fourth list, and everything together is another list over here. So in this case, we have four different lists in one list over here. So if a list has another list in it, in this case, it is called nested list. So nested list can be created by placing comma separated sequence of sublist. So as you can see, after each sublist, we have comma separate. So each sublist will be one element of this main list. Now to be able to create the elements of the nested list, all we have to do, we have to use indexing with multiple indexes. So here, if I just go ahead and print out the index of zero, you will see that it's going to print out only the first list to the console. Now, if I, if I want to access the first element of the list, 
In this case, first I have to put first list index, which is zero. Then the first elements index also is zero. So if I go print out this, you will see that it's printing out 11 to the console. So we have easily accessed the first list, first element over here. Now let's say we have a list like this. So as you can see, the first element is A, then B. Then in the third element, we have another list, which is nested. So in the second index, which is third element is list. So I'm going to put it like this. Then in the third element, we have G and H. Now, if you want to access the third element, which is list, we have to use second index of this my list. Now, if you access the second index, you will see that in this case, we have another list over here. And in this list, we have three elements. So the first element is double C and the second element is double D. Now in the third element, yet we have another list over here. So as you can see, we can have as many as lists inside each other. So to be able to access this list, we have to access the second element of my list. Then in the second element, we have another list. So in this another list, we have another list. So to be able to access this one, we have to put the accessing like this. So it's going to be my list with the index of two, which is accessing this, then with the index of two, we will access this. So if we want to access, for example, this element, I have to put one more bracket over here with zero index. Now, in this case, if I just go ahead and print out the values from this my list, so let's say I want to put zero index over here. So in this case, it's just going to print out A to the console. Now, at zero index, we have A, and at first index, we have B. Now, if I access second index, you will see that it's just going to print out whole this list to the console. So this list will be printed out to the console. Now, if I put one more two over here, it's going to access this list over here. So this list will be printed out to the console. Now, let's say I want to access the second element of this list, which is the nested list. All I have to do is after accessing this list, we can put with the index of one. So in this case, it's just going to print out triple F to the console, which is the last element of this list over here. Now, in case of nested list, the negative indexing is also acceptable. So we can use negative indexing by counting from backward to be able to access any nested list over here. Now, before this is located at the index of positive two. Now, if you want to access it by using negative index, all we have to do, we have to put minus three. Then if you want to access the nested list which is located in the second nested list all we have to do is we have to access first the second nested list then the third nested list by using negative indexing like this so as you can see in case of nested list also negative indexing works the way that it worked before now if you try to access the same element by using negative indexes all we have to do we have to put first the index of this list so in this case it starts from minus one, minus two, and minus three. So first we are going to put minus three over here. Then we are going to access the this list over here. So it's obvious that this is the first last element. So that's why the index of this list will be minus one. And then we have to access this element over here, which is the last element of this inner nested list. So in this case, the last element will be with the index of minus one. Now, if I run our code one more time, you will see that it's going to print out the same element to the console. So this is how negative indexing works. Now, you might be interested that can we update any value in this nested list? So as we did before, we can do it over here by using indexing. Now, if I just go ahead, for example, if I want to change the second element in this list over here, all I have to do, I need to put the name of list, then inside brackets, I have to provide index of these elements. So it's obvious that the index is one, because this is the second element in this list over here. So if I set it to, for example, let's put zero over here and then print out my list, you will see that the second element is changed over here. So as you can see, as a second element, instead of P over here, we have zero. Now let's say you want to update this element over here. So instead of triple E, I want to put, for example, triple A over here. Now in this case, all I have to do, I have to access this element with the indexing. So this element is located at this list over here, which is located at the index of two. So I'm going to put two over here. Then at the index of two, we have another list over here, which is this list. So inside this list over here, we have another list over here, which is the third element with the index of two. So I'm just going to put another bracket over here with the index of two. Then to be able to access this element, I'm going to write that element's index, which is zero. So instead of triple E over here, if I put triple A, 
and run our code, you will see that that element is changed to triple A. So the way that we are accessing it is using the indexes. So how many nested lists we have inside each other. We will have that number of the brackets over here. For example, in this case, we have three nested lists into each other. And here, as you can see, to be able to access the last list element, we have to provide three index over here. Then after accessing it, we can easily update that list any value. Now, the functions and the methods that we have learned for a list are applicable for nested lists also. So let's say if we want to add new element to this list, how can we do so? So we have learned that to be able to add an element at the end of the list, we can use append method. Now, if I just put my list and put append, for example, let's put i over here after h, you will see that it's going to add this element after h over here. Now, in this case, everything works correct without any issue. Now, the question is, if we want to add element at this second list over here. Now, in this case, all we have to do, we have to put the index of that list. So we have learned that the index of this list over here is two because this is the third element in the main list. Then we can put, for example, let's put double E over here. Now, if I run out this code, it's going to insert into this list over here as a last element. So as you can see, after this nested list over here, we have added to this list over here. Now, if you want to add another element to this list over here, which is the third nested list. In this case also, you have to access the this list. So this list located inside this list, which is the second index. And here also, this is located at the index of two. So I'm going to put index two over here. Then let's say append triple G. So if I run our code, you will see that after triple F over here, we have added new element, which is triple G over here. So we can use insert function to insert element in a specific location. So let's say we want to add this triple G before this triple E over here. So all we have to do, we have to provide the lists indexes. Then inside method, I'm going to put insert. So instead of just putting the element itself, I have to first provide the index. Now, if I run our code, you'll see that triple G will be inserted before triple E over here. So here, everything works the same, but all you have to do, you have to access the specific lists index. Now, if you haven't put anything over here, it's just going to insert this element in the main list. So if I just delete everything and run our code, you'll see that triple G will be the first element in this main list. But if you want to insert elements to this list over here, first you have to access the index of this list, then do the operation. Then if you want to insert element to this list over here, here again, you have to access first the index, then insert that element over here. Now, when we are talking about insertion, the next method that we can use is extend method. So here again, we can use to extend any list. So let's say I want to extend this second list over here. So all I have to do, I have to put the index of this list, then call extend function. Then here we can provide another list. So let's say I want to provide one, two, three. Now, if I run our code, you will see that so I have to put all of them as a list because extend method takes iterable objects, so it has to be list. So if I run our code, you will see that it's going to extend elements at the end of this second list over here. So in the second list, the third element is this nested list. So after this nested list, we have one, two, three over here. Now we can easily remove the elements from this list over here by using pop method or delete function. So in this case, so let's say I want to remove this element over here. So all I have to do I have to one more time access that list. So we have we have learned that that list located at index of two. Now, then after putting the index of this list over here, all I have to do, I have to put pop, then provide the elements that you want to pop out index. So in this case, if I want to pop out this triple E from here, all I have to put is zero index. So as you can see, after running it, you will see that triple E over here is removed. Now we can do the same operation by using delete method. So in this case, all I have to do, I have to put it like this, then I have to put the elements index as well. So if I just comment out this part and run our code, you'll see that the result will be the same. So triple E is removed from this list over here. Now the next function that we can use with the nested list is len function. So this is quite interesting. Now if I use len function for this list over here, how many elements is going to print out? Let me just create len variable. So I'm just going to put inside len function this list over here, then print out 
then to the console. So after printing out, you'll see that it's printed out five elements to the console. But if you count the elements, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we have eight elements over here. The reason it returns five, it's counting only the elements of my list. So this is one element, this is second element, this whole list is the third element, and this fourth element, and this is fifth element. So as you can see, we have five elements. Now, if you want to count the elements of this list over here, all you have to do, you have to provide the index of that list. So if I just provide the index of that list, in this case, it's going to print out three because in this list over here, we have three elements. So this is one element, this is second element, and this is third element. Now, if I want to count the elements of this third nested list over here, here again, I have to provide the index of this nested list as well. So if I run our code, you will see that in this case, it's printing two because we have only two elements inside this list over here. Now, the last operation that I'm going to perform is iterating through list over here. So we can write for loop like this. So for item in my list, I'm just going to print out item to the console. So you will see that it's going to print out each element of this main list over here. So the first element is A, then B, then the third element is the list itself. So it's printing out list itself. Now, if you want to access this list's element, all you have to do, you have to write another loop inside this main loop over here. So it's going to be nested loop. So I can put for item two in item. So in this case, we have to put item. Then here, I'm just going to print out item two. Now, after writing this, if I just remove this print statement from here to exclude the duplicate values and run our code, you will see that it's accessing the second list elements like this. But when it reached the third list, it's printing out the list itself. Now, if I put one more loop inside this loop, it's going to access all elements of all lists over here. So in this case, I need to put item two, and then I'm going to print out item three over here. So after doing so, if I run our code, you will see that it's going to print out all elements to the console. So it's printing out A, then B, then it's printing out C and D two times. Now you might be interested that why we have double C over here and double T. So it's recognizing this as a string and it's looping through these elements as well over here. But if you have integer over here, this will not going to happen. So let's say uh, instead of this list over here, let me just create another list in which we will have the list like this. So I'm just going to put, for example, one, two, three. So here again, I'm going to put another nested list Four, five, six. Then let's put another nested list, seven, eight, nine. So as you can see, we have only uh, two level lists over here. So inside the main list, we have three different lists. So we don't have third nested list. So this means that we can delete this uh, loop from here. So instead of printing out item three, I'm just going to print out item two. Now, if I run our code, you will see that in this case, all elements will be printed out without any issue. So there is no duplication in this case. So that, as you can see, all elements are printed out to the console. Now, this is how it works in case of integer list like this. So if we have second level nested list over here, all we have to do, we have to write two loops each other. Now, if you have some elements over here, for example, zero and one, in this case, if we try to put another loop over here for this list over here, it's going to raise an error saying that integers are not iterable so we cannot loop through the integers so before it was string so we were successfully looping through the strings but in case of integers over here we cannot loop through the integers so in this case we cannot loop through the, these elements over here so with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture i have combined everything related to nested lists together to show you how nested lists work so hopefully everything is clear about nested lists Now in this lecture, we'll talk about objects and values. Even though this lecture is a part of object-oriented programming, I decided to explain a little bit about objects over here to show you how aliasing and referencing works with the list. Now, when it comes to object, everything in Python is called object. So an object in Python is a simple thing. To describe it slightly more technical, an object represents a value a variable can refer to. For instance, if I just create a variable x over here, in which we have one. In this case, x refers to the, an object representing the value one. All objects in Python are represented by generalized structure used to describe and access a particular value's information and methods. One such piece of information is an object type. Now we have learned that to determine the type of object, 
you can use built-in function of Python, which is called type. So if I put over here print type of x, in this case, you will see that x is the type of integer. So which refers to the value of 1, which is numeric. So that's why it's integer. Alternatively, if x refers to the string, in this case, it will be an instance of string. Of course, there is more to objects than just their type. For something to be an object in the first place, it has to exist in the memory. So to view the memory address of particular object, we can use ID function. So instead of type over here, if I put ID, you will see that it's going to print out ID of this object in the memory. So this is the ID that we have in the memory. Now, there are a lot of things to learn about the object. So here, I just want to give you a short instruction about object. Now, in this case, for example, if we execute these two statements over here, so I have a variable of A in which we have Apple. So I'm just going to copy this and pass it over here and assign Apple to the B variable. So if we execute these statements, we know that A and B both refer to the string, but we don't know whether they refer to the same string or not. There are two possible cases. In one case, A and B refer to the different objects that they have same value. In the second case, they refer to the same object. Now to check whether two variables refer to the same object, you can use is operator. So in this case, if I just go ahead and print out A is B, you will see that it's going to print out true to the console. So this means that in this example, Python only created one string object and both A and B variables refer to these objects over here. But when it comes to the list, if we create two lists like this, so instead of apple over here, I'm just going to create two lists. So I'm going to create the same list for both variables. So A will be referenced to this list and B also will be referenced to this list. In this case, if I just go ahead and print out one more time A is B, you will see that it's going to print out false. This means that they are not referring to the same object over here. In this case, we will say that these two lists are equivalent because they have the same elements, but they are not identical because they are not the same object. If two objects are identical, they are also equivalent. But if they are equivalent, they are not necessarily identical. Until now, we have been used object and value interchangeably. But it's more precise to say that an object has a value. So if we execute A is equal to the list of 1, 2, 3, A refers to the a list object whose value is particular sequence of elements over here, which are 1, 2, 3. So in this case, instead of B over here, if we just create A like this and assign A to B and print out this message to the console, you will see that in this case, both of these variables are referring to the same object. The association of a variable with an object is called reference. So in this example, there are two references to the same object. So this is the list and A and B are referencing to the same object over here. An object with more than one reference has more than name. So we can say that object is alias. So here, the problem is, if the alias object is mutable, chains made with one alias affect the another. So this means that if I just go ahead, delete, for example, first element of B like this, and then print out A to the console, you will see that it's going to affect A also. So it's going to delete the first element from A also. So as you can see, in case of mutable objects, it's very dangerous to use it because we have deleted the element from B, but it affected A also because both of them are referencing to the same object. Although this behavior can be useful, it's error prone. In general, it is safer to avoid alias when you are working with mutable objects. For immutable objects like strings, aliasing is not as much as problem because for example in case of string we cannot change the string they are immutable so in this case there's not much different if we are creating aliasing or not because these objects are immutable so we cannot modify these objects over here now another interesting moment is when you pass a list to a function the function gets reference to the list if the function modifies a list parameter then it's going to affect the original list itself so let's say we have a function like this. So I'm just going to create a new function. Let's declare function set that delete first. So this function is responsible for deleting first element of list. So as a parameter, it's going to take list. So I'm just going to put delete p list with the index of zero. 
Now, if I create a list like this, so let's say my list is equal to one, two, three, four, five. Then if I call this function for this list, I'm going to put my list. Then if I just print out my list to the console, you'll see that the first element of this my list is deleted. So as you can see, it affected the original list also. So we are passing this list as a parameter to this function, but it's affecting the original list also because uh, this is mutable object and function gets reference to this original list over here. So that's why it's deleting first element from the original list. So that's why it's really important to differentiate the operations that modify the list and the operations that create a new list. So for example, if you use append method, we know that append method modifies the list as delete method over here. So if I put instead of deletion over here, plist.append, for example, let's append one at the end of this list and run our code, you'll see that it's going to affect also the original list over here. So for example, if we change this method, to return the list by using slice operator. So for example, if I put slice operator like this, so it's going to uh, skip the first element of this list and then print out the rest element. So if I run our code, you will see that it's not going to affect the uh, main list over here. But if I just print out the output from this list, you will see that it's going to return the elements in which the first element is missing. So that's why you have to be very careful when you are using a list as a, a function argument so you have to differentiate the methods which can modify the original list or which is returning new list. So I just showed you an example in which it's just returning the new list, it's not modifying the list itself. So with this, you have got a basic knowledge about the objects. Now you have learned that how can it affect the lists over here. So see you in the next lecture. All right, welcome back to the brand new section of the Python for Everyone course. So the section name is Dictionaries. So in this section, we will talk about everything related to Python dictionaries. We will discuss dictionary operations, traversal of dictionary, dictionary methods, then we are going to compare lists with the dictionary, then we'll continue with the key methods, item methods, then we are going to concatenate the dictionaries, then we will use operators with the dictionary, then we will split and merge the dictionary, then after that, we are going to learn nested dictionary and references. Then while learning these ones, we are going to do lots of exercises that are related to these topics. Now, after finishing the topics, one more time, we are going to continue to implement them in real life projects. The first project that is related to dictionaries will be calculate the total price. So here we are going to create a program that calculates the price of item that we want to buy. When the program starts, it will display the list of items using available parse dictionary. Then program asks to select an item. Then based on user selected item, the program checks if the item exists in the store or not. Because when the quantity of item is zero, then it's going to print out out of stock. Finally, if it is not the out of stock, we calculate the total price of items and decrease the quantity from the stock. This continues until user selects zero. When the loop is terminated, the total price is printed to the console. So in this program, we are going to implement dictionaries. Then the next project will be blind auction. So this is also called first price sealed bid auction. So it's a common type of auction. It's also known as blind auction. In this type of auction, all bidders simultaneously submit sealed bids so that no bidder knows any other participant. The biggest bidder pays the price that was submitted. So when we develop this project, we are going to print the first logo, which is going to be blind auction. Then we are going to ask the username and then we are going to ask their bid. If there is another user, then they will type yes. Then the program asks for the next bidder by cleaning everything from the console. Finally, if there is not another bidder, the program will return the highest bidder with the bid amount. Then the last project that is related to dictionary will be quiz app. So here we are going to create a program that simulates the quiz app. So the first thing that we will do, we will print out the logo. Then we are going to ask for players and start with the first player. For each question, a player can attempt two times. If the first attempt is false, then the current player can attempt the second time. If the second time the answer is incorrect, we switch the players. If from the first attempt the answer is correct, we switch the players and the next question will be answered by the next player. 
Finally, if there is not any question left, we print out the winner and ask if they want to see the correct answers. If they put yes, we print the questions with the answers. If they put no, then we are going to terminate our program. So these are really interesting projects that are related to Python dictionary. And we are going to practice what we have learned in this section by implementing these projects. So once you are ready, head over to the next lesson to get started. Now in this section, I want to talk about dictionaries in Python. Now dictionaries in Python work kind of similarly to dictionaries in real life. So if you look at inside a real dictionary, we will find words and each word has a combining explanation and meaning. So if we look up a word in a dictionary, let's say we are looking for the word Miller, then you might find the definition as a person who owns or works in a corn mill. So the dictionaries are very useful because they allow us to group together and tag related piece of information. So this is a similar concept in Python, in which we can express the preceding dictionary entry like this, where a key is a verb from a real dictionary and a value is a accompanying explanation which will be the equivalent of actual definition of word. So in this case, our word is Miller. So it's going to be key in the dictionary and the definition of a Miller, which is a person who owns or works in a Cornwall, will be the value in a Python dictionary. So the way we can think about dictionary is in the form of table. So every dictionary has two parts. On the left hand side is the key and that is the equivalent of word in the dictionary. And it's also got an associated value on the right side, which is the definition of word in real dictionary. Now let's say we took this simple table of definitions of words that we have over here. And we can go ahead and try to convert it to into a Python dictionary. So the question is, how did we do that? So let's take the first one and look at that one. So the first thing that we need to do is to create dictionary. And to do that in Python, this is what syntax looks like. So we have a set of curly braces and everything that is inside the curly braces is the content of our dictionary. The key goes first, followed by a column and then followed by value. In our table, in our table, we have got this word Miller, which is the key. So we can replace that one over here in our dictionary. So the value that's associated with this key is a definition for Miller. So the person who owes or works in a Corbin that becomes the value and can be replaced over here in place of the value after the column. So here we have got an actual dictionary using Python code. So the question is, what if we want to have more than one entry in our dictionary that we had in the table before? So in this case, we will separate each of key value pairs using comma. Then we can continue adding key and value pairs until the end of our dictionary over here. So as you can see in this table, which represents the dictionary, we have three words over here and we have three definitions for this word. And here, when we create Python dictionary, we will have these words as a key and we will have this definition as a value over here. So we are going to separate them by using this comma over here until the end of dictionary. Now in the previous section, we have learned about list and we know that list and other collection type where the sequence of data matter most. So for example, if we have a list like this, to access the first element, we need to use index. So we are going to put the list name, then inside square brackets, we are going to put the index. So if you put zero over here, it's going to access the first element. If you put one, it's going to access the second element. If you put two, it's going to access third element because the index in list starts from zero. Now, in case of dictionary, it works slightly different. The data organized using key and value pairs. So here we will retrieve data using the key. So we are going to put the dictionary name, then inside this square brackets, we are going to put the key that we have in the dictionary. So when we put that, we are going to access the value of that specific key in the dictionary. So to understand the difference between list and dictionary, let's look at real life example. So let's say you got a job at a local cinema in their clock room. So in order to organize clock room so that it's as efficient as possible, you have devised a way of taking customer codes and hanging them on a code hanger sequentially. So as a new customer comes in, you hang the codes on the next available code hanger and give them ticket that identifies the number of code hanger. So as more and more customer come in, you hang the codes on sequentially and give out ticket numbers. So once the film is over, the customers come back looking for their codes. As long as they give you their ticket number, you will be able to use to identify the hanger number and give them their code jacket back. So this is the equivalent of list 
where data gets filled in sequentially and you can use that position in the list in order to identify the data that is associated. So asking the list for the zero items gives you this particular code jacket. Now the problem arises when your customer are getting a little bit drunk and they have lost their ticket. Now without that number, there are a whole bunch of code jackets that look very similar to each other and you won't be able to easily identify whose code belongs to whom. So to avoid this situation, here is a different way of organizing Cloakroom. Instead of hanging the codes up sequentially, you ask each customer for their name. You write down their name on a piece of paper and you take it onto the code jacket. Then you can hang the code on any of the free code hangers and the name label that's stuck to the code will identify whose code jacket is this. For example, the first customer's name is Eddie. You are going to put the label like this and hang it in the next available code hanger. Then the second customer's name, Teddy. So it's going to be like this. You are going to write their name and hang it in the next available code hanger and it continues like this. So even if our customers get a little bit tipsy, hopefully they won't forget their name. So as long as they provide their name, you will be able to identify the code jacket that is associated with it. So this is the equivalent of dictionary. In this case, the sequence does not matter. The name is the key and the code that is associated with this key is value. Hopefully with this example, you have understood what makes a dictionary different than list. So in a list, the index positions has to be integer. In a dictionary, the indices can be any type. As we shown over here, the index is the string, which is the name. So with this, we have identified what is a dictionary and what is the difference between dictionary and list that we have learned in our previous section. Now in the next lecture, let's create a Python dictionary in practice. All right, let's take a look at dictionaries in action. So here I have already added the dictionary that we were defining earlier on, and I've stored it inside a variable called my dictionary. Now currently I've only got two entities in the dictionary the definition for the miller and the definition for the programmer. Now, the first thing that I want to highlight is when you create a dictionary that has more than one element, such as in this case, then you need to take care to format it properly, which is more easily readable. So what you will see Python programmers do by convention is that they will start off dictionary with the open curl brace at the top. Then every subsequent entry is indented by one indent. So after this open curl brace over here, they're going to, you need to hit enter. Then after the first pair and values, you need to provide a comma. Then after comma, one more time, you need to hit enter over here to put the next entry as indented level with the first value over here. And finally, the last curly blaze should go over here with the indentation level with these pairs over here. And another thing that's quite nice to do is to cap off all entries in your dictionary or list with comma. So here, after each element, we need to provide comma. So after the last element also, I'm going to provide comma. This means that if you needed to add more items in the dictionary, you just simply hit enter over here and add your pairs to this indented level over here. So if you want to add another entry, it is as simple as adding in the K colon and the value. So in this case, as you remember in our table, the third key was app. So I'm just going to put app like this. Then after the key, I'm going to provide column. Then after column, I'm going to provide the definition of app over here. So as you know, it's an application, especially as downloaded by a user to a mobile device. So now our dictionary represents exactly the same data as we had in our table over here with a bunch of key value pairs and total of three entries. Now this is how we created dictionary of these entries in the table. Now, very often when you are writing code, it can be really helpful to start out with empty dictionary. Just as you saw previously, we can create an empty list by having a set of square brackets with nothing inside. You can also create an empty dictionary by simply creating a set of curly braces with nothing inside. So here, if I just comment out this part, so I'm just going to create my dictionary as an empty dictionary. So I'm just going to put in my dictionary is equal to, so here I'm just going to provide empty curly braces. Now, if I go ahead, print out this dictionary to the console, you'll see that it's just printing out empty dictionary to the console. Only we have two empty curly braces over here. Now, an alternative way of creating empty dictionary is by using built-in function of dict function. So if I put it like this, dict, and run our code, you will see that one more time it's printing out this empty dictionary to the console. So, so we have two empty curly braces over here. Now, after creating empty dictionary, 
then at a later stage, you can add some elements to this dictionary. Now, on the other hand, you might actually want to wipe out entire dictionary. So here, if I put like this, empty curly braces, I'm creating a new empty dictionary by creating this pair of curly braces with nothing inside. And I can also wipe an existing dictionary by simply doing the same thing. So we know that over here, if I just uncomment these values over here, and I'm just going to put this print statement here to be able to see the result from the dictionary that we created over here. Then we are going to set my dictionary to the empty dictionary. Then I'm going to print out my dictionary to the console one more time. Now, if I go ahead and run our code, you will see that first our dictionary was like this, in which we have three value pairs. Then after setting it to empty list, it just deleted all elements from this dictionary and it set it to empty dictionary over here. So this can be very useful if you wanted to clear out user's progress. For example, if a game restarts and you want to clear all scores and statistics, you can just do it by using these empty curly braces over here. Now, the next thing I want to show you over here is what if we want to retrieve an item from the dictionary? Now, we know that in case of list, so I'm just going to create a sample list over here. Let me play, create my list. So in this list, I'm going to have three elements. So I'm just going to copy the values of this dictionary to this list. So this is the list of strings. So we have three values over here. So we have learned that to access the elements of the list, to retrieve the elements from the list, we need to put list name. So I'm just going to put list name. Then inside square brackets, we need to provide index of the elements. So index starts from zero. So this element is located at the index of zero. The programmer is located at the index of one. The app is located at the index of two. So if I put over here and print out this one to the console, you will see that it's accessing the programmer over here. So programmer printed out to the console. Now the question is, how can we access the elements of the dictionary? Now, in this case, all we have to do is tap onto the dictionary, then add the square brackets, then inside square brackets, we are going to provide the key of dictionary. So in this case, I'm going to put the dictionary name, so which is my dictionary. So here again, be careful that we are not putting curly braces to access the elements, we are putting square brackets, then we are putting inside square brackets the key value. So I'm just going to copy key from here and pass it over here. So one more time, let me just print out this one to the console. So to make our console clear, I'm just going to comment this print statement. So if I run our code, you'll see that it's going to print out the value of Miller in the dictionary. So which says that the meaning of Miller is a person who owns or works in a corn mill. Now it's really, really important that you make sure that when you are fetching something out of dictionary, by it is key, that you actually spell the key correct. A really, really common error is when you are trying to retrieve something out of dictionary, you just made a simply type error. So here, instead of Miller, if I put Miller's and rerun our code, you will see that Python raises key error. So it tells us that it's a key error referring to this particular key and it highlights this line nine, where we are trying to retrieve something out of dictionary by using this key. Basically, it's telling you that this key does not actually exist and it cannot be found. And it does not know what is that you want. So remember that we have a similar error in the list also. So if I just comment out this part, so I'm just going to uncomment this part. So here we saw that we see that we have three elements. So this means that the last element's index is two. So if I put over here three and run our code, you'll see that in the index also we had index error. So it was showing that list out of index. So this means that the element with this index does not exist in the list. So we have the same kind of error over here when we are typing the key value incorrect. So we have to be very careful that we are typing the keys correctly over here. Now, another common pitfall that students fall into is they don't actually use the correct data type. For example, if we define this dictionary without putting these quotes around each of these keys, then it's going to give us error and it, it will not let us to run this code over here. So I'm just going to delete these quotes from the keys. So if I put it like this, so we know that these keys are string. So if I put it like this and try to run our code, you will see that in this case, it raises error. Basically, it says us Miller is not defined because it thinks that this is a variable and you have to declare it somewhere over here and we have not declared it. So we can declare Miller as a variable and pass it as a key over here. But when we are writing straight away the keys, we have to 
put it as a string over here. So when we have a key that's a string, and when we are trying to retrieve the data from that key, you also have to make sure that you provide the key in its actual type. So here I'm just going to make them all string. So our keys are string. So instead of string over here, if I just provide Miller, you'll see that one more time we are receiving error. So you have to be very careful about the type of keys that you are providing over here. So when you are retrieving the, the data from the dictionary, this is also applicable over here that you have to provide the type of key very correctly. Now, if I go ahead, put one more pair over here. Let me just put one through three. So I'm going to put as a value one, two, one, two, three. So if I just try to access this value over here by using this key, instead of string over here, I'm just going to provide the number. So if I go ahead and run our code, you will see that in this case, it's printing out one, two, three. So as you can see, we have to be very careful about the data type of keys. So that's how you retrieve items from dictionary by adding square brackets and then giving the keys. And after doing so, it will look for the key inside dictionary and it will return the value of that key inside this dictionary over here. So this is how we are retrieving values from the dictionary. Now with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So hopefully everything is clear about how we are creating dictionary and how we are retrieving values of keys from the dictionary. So see you in the next lecture. All right, as mentioned before, dictionaries are mutable. We can add new items or to change the value of existing items using assignment operator. If the key is already present, the value gets updated. Otherwise, a new value pair is added to dictionary. Now, if you want to add a piece of data, such as that we had earlier in our dictionary like this, and we want to add it programmatically, how we can add it? Now, to do this, it's very simple. So all we have to do is, we have to tap into dictionary, which is called, in this case, my dictionary, then we are going to use square brackets and define the key. So to add these elements to this dictionary over here, first I'm just going to comment this dictionary. So I'm going to create a new dictionary, which is called my dictionary. So I'm going to create an empty dictionary over here. Now we are going to add these elements to this dictionary by using assignment operator and values. Now, as I mentioned before, to be able to do that, first we have the right dictionary name. So I'm just going to put my dictionary, then square brackets. So inside square brackets, we are going to provide the key. So if the key is a type of string, we are going to put it inside quotes. Otherwise, if it is number, we are going to provide as it is. So in this case, our keys is string. So I'm just going to put quotes over here. So I'm going to write it like this Miller. Then we are going to put assignment operator. So after assignment operator, we can put the value of this key over here. Now in this case, the value is a person who owns or works in a corner. Now, after doing so, if I go ahead and print out my dictionary, you will see that in this case, we have one element in our dictionary. Now, I'm going to put this print statement after the creation of dictionary. So first we are creating empty dictionaries, then we are going to print out that dictionary to the console, then we are going to add new value pairs to the dictionary, then one more time print out to the console. Now, if I run our code, you will see that initially our dictionary was empty then we have one element over here now if i go ahead and add one more element to the dictionary so if i put it like this one more time i'm going to put the name of dictionary then square brackets so inside square brackets i'm going to put the second value pair so in this case it's going to be key programmer and the value of this one is a person who writes computer programs. So you can put it inside double quotes as well so it doesn't matter actually over here so if i rerun our code you will see that in this case, we have two elements in our dictionary. Now, if I continue to add the app also, it's going to be three elements. So this is how addition of new element works in case of Python dictionary. Now, this method of tapping into dictionary using key to fetch the relevant item from it, then doing something with it goes beyond just adding. You can also use the same logic to update an item in dictionary. For example, let me go ahead and tap in the dictionary one more time with the same key. So I'm just going to put my dictionary. Then I'm going to put the same key, which is programmer. So if I just print out this one to the console, you will see that in this case, we will have a person who writes computer program. Now, if I use the same logic as assignment statement and assign something different to this programmer over here. So instead of person, let me just put a developer 
who writes a program. So I'm just going to put developer over here and rerun our code. You will see that first it was like this. So after rerunning it, I just, I'm just going to print out dictionary one more time to the console. So you'll see that first the value of programmer was a person who writes computer programs. Then in the second dictionary, it is like this, a developer who writes computer programs. So as you can see, we can use the same logic to update the value of dictionary. So what it does over here is it's going to look through the dictionary and find the value with this key then assign it to whatever I put on the right side of the equal sign. On the other hand, if it finds nothing with that key, then it's going to create a new entry with the value again, which is on the right side of the equal sign. Now, for example, instead of programmer over here, if I put double error over here and rerun our code, you will see that in this case, it's going to add it as a third pairs over here. So in this case, programmer is different key, and programmer with double R is different key. So that's why whenever we are using it in the assignment statement, it's going to look for this key in the dictionary. If it does not exist over there, it's going to create a new key and assign this value to that key. Otherwise, if it does exist there, it's going to change the value of current key with the new value, which is on the right side of this assignment statement over here. So this is how we can add and update key value pairs to the dictionary by using assignment operator. So hopefully everything is clear about addition and updating of elements in the dictionary. So in this lecture, we are going to look at dictionary traversal. So what does dictionary traversal means? It means we are going to loop through a dictionary. Now in our previous section, we have learned that we can loop through the list using for loop or we can use while loop. So in this case, for for loop, it's going to be like this. For item in my list, so we can print out the item to the console. So if I go ahead and hit run, you will see that it's going to print out all elements one by one. Now the question is, if I do the same loop operation for the dictionary, what will happen? Is it going to print out all pairs or is it going to print out only value or it is going to print out the key? So what do you think? So let's try it and see how this is working. So here, instead of my list, I'm just going to put my dictionary. So we are writing the same for loop. So in this case, for item in my dictionary, I'm just going to print out item. Now, if I go ahead and run it, you'll see that in this case also, it's printing out these values to the console, which are keys in our dictionary. Now, you might be thinking that this is coming from the this list. So I'm just going to delete that list from there and rerun our code you'll see that in this case also it's printing out only the keys. So whenever we are looping through the dictionary, it's going to print out the keys to the console. So instead of item over here, every time we need to provide key. Now, if I want to access the value of this key over here, all I have to do, I have to tap into the dictionary. So I'm just going to put comma over here and put the dictionary name, my dictionary. Then inside square brackets, I'm going to put key. Now, if I rerun our code, you will see that in this case, it's printing out first the key, then the value that is associated with this key over here. So this is how looping through a dictionary works. Now, if you are searching through a dictionary for a specific key, you can also use the for loop. So in this case, inside this for loop, we can write it like this. So let's say we are looking if app is exists in this dictionary or not. So we are just going to put it if condition like this. If key is equal to app, in this case, we can just print out saying that it exists in the dictionary. And we can go ahead and print out the value of app after this message to the console. So we can put it like this, my dictionary, and inside square brackets, we are just going to pass key. Now, if I rerun our code, you will see that in this case, it says that it exists in the dictionary, then it's printing out the value of that key to the console. Now, otherwise, if I just provide instead of app 3p over here and rerun our code, you'll see that in this case, it's not going to print anything to the console because this key does not exist in our dictionary over here. So that's how looping through dictionary works. So you have to keep on mind that whenever you are looping through a dictionary, it's going to print out the keys. So to be able to access the values, all we have to do is we have to tap into the dictionary and use this key that we are getting from this loop. So this is how looping works with the dictionary. So hopefully everything is clear about this. Now in this lecture, we are going to learn how can we delete elements of dictionary. 
Now I want you to go to the resource section of this course and open the start file for removing the elements of dictionary. Now there are several ways of deleting an element from dictionary. The first method that we are going to use is the built-in method of dictionary which is called pop method. This method removes an item with the provided key and returns the value of removed item. So to be able to use the pop method, we are going to put the dictionary name. In our case, it's going to be my dictionary. Then we are going to put dot and we are going to put pop. As a parameter, we are going to provide a key of value which we want to delete. So in this case, let's say I want to delete programmer from this dictionary over here. So here I'm just going to put programmer inside pop function. Then I'm going to print out dictionary to the console to see how this is working. Now, if I run our code, you will see that after running, we have left only two elements in our dictionary. So programmer key and value has been removed from the dictionary. Now we have said that this is returning the value of the removed element. So in this case, if I just put result like this and print out result to the console, instead of dictionary in this time, I'm going to print out result to the console and run our code, you will see that it's going to print out the value of this key over here, which is programmer and the value is a person who writes computer programs. Now, if I go ahead and print out after this result, my dictionary, you will see that this programmer key and value is missing from the dictionary. So in this case, we have only two value pairs in our dictionary. Now, the question is, if I put wrong key over here, what will happen? So in this case, instead of programmer, let me just put double R over here and run our code, you'll see that it gives us key error. So this means that this key does not exist in this dictionary. Now you might be interested that how can we prevent these cases? Now to prevent these cases, we can provide a default value when we are calling pop function. So this means that as a second parameter, we can provide default value. So for example, we can put it like this. The key does not exist. Now in this case, if I run our program, it's not going to raise an error. It's just going to assign this default value that we have provided over here to this result over here. Now, if I run our code, you will see that when we are printing out result to the console, it says that the key does not exist. Now, for simplicity, I have provided a message over here. Normally, many developers provide none over here. Now, if I run our code, you will see that it's going to print out none to the console. But if the key is correct, in this case, it's not going to go to the this part of the code, it's going to delete the specified key from the dictionary. So that's how it works. So this pop function is very useful in many cases when you are deleting an element from the dictionary and you want to use that dictionary in somewhere else. So we are going to use in our upcoming exercises. So for now, you just need to know that pop methods removes a value from a dictionary based on the key and returns that value as a result. Now let's continue to the second method. The second method is pop item method. Pop item method removes and return key value pair from the dictionary in the last in and first order. So this means that it returns the latest inserted pair from the dictionary and removes the returned element pair from the dictionary. Now before Python version 3.7, it was removing an arbitrary element pair from the dictionary. Now after Python 3.7, it is working based on last in first out order. So the last element that we have inserted is going to be come out when we are calling pop item method. Now in this case, instead of pop method, if I put over here pop item, so it's not going to take any parameter. So if I just run our code, you will see that as a result, we have this pair, which is, which is the key app and the value is an application especially downloaded by a user to a mobile device. So this is the last key pair that we have inserted in our dictionary. So that's why this is deleted from our dictionary and pop item method returns that key value pair and it has removed them from the dictionary. So as you can see in this dictionary over here, when we are printing out over here, you see that we have only two key pairs in our dictionary. So if you look at carefully to this output over here, you can see that it is returning key and value together. So in case of pop method, it was returning only the value, but in case of pop item method, it is returning key and value. So this is how pop item method works when we are deleting elements from the dictionary. Now, the next way of deleting elements from the dictionary is using del keyword. So in this case, it's not going to return anything. It's just going to delete an element 
from the dictionary based on the key so here the syntax is like this first we are putting del keyword then we are putting dictionary name which is my dictionary in our case then we are going to provide in square brackets key so in this case let me just provide it as a miller now if i run our code you will see that this first key pair is removed from the dictionary so we have successfully deleted it so by using del keyword we are just deleting an element from the dictionary based on their key without returning anything now then finally the last method that we can delete elements from the dictionary is clear method of dictionary so this is also built-in method with this we are deleting all elements from the dictionary now the syntax is like this so here again we are going to put the dictionary name which is my dictionary then dot clear so it's not going to take any parameter now if i run our code you will see that it's just going to delete all elements of dictionary so the dictionary becomes empty dictionary in this case so we have learned that if we have two curly braces like this this means that this is empty dictionary with this we can successfully delete all elements of dictionary so this is very useful when you are resetting the initial values or for example if you have saved some scores in the dictionary you can restart your game by calling clear method so it's going to delete all values from the dictionary now with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture we have learned how can we delete elements from the dictionary in four various ways Now in this lecture we are going to learn in and not in operators in python dictionaries basically the in operator in python checks whether a specified value is a constituent element of sequence like string list or tuple when used in a condition the statement returns a boolean result evaluating into either true or false when the specified value is not found inside the sequence the statement returns true whereas when it is not found we get a false now we have learned that in case of list and string when we are using the in operator it works like this so i'm just going to create a sample list over here list one is equal to so let's put numbers from one to six now if i use in operator with this you will see that it's going to check that if the value that we are checking is in this list or not so i'm just going to go ahead and print out something like this print let's put two in list one so if i put something like this and run our program you will see that in this case it's returning true because we have two inside this list over here now if i change it for example to nine and run our code you will see that in this case it's returning false so this means that nine does not exist in our list over here now this is working similarly with the strings as well so if i go ahead create another string over here let's put string one is equal to let's put i love python now in this case if i go ahead and check that for example love exists in this string one so if i put love in string one run our code you will see that in this case it's returning true so this means that love exists in our string over here now if i put for example something different like for example and run our code in this case you will see that it's returning false so this is how in operator works in case of list and string now not in operator in python works exactly the opposite way as the in operators it also checks the presence of a specified value inside given a sequence but it returns values are totally opposite to that of in operator when used in the condition if the specified value is exist in the sequence it's going to return false so in this case if i put love over here and put none not in operator you will see that in this case it's returning false because love exists inside this string over here now if i put like and run our code you'll see that in this case it's returning true because like does not exist inside this string over here so same thing is applicable for the list as well so if i put over here one and put the list name so if i run our code you'll see that in this case it returns false one exists inside this list but if i put not open not in operator it's going to return false so for the values that are exist in the list is going to return false for the values that are not exist in the list it's going to return true so if i put for example nine and run our code you'll see that in this case it's going to return true now in case of python dictionary in and not in operator works differently so we have said that in and not in operators works in this way in the sequences but the dictionaries are not sequences unlike the sequences dictionaries are indexed on the base of keys so how does the 
in and not in operators work on the dictionary. And if they do work with the dictionary, how do they evaluate the condition? So let's try to understand it with the example. So I'm just going to delete this print statement from here. I'm going to create another dictionary, which is going to be my dict like this. So here I'm going to put one, then string one. So let me just put it quickly over here. So this is how our dictionary looks like. Now I'm going to use in operator with this dictionary to see how this is working. So I'm just going to write print. So here as a value, we have one. So I'm just going to put over here one in my dict. So it's my dict one. So if I just run our code, you will see that in this case, it's going to print out false, but we can see that the value exists in the dictionary, but it's printing out false. So the question is why it's doing like this. Now, the thing is, when we are running in operator, not in operator with the dictionary, it's going to check only keys. So it's not checking the values, it's checking for the keys. So in this case, if I, instead of one over here, if I put the one itself and run our code, you will see that in this case, it's printing out true. So in case of dictionary, it is working with the keys. It's not working with the values. So if I put, for example, one not in, you will see that in this case, it's going to return false it's because one exists over here is going to return false for this case. Now, if I put as a value nine and run our code, you will see that in this case, it's returning true. So not in and in operators goes and check that if the value exists in the dictionary or not. But in case of string and list is going to check the values that we have over here. Now, as another example, if I put three in my dig and run our code, you will see that in this case, it's returning true. So this is how in and not in operator works in case of dictionary. So whenever you are using in and not in operators in case of dictionary, you have to be very careful that it is working only with the keys. It's not working with the values. Both of them are checking if the key exists in the dictionary or not. So hopefully you have understood how in and not in operators work in case of dictionary. Now, till now we have seen lists as well as dictionaries. Now here, I want to talk about a concept that you often see in both of these collection types, and that's something called nesting. Now, if you imagine a list or a dictionary being something like a folder where lots of things can be stored inside it, the nesting list and dictionaries is just a matter of putting one folder into another. For example, here's a dictionary that's very simple. It has only one value pair. Now we know that we can add multiple key value pairs in the same dictionary by just adding a bunch of commas to separate them. Now, what if instead of having a simple value like a string or number, I could also put a list as a value over here. Similarly, we could use a dictionary as a value in this key value pair. In this case, we have got a list as a value for the key, which is the first one, and we have got a dictionary as a value for key one, which is the second one in this case. The structure gets a little bit more complex, but it gives us more flexible when you are trying to store more complex pieces of data. Coming back to our code, let's say we have created a simple dictionary like this. So the name of dictionary is programming language. So for each person over here, for each user, we have selected their favorite programming language. So in this case, for Elshad, favorite programming language is Python. For Renaud, favorite programming language is Scratch. And for Eddie, the favorite programming language is Java. So as you can see, dictionary contains usernames as a key and the programming language that they love as a value. So this is very simple dictionary that we have seen already. Now, if I want to, to nest a list in a dictionary, then I will be able to represent more complex data. For example, if someone has more than one favorite programming language, how can we write it over here? So for example, for Elshad, the favorite programming languages are Python. Then if I go ahead, for example, put Java, then let's add one more over here, C Sharp, you will see that in this case, our code editor raises an error saying that there's something wrong with these the dictionary declaration. So if I go ahead and run it, you'll see that in this case also we have syntax error over here because each key can only have one value in case of dictionary. The only way that we can make these three pieces of data one value is turning it into a list. So this means that if I put over here square brackets 
and close it over here is going to be a list so after that after this list we need to provide comma because it's going to count as a value all this as a value so after value we need to provide comma now if i go ahead and run it you'll see that in this case we don't have any problem so in our programming language dictionary as represented by curly braces over here we have one key and one value for each pair so in this case for this key which is airshot the value is list over here so because in this case airshot has more than one programming language as a favorite program language and of course you can go ahead and add as many as entries as you would like and still preserving this kind of structure of key being a string and the value being a list now the idea of nesting is not limited dictionaries by that way as we learned before we can have a list inside list and you could also just nest a list inside another list so for example let's say we have a list like this so my list is equal to from let's do one two three four five so inside this list we can have another list for the next element which we have learned before so here i can put one two then i can have another nested list like this for five and here this code is perfectly valid python code but it's not quite as useful as nesting a list in a dictionary or a dictionary in a dictionary because the way that the data structure now if i wanted to nest a dictionary inside a dictionary how can we do that let's say we want to expand our programming language dictionary and instead of storing programming language that we love what if we want to also keep the track of years of experience that we have in that specific programming language or what if we want to actually label what this piece of data over here because at the moment is a kind of like here is a bunch of programming language that's associated with a username and it does not really describe the meaning of this list over here so by nesting a dictionary we can label this list as a favorite programming language so all we need to do is to create a string after the airshot over here so i'm not going to touch this so let me just comment over here nesting list inside dictionary so i'm just going to delete this part and i'm just going to copy this again from here and pass it over here inside we are going to put nesting dictionary inside dictionary so we are going to label this list over here so what i'm going to do after this column over here i'm going to put favorite language of course this is going to be string then after this key i'm going to put another column over here then we have one more step left because this is going to be another dictionary so we have to put this one inside another curly braces over here so it's going to be like this curl brace like this now in this case we have another dictionary which is this dictionary curl braces like this inside this program language dictionary and inside this favorite language we have a list as a nested list inside dictionary now we have a dictionary of programming language and each user has value that's a dictionary in itself and it can store multiple pieces of data including programming language that we love as well as things such as the total number of experience i have in programming language so how can we add that experience inside this programming language dictionary so all we have to do over here is inside nested dictionary we are just putting comma then we are going to add i'm just going to hit enter over here and put it like this then i'm going to add another key over here which will be experience and the value of this experience will be 10. so i have put it over here like this to be able to read it without having any difficulties so if i put it like this you see you will see that you can easily identify that this is another dictionary inside this dictionary so here we have a key as a username then the value of this key is another dictionary in which we have a key favorite programming language which value is list and then we have another key which is experience and the value of this key is integer now here i wanted to pause the video and do the same thing for the second user so let's say for the second user next favorite program language is python so here pause the video and do the same thing for the second user over here because by doing so you'll practice how to create nested dictionary inside another dictionary now hopefully you have done it if you haven't done it let's do it together so here the next thing that i'm going to do i'm going to create another dictionary so to create a dictionary we are just going to put curly braces like this then inside this dictionary so let me just cut it from here so let's put comma over here so i'm just going to put it in the same indentation level with this 
opening curly braces. Then here I'm going to put favorite programming language like this. This is this will be the key. Then after key we need to provide colon. Then I'm going to create a list over here in which we will have Scratch and let's say the second favorite programming language of Renat is Python. So I'm just going to put it as a second element. Then we can add experience for this user over here. So for this user experience will be will be let's say two years. So with this we have successfully created it for the second user as well. So for this case I'm just going to delete the third user because I want to keep the dictionary in the same format. So first we have the keys in which the value is dictionary. So inside dictionary we have another key the value is list and for the second key the value is integer. So now our data structure is such that we have got a list nested inside dictionary and this dictionary is also nested inside another dictionary which is called programming language dictionary. Now we have seen nesting list inside dictionaries, dictionaries inside dictionaries. The last thing that I want to show you is nesting dictionary inside a list. So we could basically have multiple dictionaries inside single list. So remember that lists are ordered and they are accessed by the position inside the list. So this dictionary over here will be located at the index of zero and this dictionary over here which is inside this list will be located at the index of one. But in case of dictionary, inside the dictionary, the items are accessed by their keys like the username Ershad and Renat. Now here, after this dictionary, I'm just going to copy everything from here and pass it over here. So in this case, nesting dictionary inside list. Now in this case, instead of having this one giant dictionary with key value pairs, I want to change it so that each of these entries are a dictionary in itself. So instead of having Ershad, be the key of this dictionary over here, I want it to turn it to its own key value pair. So how can we do that? So I'm just going to provide another label for this username over here. So I'm going to create another dictionary inside this programming language dictionary in which we will have username as a key and the name as a value. So I'm going to put it like this. So here I will put it like this curl brace. So then I'm going to put a label for it, which is going to be the key username. Then I need to provide column. So this is going to be another dictionary. So then here, I'm just going to delete this part and put comma over here. So favorite programming language will be another key over here. And then experience will be another key in which we will have integer value. So here, this one also will be over here. Now I'm going to do the same thing for this second key value pair. So it's going to be like this. So this one also will be dictionary. Username is Renard. Then here we are just going to put comma and I'm going to delete this curl brace. Then hit enter. So this is going to be the second key for the list over here. Then this is the third key for the experience. So with this, we have successfully created an nested two dictionaries inside this giant dictionary over here. So now I have an entire dictionary which has three pieces of data. So the first piece of data is username, the, the second one is favorite language, and the third one is experience. So we have done the same thing for the second dictionary over here. Now you can see that we have got two dictionaries. And instead of holding these two dictionaries inside a dictionary, I'm going to change it so that we will store it inside list. So to be able to change it to the list, I'm just going to change it like this. So these curly braces will be changed to square brackets. So if I just change it to square brackets, you will see that in this case, the programming language is a list. In this list, we have two elements, which are this dictionary. So this dictionary is the first element, which is located at the index of zero. And this dictionary is the second element, which is located at the index of one. So here we can add as many of these dictionaries inside this list, and we can iterate through them if we need to. When we have been creating dictionaries that only have one or two key value pairs, we have kind of just keep it all in one line. But once you have got more and more key value pairs in the dictionary, it's usually a good idea to go ahead and separate out each of these entries. So as you can see, this is very readable and easy understandable. So from this code over here, you can easily see that this is a list. And inside this list, we have separate dictionaries, two dictionaries. And then inside this dictionary, we have values which are string, list, and integer. So with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have learned how can we nest a list inside a dictionary, a dictionary inside a dictionary, and a dictionary inside a list. So hopefully, everything is clear about nesting.
All right, in this lecture, we are going to look at how can we handle missing keys in dictionary. Now, we have mentioned that we can access the elements of dictionary by using their keys. But in many applications, the user does not know all the keys present in the dictionary. In such instances, if user tries to access a missing key, an error is popped indicating missing keys. So let's say we have a dictionary like this in which we have the items. And the keys over here are the names of items and the values are the quantities that left in our store. So from the computer, we have a 10 computer, from printer, we have eight printer and it continues like this. Now let's say we want to access the value of computer over here. So how can we do that? I'm going to write it inside the print statement. So it's going to be the name of dictionary. Then we are going to put square brackets. Then we are going to put the name of key. So in this case, the name of key is computer. So if I go ahead and run our code, you'll see that it's printing out to the console 10. Now, if I put something over here, which is not exist in our dictionary, so I'm just going to go ahead and put microphone and run our code, you'll see that in this case, our program raises error. So it says that key error microphone. So this means that this key does not exist in this dictionary. Now, how can we handle this situation? Now to avoid such situations and to make aware user that a particular key is absent or to pop a default message in that place, there are several methods to handle missing keys. Now, the first method is using get method of dictionaries. Now, in this case, to be able to use the get method, all we have to do, we have to put the name of dictionary, then dot, then we are going to put get. Now, inside get method, we are going to provide the key over here. Now, if I put computer in this case, and let's run our code, so it's going to return the value of computer. So I'm just going to put it like this, quantity, is equal to items.get computer. Then I'm going to print out to the console something like this. So it's going to be, so let's use F string. So I'm going to put number of computers in the store. So I'm just going to put the quantity. Now, if I go ahead and run our code, you will see that it says that the number of computers in the store is 10. So if we go to our dictionary, we see that the value for the key computer is 10. Now, if I change it to something else, it's going to return that value. Now, in this case, everything works without any problem. So we are accessing the key of computer and we are printing out the value that comes from this key. Now in case of get method, if I put over here something that does not exist in our store, so let's put microphone and I'm just going to change the microphone over here and then go ahead, run our code. You'll see that in this case, our program does not raise any error. So it's just printing out the number of microphone in the store is none. So this means that the get method works in a way that if it does not find the element in this items dictionary, it's going to print out none by default. Now, if I go ahead after this one, print out our dictionary, which is items, to the console, you will see that our dictionary is not affected by running get method. So it's just going to search for the microphone in this dictionary. If it does not find it, it's going to return the null. Now, if you want to return something meaningful message to the console, for example, if you want to put that the number of microphones in the store is zero in this case when you are calling get method you can put comma as a second parameter you can pass zero now if i go ahead run our code you will see that if it does not find the microphone in this dictionary over here it's going to print out saying that the number of microphones in the store is zero so if i just comment this part rerun our code you'll see that everything shows in the console very clearly now here instead of zero you can put another meaningful message so you can put saying that the item does not exist. Now, if I run our code, you'll see that it says that the number of microphones in the store, the item does not exist. So if I just make it a little bit bigger, you will see it very clearly. Now to make our code to be seen in the screen, I'm just going to put it in a stack format so we can easily see the output very clearly. So let's put it like this. So I'm going to write our code over here. Now in case of the key that exists in the items, it's not going to call default value. So if I put over here computer and run our code, you will see that in this case, it's just printing out the value of computer. So this part of code is not executed. So this is how get method handles the missing keys in the dictionary. Now there is another method which handles missing keys in a dictionary. So this method is set default method. Now set default method works different than the get method. So in this case, instead of get method here, I'm just going to call set default method. So this method also returns the value of the key that we are going to provide over here. So if I just put over here computer, so instead of microphone, I'm just going to put items over here, not to change it every time. So if I run our code, you see that number of items in the store is 
10. Now, if I put over here mouse, for example, and the run our code, you will see that the number of items is 15. So the mouse is 15 over here. Now, if I go ahead and put over here something which does not exist in our dictionary and run our code, you will see that in this case also it's returning none. So this is how get method works also. Now, the question is, what's the difference between the default and get method? So to be able to see the difference, I'm just going to print out items after the set default method. So if I run our code, you will see that in this case, the number of items in the store is none. But here, if you look at the dictionary, if you print out the dictionary to the console, you will see that this item with the microphone key is inserted to this dictionary over here. So set default method works in a way that it's going to search inside the dictionary for this key. If it does not exist, it's going to insert it there and assign it default value, which is none. So if you don't want to assign none over here, you can provide a second parameter over here. So for example, let's put zero. So in this case, it's going to print out number of items in the store is zero, but it's going to add microphone key to this dictionary with the value of zero. So if I put over here, for example, 11, run our code, you'll see that in this case, it returns the number of items in store is 11 and it's putting the microphone key into this dictionary over here. But in case of get method, it works differently. So if I just copy this code over here, pass it over here for the get method to see it, to be able to see the differences. Now we need to change this one to get method. Now, if I go ahead and run our code, you will see that the first message comes from this get method. The number of items in store is 11. And if you print out the dictionary that we have printed over here, you see that the microphone key is missing over here. So it has not changed the item dictionary. But in case of set default method, it's looking for the key in this items dictionary. And if it does not exist over there, it's going to insert this new key to the dictionary with default value that we have provided over here. Now, if I just go ahead and comment this part and instead of microphone, let's put computer. So we know that we have 10 computers in our store and run our code and we have default value 11. You will see that in this case, nothing is changed in the dictionary. The value of computer remains 10 and the number of items shows that it is 10. So it is not executing this part of code if it exists in the dictionary. If it does not exist, this default value will be returned. And in case of set default, it's going to insert new item with this key and with value to the dictionary. But in case of get method, it's not going to insert anything to dictionaries. It will just return the, the value that we have provided over here. So that's how we are handling missing keys in dictionary in Python. So based on the condition, you can use both of them. So if you need to insert missing keys to the dictionary, you need to use set default value. If you don't need to insert missing key to the dictionary, you just need to return meaningful message. You can use get method of Python dictionary. So hopefully everything is clear about how can you handle missing keys in a dictionary in Python. Now in this video, we will talk about dictionary keys method, the ones that we haven't used yet. We will use some simple examples to demonstrate their behavior. All right, we are going to need a dictionary to work with, and a simple one will demonstrate the effects of these methods. You need to go to the Replit link in the resource section of this video, and you can fork it to your own Replit. Okay, let's start with the from keys method. Now, to be able to use the from keys method, we are going to access the empty dictionary, or we are going to use the dict class of the Python. So up till till now, we were referring it as a type. So as you remember, when we are creating the empty dictionary, we are using dict or we are putting only empty curly braces like this. So to be able to access the from keys method, we are going to use either of them. Now let's see how this is working. So here we have a custom dictionary like this, in which we have the keys as the integer number and values as the string. And then we have created over here, which is list. So it should be list over here, which is devices list. So as you can see in this list, we have four elements. So we are going to use this devices list to create a dictionary using from keys method. Now from keys method returns as a return value dictionary. So that's why I'm going to create a new dictionary over here, which is going to be new dict is equal to. So as I mentioned, we can access the from keys method by putting dict dot from keys. So this is a dictionary class. So we haven't covered the classes yet. So that's why I'm not going to go to the details of this. So instead of that, we can put empty dictionary over here like this. Then as a parameter, we are going to pass this devices list to from keys method. So it's going to take these elements of the devices list 
and it will create from the elements the dictionary so these elements will be the cheese in the dictionary but the values will be by default none now if i go ahead and print out this new dictionary to the console new dict you'll see that from keys method created a new dictionary based on these elements that we have in devices list so these elements become the keys of dictionary and the values of dictionary are by default none so we have over here four elements so we have got a dictionary with four keys and all having the value none so as i mentioned before the keys come from the iterable that we pass from keys method so in this case the iterable is list so each key of this dictionary is one of the items in the devices list now we can change the default value which is currently none by passing another value inside this from key method so here after devices list we can put comma so let's say as an example pass zero and run our code you'll see that default value for all keys over here are zero so if i just make it a little bit bigger you'll see that default values for all keys that we created in new dictionary are zero so this is very useful for example when you are creating the dictionary for the store so initially you, you want to set the quantities of these elements in the store as zero then you can use from keys method like this then you can use another method to update the quantities in the future when you have new items in your store so this is how from keys method works in case of python dictionary now let's continue to the next method which is keys method so it's a really legacy from python 2 where it was need for iterating over dictionary's keys so to be able to use the keys method we are going to access the custom dictionary over here so for now i'm just going to comment this part so i'm going to create a new variable which is keys is equal to custom dig dot keys then i'll go ahead and print out keys to the console so if i run our code you will see that in this case it's printing out dictionary keys like this to the console so in case of python 2 it was returning a list and a list containing all the dictionary keys and this was not very efficient because it involved copying the keys which could be problem with the very large dictionaries but in python 3 the keys method produce a view object it's a similar to list but you cannot add or remove elements from it so if i go ahead add new element to the dictionary so for example if i go ahead and put seven over here you will see that the keys method also will return different keys in which it will include seven also now if i go ahead and run our code you'll see that in this case we have seven also so we cannot add the this view object a new element from over here but if we add it in a dictionary it's going to print out new keys in this key view object over here so there are few stations where you have to use this keys method in python 3 some programmer use it because it meaningful our code so let's say we write something like this so i'm just going to delete everything from over here so let's say we want to look through this dictionary so for item in custom dig so if i go ahead print out the item to the console and run our code it's not very obvious what's happening over here we can see that we are iterating through something and there is no indication of what this something is and if we run program it's just printing out the numbers to the console so if there is not dict over here if you put the different name for the dictionary we will not know that if this is a dictionary or if this is a list or if this is something now to make our code meaningful some programs would actually change that to use after dictionary dot keys so if we have keys method over here we know that this is a dictionary so we are looping through the keys of dictionary now if i go ahead and run our code you'll see that it's going to return the same result but in this case our code is more readable and more understandable now this is how keys method works in case of python 3. now with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture we have discussed from keys method and keys method in python dictionary so hopefully everything is clear about these methods also All right, when we're talking about traversing through dictionary, we have said that if we write the loop like this for item in custom dig, it's going to print out keys to the console. So if you run our code, you'll see that in this case, it's printing out from zero to seven, which are the keys in our dictionary. Now we have learned that if we want to traverse through the values, we will put dictionary name, which is custom dict, with item, which is key in this case. Now, if I go ahead and run our code, you'll see that in this case, it's going to print out keys and values to the console 
Now, the more efficient way of looping through the keys and the values is to use item method of a dictionary. Now, if I go ahead, change this loop from here, I'm just going to copy it and pass it over here. So let's put a, one more print statement to make a space between output. So if I put this same loop over here by using the items method, so after dictionary, I'm going to put items method, then the brackets, then colon, then the logic over here will be changed. So here we are going to put two items. So it's going to be like this key and value. Then when we are going to print out, we can print out easily something like this value. Now, if I go ahead and run our code, you'll see that in this case, both of them are returning the same result. Now, sometimes students object when we show the code that you shouldn't write. We have done it because the loop that we have written initially is the way most new programmers would try to do this. But this is also works, but it is less efficient than iterating over items like we are doing over here on lines 17 and 18. Now with the larger data set, this loop over here will sum up the milliseconds and it will cause the performance issue. Now in Python 2, items method was creating a list and this means it needed a copy of data and used more memory. For that reason, programmers might have used the simple loop to avoid extra memory overhead of using this items method. Now Python 3 uses something called generator, so it does not copy the data into the list from the dictionary. So with Python 3, remember to use items method when you are iterating over dictionary. Now different versions of Python might result different output when we use these methods that we are talking about here and we will talk in the future. In the earlier versions, the keys of dictionary were unordered. This means that you could get the keys printed in different order each time you run the program. If you are using Python 3.5, the dictionary prints out different order each time because in Python 3.5, it was unordered. But Python 3.6 preserved the insertion of order of dictionary case. This means that you will always iterate over them in the same order. And in Python 3.7, the behavior became the part of the language. So when you iterate over a dictionary with Python 3.7 and above, the keys will appear in order that we have created over here. So in our case, we are using Python 3.8, which is a default version in Replit. So in this case, when you run items method to loop over the dictionary, so the order of the keys will not be changed. So it doesn't matter how many times we are running it, it's going to print out the same order that we have declared our custom dictionary over here. Now you might be interested how this part of code works. So if I go ahead, for example, put item over here and print out item to the console, you'll see that in this case, if I run our code, you'll see that it's printing out something keys and value. So this is similar to tuple data structure. So we haven't covered it yet. So when we are covering it, we are going to go to the details of it, how this is working. Now, instead of looping through the dictionary, if I use items method just to print out to the console, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to comment this part and just print out custom dict.items. If I run our code, you will see that in this case, it is dictionary item. So let me just make it stacked version to see it very clearly. So as you can see, this is dictionary item. So this is view object. So inside this view object, we have tuple pairs like this. So as I mentioned, in the next section, we are going to cover the tuple data structure. So in this lecture, you just need to know that when you want to loop through the dictionary, you can put items method in which you will successfully loop through the keys and values more efficiently. Now in this lecture, we will look at the update method. It used to update the dictionary with the elements from another dictionary object or from an iterable of key and value pairs. And it works pretty much how we expect. But we have to remember that dictionary keys are unique. So same key cannot appear more than once in a dictionary. So here we have a key of one. We cannot add another one over here because in this case, Python will raise an error. So with that in mind, the behavior of update makes perfect sense. So let's see an example. So we have a dictionary like this. So I'm going to go ahead and create a second dictionary. So I'm going to name it custom dict2 is equal to, so I'm going to open curly braces and hit enter. You will see that's going to be 
indented like this then I'm going to put the elements like this so key will be 8 so 8 is missing in this dictionary so I'm just going to put it as a value 8 then I'm going to put 9 so in this case 9 also missing in this dictionary custom dictionary then I'm going to put 1 which is going to be new one because one exists in our dictionary so I'm just going to put it over here new one then I'm going to go ahead put two and for the second two I'm going to put something like this new two so it's going to be like this new two then I'm going to put comma over here now I've deliberately mixed up the ordering of this dictionary to check the effect of existing keys in the dictionary being updated so our existing dictionary is this one so as you can see one is located as a second element in our custom dictionary but over here it is the third element so we are going to check that after update how it's going to change so let's update our original dictionary which is custom dict with this one which is custom dict2 so i'm going to type custom dict dot update so as we said we are going to use update method to update it so as a parameter we are going to pass this dictionary second dictionary now to see the result in the console properly i'm just going to loop through this dictionary which is custom dict so i'm going to put the way that we have learned in our previous lecture so for key value in custom dict dot items so we have said that after python 3.7 the order of insertion in python dictionary is preserved so that's why if we print out key and value to the console by looping through it the order will be the same so if i go ahead and run our code so you will see the output over here so what we have done over here is we have updated the values for two keys which are one and two and we have inserted new values for these two keys which are eight and nine so the value for key one has been changed but notice that one is still in the same place it is the second item in dictionary that we have in our original dictionary so in custom dict one was the second element and in the output also one is the second element now we can see the same thing for the key of two the values has changed to new two but the key remains in its original position updating the value of key does not affect its position in the dictionary once again that's what the documentation means by insertion order being preserved we also added a new key 8 to the dictionary so we can see that we have got it over here and we have added a new key which is 9 that comes from the second dictionary which is the last element so as you can see here 8 comes first then the 9 so here also 8 comes first then the 9 but in this case the key of 1 was before these keys in the original dictionary so that's why the location of 1 and 2 has not changed so according to documentation of update method it mentions that we can pass a dictionary to update which we have done over here and it also mentions that we can pass an iterable of key value pairs such as tuple so we have not covered tuple data structure yet so when we cover it we'll go to details of this dictionary one more time to explain how can we pass the tuple to update the dictionary now before we move on to next lecture i want to quickly mention another way to update a dictionary so let's open python documentation for dictionary update you can open it from the resource section of this lecture so this is the link so scrolling down to the update method so this is our update method so just below the update method there are two new operators that were added in the new version of python which is 3.9 the first one which is pipe character is union operator and the second one which is pipe and equal sign is augmented union assignment operator so if we check the description of update method we can see that it update dictionary with key and value pairs from another so if we check the description of augmented union operator it says that update the dictionary of d with keys and values from other now here you can clearly see that descriptions are written slightly different but both update a dictionary with keys and values from other so which means that other is an iterable object of key and value pairs so here i suggest you to stick using update method and ignore the augmented union operator assignment for now which is pipe and equal sign over here so if you use either of these new operators your code won't run on the previous versions of python so if i go ahead for example over here put custom dict then pipe equal custom dict 2 in this case our version is 3.8 if i run our code you will see that in this case we have an error it says that the type error unsupported operand type so this is not supported in python 3.8 now if you are using 
older version of Python, you can check the expired date of the versions of Python on a website which is called endoflife.date slash Python. So here you can see the release date of each version and the and the security support column shows the expired date of each version of Python. Of course, it's possible to use these versions, but functionalities in the newer version will not be supported. So, and security support will not be supported after this year's over here. So for example, let's check Python 3.8, it's going to end in three years. And Python 3.9 ends in four years, which is 5th of October, 2025. So with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. So in this lecture, we have discussed how can we update the Python dictionary. So hopefully everything is clear about this lecture over here. Now in this lecture, we are going to look some dictionary operations and we are going to learn that how some built-in functions work with dictionary. Now we have learned that we can use in and not in operator to check the keys in this dictionary over here. So let's say I want to check that if, for example, three exists in this dictionary. So here as a key should be three. So I'm just going to write inside print statement something like this. So I can put three in my dict. Now, if I run our code, in this case, it's going to return true. So as you can see, we can identify that three exists in this dictionary over here. Now, if I go ahead and write for the value, for example, as a three, and run our code, you will see that in this case, it is returning false. So this means that in operator works with the keys, not the values. Now, the question is, if we want to check the value in this dictionary using in operator, how can we do that? So we can do it by using values method of dictionaries. So as we learned, values method returns list object of the values. So that's why if I write something like this and run our code, you will see that in this case, the result is changed. So it's returning true. So this means that by default in operator checks for the keys, but if you want to check for the values, we are going to use values method over here. So similarly, not in operator also works the same way. So instead of in, if I put nothing over here and run our code, you'll see that in this case, it's returning false. So this means that three exists over here. Now, if I put 10, we know that 10 does not exist in our dictionary. So if I run our code, you'll see that in this case, it is returning true. So that's how in operator works with the dictionary. So here, I just wanted to show you, if you want to look for the values, how can you do that? So if you want more detailed information about how in and not in operator works, I advise you to go to the in and not in operators in dictionaries lecture. Now then, we are going to continue to the built-in functions of Python that can be used with the dictionary. Now the first function is len function. Now here the question is, if we run len function for this dictionary over here, what will be the result? So I'm just going to put my dict inside len function. So as a parameter, we are passing this dictionary. Now we have learned that in case of list, it's returning the number of elements. But here the question is, what is going to return? Is it going to return keys and values separate or is going to take them as a one item? Now, if I go ahead and run our code, you will see that it's returning six. So this means that it is taking each pair as one element. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six pairs over here. So len function in case of Python dictionary, just counting the number of pairs in the dictionary. So this is how len function works. Now let's continue to the next function. Now the next function is all function of Python. Now how all function works with the dictionary. Now in this case, for example, if I call all function for my dictionary over here, what will happen? Now if I run our code, you will see that in this case it's returning true. So why it's returning true? So this means that it's going to check the keys of dictionary. So if all keys over here are true, in this case it's going to return true. So true means that if we have boolean values over here, the keys have to be true and the numbers or string except zero, because if you put zero over here, this means that one of these key is false. So that's why it's going to return false. So as you can see, it's returning false. So we have four cases in case of all function. So in this case, the first case is all keys are true. When we run all keys are true, in this case, it's going to return true. Then the next case is all keys are false. So I'm just going to create a dictionary over here. For example, one, let me put all keys are false. Here I'm going to put zero. So zero means that also 
false zero then i'm going to put false as a key so it's going to be also false like this now if i go ahead and run our function for this my dig so this is the second case in which we have all keys are false so if you run it you'll see that it's going to return false then the third case is one value is true so if i put over here one it means that one value one key is true so if i run our code you'll see that in this case also is turning false so then the fourth case is one value is false so we have done it over here so if i put zero and run it for my dig you'll see that in this case also it is returning false so all function returns only true when we have all keys over here is true so is true means that all keys has to be boolean valuable value of true or all keys has to be integer or string excluding zero zero means that is false now this is how all function works now we are going to continue to the next function which is any function so here also we have four cases in any function if all values over here are true so i'm just going to change it to three over here so if you run it for any function you will see that in this case it's returning true so this means that if all keys are true it's going to return true now the second case is all values are false so i'm just going to change it in this dictionary so i'm going to call it for my dict one so if i run our code so if all keys are false in this case it's going to return false so let's change this to one if one value is true in this case it's going to return true so if we have any true in the keys it's going to return true if one value is false it's obvious that from this dictionary we can see that it's true also so any function works this way if all keys are true it's going to return true if any key in the dictionary is true it's going to return true if all of them are false it's going to return false so this is just a little bit confusing but if you examine it you will understand it very well now the last function that we are going to look over here is sorted function now sorted function returns sorted list but in this case if we run it for dictionary it's going to return the list of keys but in sorted manner so if i run sorted function for this my dict over here and print out value to the console you see that it is returning the list of keys that we have over here and these keys are sorted inside this list so that's how sorted method works with dictionary now with this we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture i just gave you a brief explanation about how can we use some built-in methods of python in case of dictionary now in this lecture we are going to look at briefly differences between dictionary and list now before python 3.7 dictionaries were unordered and lists were ordered that was the main difference between them now after python 3.7 dictionaries are also insertion ordered so that's why i have not included over here that one now that was the main difference before now we don't have that differences so both of them are ordered now the next difference is we are accessing the element values in the dictionary using keys so we have discussed it before but in case of list we are accessing the values using indexes and we know that in case of list index starts from zero now the next point is dictionary is collection of key and value pairs so this means that in each item we have key and value but in case of list we have collection of elements so we don't have any key and value pairs there it's just collection of and we can access these elements by using their indexes now the next point is we are using dictionaries when we prefer unique key values so for example when we are creating an application in which we have the dictionary structure and we need to access using key values in this case we are using dictionary and as you can see this point mentions that list is preferred when you have ordered data but in this case you can use both data structures in the recent version of python because both of them in this case are ordered now the next point is in dictionary we cannot have duplicate members so this means that one key is assigned to the one value so we can have repetitive values but we cannot have repetitive keys so the keys are unique in dictionary but in case of list duplicate members are allowed so this means that we can have the same element several times in the list so these are the main differences between list and dictionary so in this lecture we have just briefly put the main points together to see the main differences between dictionary and list